important points, but I'm not quite clear whether I, whether I understood you. You stated first that the defense is strikingly inadequate. And then you try to show from what point of view it would not be inadequate. Now, let me state my difficulty in the form of an objection. Could one not argue this way? So that is, it does not refuse the charge of impiety because he regarded it as absurd. Of course he believed in the gods of the city. I mean, uh, for, that is suggested, for example, the oracle, of Apollo. He, he defers to, uh, to Apollo. As for the formula of the accusation, at which there was pokes fun and which he refutes very easily. But what Meredith had probably had in mind was that he knew something of Sugar's reference to the demonic thing in him, the demonion. And that is a formula which you use. He only says Sugar introduces new demonia, the plural. Well, if there is a demonion of Sugar, there may be other such things, and therefore he's justified in introducing the plural. You know? But to come back to the main point, could Socrates not have been a simply orthodox Athenian? And he regarded the charge as preposterous and ridiculous and therefore ridiculed it and took it lightly. What would you say to such a possibility? Um, that's, that's plausible, but I don't see how we can infer that from his silence. Now, if you, if you take, for, you, you referred frequently to Xenophon, to Xenophon's discussion, what did you, did you have in mind with, uh, in Xenophon? Well, both the apology and the memorabilia. Now, let us take the simpler presentation in the first chapter of the memorabilia. Socrates sacrificed all the time, yeah, and at all proper times, at home and at the public altars. So, why did he not, why does Plato so is not refer to that? Is this not a sufficient proof of orthodoxy if someone fulfills all the prescribed rights? Well, the argument I was making is that he could have. But why did he not do it? I mean, that would, have, would seem to be a very strong argument. With what right can they say of Socrates he doesn't believe in the gods of the city when he sacrifices to them? Well, Perhaps he didn't want the jury to believe that he simply believed in the city's gods. Yeah, but then he becomes guilty of the crime. Now, I think if one reads Xenophon, these four pages, or not many, much more surely, one sees the reason. You see the Greek word of the charge. So that is, does not believe in the gods. The word is nomitsan. Now, this time, which is the relative from Nomos. That is the infinitive, yeah. No, this time. And that is the relative from Nomos. And this does not necessarily mean belief. It means also to accept, to cherish. So, if someone can say, what would be a good word in English? Uh, indifferent to the distinction between intellectual belief and practicing the proper things connected with it. I do not know. Cultivate worship? Yeah, let us say worship. Let us say worship. So this could prove his worshiping the gods very easily. But what is the difficulty of such a proof? What is it if one proves that someone worships the gods properly? Does it prove that he believes that the gods exist? Therefore, and he was accusation was that the witness did not, at least the Sugaris, the Sugaris interpretation of the accusation, that Sugaris did not believe that the gods exist. And the, the, the worshiping of the gods is no proof. Xenophon, therefore, also goes over to other things, yeah? to other things, to other arguments. And in conclusion of the argument, he says, well, it is not surprising that these things which I therefore have mentioned escaped the jury. But 
Now I appeal to a fact which everyone knows. That means that Sogonis did not perjure himself in a crucial case, the case of the trial of the, of the generals, of the battle of the Inusa. That, according to Sengmon, is the only notorious fact about Sogonis' piety. The fact that he worshipped or did not worship was not so commonly known. Uh, because uh, Sogaris did not, uh, uh, but the only thing was, which was commonly known was that Sogaris fulfilled his sworn duty. And to fulfill one's sworn duty means, of course, to obey God. Now, that is obviously not a proof of piety in particular. It could also prove to be a proof of simple law violence. So, then for himself, before studies in carefully shows, that there was no notoriety of Socrates' orthodoxy on which he could depend. That had to be true. And that is, must be the background of your argument. And of this, if we turn therefore to the argument of the apology, we reach indeed the conclusion that Socrates did not refuse the charge. And the question, a uh, uh, charge, uh, charge which was not far fetched. Now, why did he not do it? As there are only two possibilities. He did not wish to refute it, and that means in plain English he wanted to commit suicide. Or he could not refute it. Yeah? And then this leads to further questions. Now, we will take up these points uh, coherently uh, immediately after a brief reference to Mr. Haight's paper, which refers to what we have said on four occasions on Aristophanes, and especially on the birds. Yeah, well, I do not quite, I mean, I will turn to a certain details you will make, and surely the decision, as I have said more than once, depends really on individual passages. Yeah, we have come down to, to facts, to details. And Mr. Haidt is not convinced uh, in any way by my interpretation. This is, of course, perfectly all right. But I am not quite certain whether there is not a bit more than a, a simple, uh, quiet feeling that my arguments are no good. Uh, whether there is not a certain, well, animosity would be much too strong an expression, but something between <laughs> perfect indifference and animosity. Uh, behind the person. I do not know. There is none. No. Good. That's it. Is it? According to all rules of psychology, that's it. <laughs> now, uh, I, then I turn to a few points. Yeah. Uh, well, now let me uh, make, make it only one crucial point. Your interpretation and your objections are based not only on specific passages, that is impossible. They are also based on a certain premise, hypothesis, however you call it. And that is, what is a comedy? You make constant use of that. You, uh, one example uh, refers to Abbot and Costello, against which I have absolutely nothing. But that is only an indication of the fact that you have a certain broad understanding of comedy, which is not altogether derived from uh, Aristophanes. Yeah, that is exactly the point where we differ, the fundamental point. And that is whether you have given sufficient thought to what a comedy is, and especially to what an Aristophanian comedy is. Now I turn to a few formulations of yours. If I understand it correctly, you say the official interpretation of the birds rests on two major propositions. Official in quotes, and official is my interpretation. Uh, why, why I receive the signal on that, I don't know. Because official would, it could be applied to some extent to something which is generally accepted. Yes? I put it in quotes because it did not quite seem to fit, but I used the word because I couldn't think of another. Yes, okay, you mean official as far as this classroom is concerned? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so let's see. And, uh, it would have been simpler if you had said, I have understand correctly, Mr. Strauss in a minute. Now, they are. First, that the bird is a part of a deliberate and conscious attempt by Aristophanes to present through his plays a description of the ideal policy. 
Uh, that is not quite correct. I mean, that could create the impression as if I meant that Aristophanes plays as a whole serves the purpose of describing an ideal policy. The utmost one could say is that there are three plays of Aristophanes which deal in different ways with a polis radically different from any actually known, and these are the birds, the assembly of women, and Plutus. But I would never say that this is a formula which uh, applies to all Aristophanes comedies. The possibility of this subject surely belongs to the Aristotelian comedy, but it is not its essence. And that therefore, second, that there, Aristophanes therefore inserted several scenes in the birds whose purpose is to make statements about the ideal polis, its nature, and the elements it would and would not contain. The, the, therefore, I have, would have to delete, the birds are a presentation of a city which never existed, and never will exist, and which we may loosely call an ideal polis. Therefore, of course, he inserted into it many scenes which are um, to make clear the character of that a polis. Because no one, I think, can deny that in the birds a polis is founded, which doesn't exist anywhere, and which is, quote, ideal, unquote, to the extent that it is founded by people dissatisfied with the actual city and looking for a satisfying or a satisfactory city. And they do that. I mean, they go out and the descriptions are there. They want to go to a city in which they can live pleasantly, in which there is no busy bodiness of any kind, and so on and so on. That is uh, true. Now, and then he, you give a few points here. Yeah, for example, you are dissatisfied with what I say about the connection between the birds and the clouds. And uh, I refer to the point that the perfect polis of the birds is called cloud cuckoo land. And the clouds play a great role in the clouds, as we know. Now, as the second point was, the character of a father beater appears in both plays. And to which you say the first two of these points strikes you as very minor. For the rest are nothing more than verbal coincidence. Well, I would say that it's more than verbal because uh, the clouds are a massive reality in the clouds and they also are a very massive reality in uh, the birds. And that uh, Socrates is a loss at the beginning of the clouds when he appears, and it has very much to do with that, and that his realm is somehow, somehow also not on earth, but in the air, near to the clouds, as indicated by the name, shows that this is more than verbal. That the father Peter should be verbal, I can hardly believe, uh, because that is a very definite phenomenon, which plays a very great role in the clouds and plays a certain role at any rate also in the birds. And this is a very great problem. The father beater is clear once you think about it because the question of father beating is identical with the question of the difference between reasonable authority and non-reasonable authority. The implication being that the father as father, especially of a grown-up son, is not necessarily wiser than the son. And the, there is the only uh, uh, rational authority is that of the wise compared to the unwise. Then the point at which you are most explicit there is there is a parallel between Socrates of the clouds and Metron and the birds, since both the astronomers. And this you flatly deny. He, he's, you say, Methon is presented as a town planner. Any reference to sugar as a town planner in the clouds is minor if it exists at all. To my knowledge, it doesn't exist at all. So it turns only around the question, is Methon only a town planner in the birds? And I think that can be refuted by a simple reference to a passage. In first and 995, I don't have the edition here, 
Uh, when uh, Metron comes up and Pistadeus asks him, he says, I wish to geometrize the air. That's the first verse. Uh, geometries, uh, the Greek word geometrize means to measure the earth and then largely, derivatively, to geometrize, to be a geometer regarding the air. That the town planning is incidental to that, a consequence of it. But the primary thing is his geometrizing the air, which reminds very much with what Sugares is doing when he walks on the air in order to study the other things. Furthermore, you say there is no explicit reference to Meton astronomer, but when in the second speech of Meton, he says, on the, uh, replying to Pistetero's question, who he is, who I am, he says, Meton, who is known by Greece and by Columbus. So in other words, he is very well known, and therefore there is no special need for explicitly speaking of the astronomy. Moreover, a little bit later, it was 2009, after Metron had spoken of what he can do, Pistadiros breaks out into the words that man is a sailor. The same expression is applied to Socrates by Strepsilus. Thales is the figure, as some people today say, an Einstein, a Newton. Everyone knows that. Uh, uh, he may not understand a single thing of what it's about, but it that has something to do with the uh, stars. Was well known because there was this famous story that about Thales's lack of intelligence. You know it, Mr. Rankin. It's the stupidity of astronomers. Oh, I'm mean, sure that philosophers don't mean to be the businessmen. So there was a good harvest, well, that Yeah, that was already his, his reply. But the, the original thing for which he was famous, looking at the stars, he fell into a ditch. So that is, uh, that is a perfectly clear, popular notion of what an astronomer is. Everyone knew what a famous is. So I think you have no, on the contrary, I think one can prove that not only uh, that, that the opposite rule that Meton is the astronomer in this very in the very uh, uh, birds. Browns. Yeah. Further on in my paper, I make uh, another reference to Meton, in which I make another point about the question of his being an astronomer. The point being that if Aristophanes had directly and clearly wished to present him as an astronomer, it would have been quite simple. Meaton perhaps could have wished to live in Cloud Cuckoo Land in order to be closer to the stars and so observe them better. Yeah, but he, he could have been presented very explicitly and very clearly no. as an astronomer, yet he was not. As a question, is there a very good reasons for not overstressing that? Because the idea of Metron is he wants to immigrate to the new city. And in order to immigrate to that new city, he has to prove his usefulness to that city. And therefore, the emphasis of what he can do regarding town planning. The, 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 that, I think, only confirms my argument that an astronomer, a stargazer, is as such useless to the city, is an accepted view. It requires already some cleverness to say, he is useful for the following reason. Maybe there are sometimes in war. You want to fight tomorrow, everything is fine. And then there is an eclipse of the moon. And all your soldiers get frightened. It's an ominous day, not tomorrow. And then what do you do if you are really a good and enlightened general? You call your soldiers together and have and make gives them a very simple lecture by drawing figures in the sand and show them that uh, an eclipse of the moon is absolutely nothing terrible and ominous, but it happens mechanically under this condition. That was a, a long argument on this subject at the beginning of Cicero's book on Republic, and that goes back to the old story. Yeah, but this is already a ticklish thing. 
because here you had a definite, let me say, a little slower to the effect that this is not good to pry into the secrets of the God. And, and a, a very great general in, in Sicily, as you know, Nicias, was high enough not to do that and to trust the Romans. So that, uh, in other words, he could prove his utility not by uh, being a, uh, an astronomer and therefore valuable strategically. He could prove it only by something which was so innocuous, so neutral as strong Yeah, you say Pistateros and Euabilis also study nature, namely the cow and the jay, in order to find the ideal city. Yeah, well, that is in itself not a study of nature. Say, on the contrary, it is the opposite. This is a following the birds as omens, something which has very little to do with that. But if you insist on that point, I would say to, there is an element of truth in it, which I believe I have explained. Let me to the extent to which Pistateros at any rate is seeking a city according to nature. And therefore, the derivation of polis from polos and so on. Yeah, then you bring an argument which I really uh, don't see at all. There is one further objection to the idea that Aristophanes intended the clouds and the birds to form connected parts of a presentation of his political thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, insist on that, on that formulation. But I only said they are connected. And now what's your proof? That they were represented nine years apart. Between these two dates of the clouds and the birds, Aristophanes must have written at least a dozen other plays. Well, surely he may, for all we know. But what does this mean? What does this mean? Uh, maybe these lost plays would all confirm 50 times what I said. So we can't say anything. Maybe they would. We don't know. But is this the only case in which a great man takes up a theme, leaves it dormant for a certain time, for one reason or the other, because he is attracted by some other themes, and then takes it up again? Not the slightest difficulty. Now, let me see whether it's in there. I cannot go into here. Yeah. You say, I do not believe that there is any real significance to the fact that Meton is referred to by name, for the practice of mocking prominent Athenians by name appears in all of our students, but sure, but why is, why is Meto named by, mentioned by name, and why is the sycophant not mentioned by name? Uh, why is only the poet and only the astronomer mentioned by name? The question remains absolute. There is a point in there that I'd like to have to up, if you don't mind. Yes. And that is that if Aristophanes intended to use Meton and Synesius to make general statements about poets as a group and astronomers as a group. Yeah. It seems to me more reasonable that he would have used a nameless astronomer or a nameless poet in order that they might better represent astronomers as a class and poets as a class rather than directing his remarks yeah. to a particular point. Yeah. Uh, uh, or the other, but it so happens. They have two subjects in Paris, as you can say. It so happens that Aristophanes in two different scenes in the founding scene and in the scene of the potential immigrants uses a number of anonymous people. And in each case, one individual mentioned by name. And in the first case, it is metal. And in the second case, it is a poet. Uh, we have to explain that. We have to explain that. Because Sigurdsson, I mean, if you uh, would say uh, in astronomers were, there was metal, but Sigurdsson, they were not around, and there was a great harvest of Sigurdsson and uh, of such other people. That still would have to be explained. And there is one point where, a point where you have some right and where I have may, may have been uh, a little too brief, and that concerns a passage on page 48 of your translation, as verse 1073, uh, 72 following, where you make this remark. I read it, as you say. The lines of the chorus which go, quote, listen to the city's notice, 
specially proclaimed today, it deserves the avarice a million, whosoever of you slay shall receive reward one talent. And another we will bestow if you slay some ancient tyrant dead and buried long ago. These lines supposedly imply that heresy and tyranny are not allowed in the ideal city. But first, these lines do not apply to Cloud Cuckoo Land, they apply to Athens. And second, at least the last two lines are intended as a joke. Now, that is perfectly true. This is a quotation which the chorus makes, and something, a quotation we can safely say, literal or not literal, of what an Athenian proclamation was. But still, they adopt it. They adopt it, and there is one can show that they apply to properly modify it to the ideal city. If the ideal city of the birds, as I have tried to show, is a universal democracy, the prohibition against tyranny applies to it naturally. The second point, that it must have gods and cannot tolerate an atheist like the Agoras, the million, is proven by the play as a whole. The birds are the gods. And therefore, that is, a per- that is uh, correct, what you say at this point, but uh, uh, you must also take a somewhat broader view. And that refers also to a remark which you make later. The city of the bird differs radically from any city we know. It still is a city. Certain basic characteristics, for example, the difference between rulers and rule that there are some form of sort of laws are the same. And therefore, there, and therefore there is a kind of kinship to the city, a kinship which shows itself also more subtly and more indirectly by the differences. You discover the true city of the birds only by starting from the deficiencies of the city which you empirically know. You say, if the notice is about Athenian heretics and tyrants, this one which I quoted, how then could it apply to Claude Kukule? Answer, because the ideal polis arises out of a modification of the actual polis, and therefore modified, these things live on in the perfect city. This, what you say is perfectly true that Aristophanes ridicules here as well as in the vast, for example, the extreme fear of the Athenians, of, of old tyrants. Yeah? That's very true. But uh, that is not, uh, is, it does not exclude what I say. Uh, because that's, he, he excludes the extreme apprehension of the Athenians regarding tyrants, although it proved to be not such an extreme apprehension as you know a little bit later. But that was Aristophanes' error. But the main point uh, is uh, that this prohibition against uh, tyranny, as distinguished from the perhaps foolish apprehension, is of the essence of the democracy. And uh, any regime has such prohibitions against alternatives. That's the meaning of a constitution. Yeah, well, I cannot uh, possibly go into all the points because we really don't have the time. And let us leave at this amiable or amicable agreement. Mr. Hay does not believe that the interpretation of Aristophanes, which I suggested, is correct. That is perfectly good and is even very healthy for me and as well as for others who perhaps have been, uh, do not believe that this is so entirely wrong what I said. Uh, We cannot, such questions cannot be settled. Had in a seminar and still less in a very discursive reading as we have now. But I must only warn you of one point where I believe I'm correct. And that is not into with any details. One cannot leave it in any case at the current categories, as people call it. In this case, for example, comedy. What a comedy is, and especially what, in our case, what an Aristophanian comedy is, is to begin with an absolute riddle. And the historical information we have about it, its, its origin, and so things to which you refer, yeah, do not get proof that 
and Tufanes comedy is the same as what, what the comedy originally meant in the Athenian cult. The relation to this will always uh, be uh, there, but not more. I gave a lecture of, I believe, a half an hour, if not more, in your absence. And it would be... Yeah, and so do I. I think we all regret it very much. But uh, I cannot, for simple uh, reasons of time and consideration of your fellow students, repeat it. But there are, I mean, I'm sure you know one or the other who can respond, but the main point dealt with this question. How much have you given free thought, quiet thought, unbiased thought, to the question of what the comedy is. And uh, that, I think, affects the interpretation of every particular passage. Uh, so I must leave it that. And they must turn to the apology. Unless you have a very specific point which can be uh, dealt with uh, briefly. I'm afraid I don't. And since it seems to me quite reasonable that uh, the you have advice to teach and only so long you to teach it. And I didn't really expect you to go over my paper in class. Oh, no, yeah, well, that I wanted to do because I think the subject is of general interest. Uh, I mean, uh, not necessarily that all the points you made were, um, had to be uh, considered in, uh, under all circumstances, uh, but the thing at issue between us is not merely Mr. Haight versus me. It is a general issue. And the, and the general issue is whether we can go on trusting the usual conventional and, uh, in the best case, traditional notions of comedy. Just uh, as the same would apply to tragedy. I mean, in the case of tragedy, we have these long disquisitions of Aristotle and the poetics, uh, which uh, everyone will uh, treat with a greater, everyone of sense will treat with the greatest respect. But it is still an absolutely open question, of course, whether the tragedy as meant by Sophocles, for example, or Euripides, is the same as what Aristotle understood by it. That is an open question. It's also a very open question whether Plato's doctrine of tragedy is the same as Aristotle. It's only much harder to answer because uh, Plato didn't deign to write a treatise on tragedy. In the case of comedy, we are worse off because we have still less about it in Aristotle, in Aristotle and in Plato than about tragedy. So now let us then turn to uh, the apology of Socrates. I remind you of one point which you know from the clouds and which is manifest uh, and uh, where there can be no disagreement. In the cloud, Sovereign comes to sight as an astronomer and a teacher of rhetoric. That is a matter of public knowledge in Athens. Now we are about 20 years later and Sovereign comes again appears again on the stage, but this time as an, accu as an accused man. Let us, I mean, that is not irrelevant. You must take an intelligent, but not uh, an intelligent Athenian who is not what now would be called a culture vulture, but it's by some people. I mean, an intelligent man with his wits about him, he has seen out of Sovereign's comedy. And now he sees Socrates again, this time not in a mask, but himself. What will we hear? Now, in the, pro, in the beginning, in the proemium, because that is, of course, a, a speech, probably elaborate, probably build up, and begins with an introduction to the proemium. The main assertion, as has become clear from the paper, is the accusers have lied. And so this will say the truth. He says even the whole truth. He says the whole truth. Yeah, that we have uh, to, uh, that is the point. Uh, so so this explicitly says that he will say the whole truth. And the accusers have said nothing but lies. But that is qualified, what he says about the accusers, right at the beginning, in the first or second sentence, so he says, they have said 
so to speak, nothing true. Meaning, it's not literally true. They have said certain, certain things which are true. And now, uh, what, what, uh, what, does this, what does this qualification in itself mean? It, it is absolutely impossible to say something which does not contain a, an element of truth. If you say, I have seen Mr. X <coughs> killing Mr. Y, and Mr. Y is alive, and Mr. X was at the time in an entirely different town, so it's a simple lie, yet Mr. X is and Mr. Y is. It is impossible to, every truth is prior. Every lie is based on some preceding truth. That is true. But this is not quite what Socrates means, because immediately afterwards he says uh, that he has fallen to wondering most about, um, about one thing of the many things which they have lied. You know, not all things, they said, were uh, lies. And a little bit later, in, in uh, 17b7, he says, These then, as I assert, have said um, anything, uh, hardly anything or nothing true. He does not say that everything is a lie, but that is not terribly important. The biggest lie, he says, was that they said so was, was a clever speaker because uh, he will easily refute them now. A clever speaker is a speaker who gets an acquittal under the worst circumstances. And so God knows he will be condemned. So that will be refuted. But then he makes a call, uh, he interprets that a bit and says, he, uh, they lied, their biggest lie was that I'm a clever speaker unless they mean that I say the truth. If a clever speaker is a man who says the truth, then I'm a clever speaker. And because he will indeed say the whole truth. He disclaims the use of rhetorical art, but he will speak as he used to speak on the marketplace and in other places. So that is, on the marketplace, talking to others, a citizen, an ordinary citizen, not, has nothing to do with the art of rhetoric, and especially that art which he would need now, the art of forensic rhetoric. I mean, is the term forensic rhetoric known to you? Because I sometimes uh, certain very simple expressions are known. As the Greeks, this, uh, Aristotle, for example, makes a distinction of rhetoric into three kinds. Forensic rhetoric, dealing with right and wrong, used before law courts. Deliberative, deliberative rhetoric, dealing with the expedient and inexpedient, used in political assemblies and epideictic rhetoric, or show or display rhetoric, dealing with the beautiful and ugly, or noble and base, used for show sake, or for edification sake. So, so it is, he does not possess the, art, possess the art of forensic rhetoric. Why? And he proves that to them that he does not possess it. I mean, prior to the proof by deed that he will be condemned, but he proves it right to the beginning. If you will turn to 17b, for now, do you have it? Now I have ascended for the first time, or come up to the law court, uh, 70 years old, yeah? And I am in the position of a, uh, of a stranger with regard to the way of speaking he employed. Do you have that? He does not possess the art of forensic rhetoric because he has never been accused. Because he has never been accused. That's of course not a good proof because uh, there were many teachers of rhetoric who were never accused. At the end of this poem, he makes this remark, and he states this poem. They should watch not whether he is an artful speaker, but whether he says just things or not. For this is the virtue of the judge, namely to see whether the defendant speaks just things or not. But the virtue of the speaker is to say the truth.
that this virtue soberness possesses. You see the tacit identification of just and true, which is striking and, and uh, a notice of which you must keep in mind. Soberness claims to repeat the main point that he will say the whole truth in this speech. And if he does not say the whole truth, he just lies. It's a terrible dilemma for us. If he would say, I say only that part of the truth which you understand, that would be simple. But he says he's going to say the whole truth. It's great. I mean, that's a very great moral question, which could not with propriety be discussed on this occasion. But Socrates discussed it earlier, Plato Socrates, I mean, discussed it earlier on a proper occasion, and this is in the dialogue Gorgias, because in the Gorgias, a young man called Callicles says to Socrates, if you continue to lead the life you do, you will be, a complete, will be completely powerless. Once you are accused, you can't defend yourself. You can't defend yourself. And therefore, think of self-defense. So as Socrates says, I do not think of self-defense, of self-preservation. I think of other things. Now, what does he say? Calibus says, I read it superficially in the translation. It quite strikes me, Socrates, that you believe not one of these troubles, nay, accusation could afford you, and so you dwelt out of the way, and could never be dragged into a law court by some perhaps utterly paltry rascal. It is 521c. To which Socrates replies, then I am a fool, Calibus, in truth, if I do not suppose that in this city anyone, whoever he was, might find himself, as luck would have it, in any sort of plight. Pericles himself was accused. Of one thing, however, I'm sure, that if I'm ever brought before the court and stand in any such danger as you mentioned, it will be some villain who brings me there, for no honest man would prosecute someone who had done no wrong. And it would be no marvel if I were put to death. Would you like me to tell you my reason for expecting this? You know that is many years before the accusation. Call it this by all means. So there is. I think I am one of few, not to say the only one in Athens, who attempts the true political art. And the only man of the present time who manages the affairs of the city. Hence, as the speeches that I make from time to time are not aimed at gratification, but what, at what is best instead of what is most pleasant. And as I do not care to deal in those pretty toys that you recommend, I shall have not a word to say at the bar. The same case that I made out to Polus in an earlier part of the dialogue will apply to me. For I shall be like a doctor tried by a bench of children on a charge brought by a cook. <clears throat> Just consider what offense someone like that would make at such a pass if the accuser should speak against him thus. Children, this fellow has done you all a great deal of mischief, and he destroys even the youngest of you by cutting and burning and starves and chokes you to destruction, giving you nasty, bitter draughts and forcing you to fast and thirst, not like me, who used to gorge you with abundance of nice things of every sort. What do you suppose a doctor brought to this sad pass could say for himself? Or if he spoke the truth, all this I did, my boys, for your health. How great think you would be the outcry from such a bench as that? It's impossible to say that. 
is impossible to say the truth, and a part of that impossibility is the declaration that he will say the whole truth. He talks to little children. That is the position in which Sogaris ap- uh, approaches his accusers. Then he, Sogaris begins with a distinction. He says this accusation, which is now brought forth by uh, this formal accusation, is only the end of a long story. There was originally an accusation, and original accusers, the first accusers, and these first accusers are much more dangerous than the present ones. Who are these first accusers? Who are they? Public opinion. Public opinion. Yeah, na- they are nameless. Many, many. But still, we let us not leave it at, at what could be a, an abstraction. It's the folk mind of Athens. It's a public opinion. Where, where does it reside? Where does it reside, the public opinion of the, this, the first accusation? Where does it reside? Yes? When he identifies Aristophanes, yeah, but then, yeah, but Aristophanes is perhaps the mouthpiece of them, but uh, and, and uh, the only proper name he can mention there. But Aristophanes didn't start. Aristophanes acted as a mouthpiece, as Aristophanes said. But who are the accusers? Right? On whom Aristophanes relied? Who are they? I mean, public opinion. All right. But still, let us be a bit more, still more scientific. Where does it find? How do you find out what the public opinion say on President uh, on Vice President Nixon is? Now it's a slip of the tongue. <laughs> and uh, how do you find out? And what asks the one observes? Yeah, and I mean you, you don't have millions there, but uh, what do you do? I mean you can talk to many people. But may I suggest a simple answer? Public opinion in this sense resides in many Athenians. And if it's really simply the public opinion, I think one should even say the majority of Athenians. The majority of Athenians have accused Socrates of Sophie, the past. Where are these many, this majority now? And? The first accusers are the authors, sure. That is the job. By characterizing the first accusers, he accuses the audience. But if you want to be a bit more uh, scrupulous and, and, and excluded and pedantic, you say, well, I see they are the fathers of the first <coughs> But it amounts to the same thing. That is what they sucked in by their, you know, I can say that by their father's milk. Yeah? And when they were little children, they were told by their fathers that he said to be so. So, but it amounts to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the former generation of the Athenians or the present generation of the Athenians, the majority, the former majority or the present majority, they, these are the first accusers. And so when uses a rhetorical trick, uh, which is quite remarkable, that he shows them in the, in the mirror by asserting, that's not you. Yeah, that's not you, but there is of course there. Now, what do they charge the Socrates? That is, there are various formulations. The first occurs in 18 B6, that there is some Socrates, a wise man, a warrior about the celestial things, and someone who has sought out all things beneath the earth and who makes the weak speech, the weaker speech, the stronger speech. This is what they say. And this is something that in itself is an accusation. The last case is obvious. It means uh, a teacher of rhetorical tricks. Yeah? Uh, but why a warrior about, or a thinker, you can also say, about the celestial things, the things aloft. But this should be wicked, 
we do not immediately understand. And therefore, we would have to look up and, and uh, we find in Xenophon, for example, some, and even here, but in some evidence that this was regarded as an impious thing. And the things beneath the earth that are not onions, as Trapsir has thought, as haters, life after death, he investigates these things. Now, there is another formulation a little bit later when uh, Aristophan is already is coming up. And now, when he says, and what is most irrational about it, that it is impossible to know and to name the names of these accusers unless he happens to be a comic poet. That is a mere accidental case that one of these accusers happened to be a comic poet who makes himself the mouthpiece of public opinion, but he is not the accuser. Now, what is the motive of these people? Why do they say that? Do they calumniate Socrates? Why do they say he's a wicked man? And he indicates this in the immediate sequel, where I stopped here. He refers to their envy. Why are they envious? Why are they envious? I mean, if someone says this is uh, this is this embezzler of public funds, yeah, wrongly, the motive is not less than the envy. You can hate him for for other reasons, perhaps because he tried to, to embezzle and the other fellow uh, prevented it and so on. Why is it envy? Why is it so sure that it's envy, a theme which occurs? Yes? Is it possible because he takes away the affection of their children? That is not unimportant, but it is not in Xenophon, that plays a great role. There's a very beautiful passage in Xenophon on the subject, but not here, it's more directly connected. Wisdom. This wisdom is a devilish thing, yeah. if we exaggerate a bit, a devilish thing. But it is, of course, something fantastic to be a wise man. And that has to do with his wisdom. Now let us come to the formulation of the first accusation a little bit later in 19b. Now, Socrates formulates the accusation as if it were a formal accusation. Socrates commits an unjust act and uh, does superfluous things. Superfluous things also uh, does things he goes beyond the line. By seeking what is beneath the earth uh, as well as a heavenly thing, and by making the weaker speech stronger, and by teaching others these very same things. You see, now it's a formula is stricter. In the first place, he adds, he teaches others these things. Nothing was said before. He teaches others. So as a teacher. The second point is slightly more subtle, but it is this that now the heavenly things are in the center. The gravest thing is the study of these heavenly things, and he teaches them astronomy. And now he proves that, that this is really the view, uh, not because Aristophanes invented it. Aristophanes is only the mouthpiece of that opinion, and it refers to the comedy of Aristophanes. Uh, will you read this passage, please, whoever has it? For this you see yourself in the comedy of Aristophanes, yeah? That some Socrates is there. Do you have it? And in the comedy of Aristophanes, you saw yourself a man called Socrates swinging around in a basket. <coughs> he walked on air, sputtering a great deal of nonsense about matters of which I understand nothing at all. I do not mean to disparage that kind of knowledge if there is anyone who is wise about these matters. I trust Miletus may never be able to prosecute me for that. For mm -hmm. such a great... Yeah, for such a great uh, charge, yeah. But the truth is, Athenians, I have nothing to do with these matters. And almost all of you are yourselves my witnesses of this. I beg all of you who have ever heard me discussing, and they are many, to 
inform your neighbors and tell them if any of you have ever heard me discussing such matters at all. That will show you that the other common statements about me are as false as this one. But the fact is... Yeah, no, let us stop here. Now, um, I, am, uh, uh, I think we should translate Moretri at one point. As witnesses for that, I exhibit the many of you. We must respond the many of you. That should be brought up. So, Socrates, he speaks then first in defense against the first accusers of his alleged wisdom. And he says, I mean, the heavenly things, things beneath the earth, and uh, rhetoric, he possesses nothing of this kind. But he does not despise it. He does not despise it. But, you know, how does he prove that he does not possess it? After all, a, a mere denial is never enough before a law court. Answer, slightly exaggerating, He never conversed with the many about this subject. He never conversed with those who accused him of it, about it. So there is, the, at least his doing these things is not notorious and cannot be notorious. Now, that was the first point. This, he has no knowledge of these things. And then one can say, well, if he doesn't know astronomy, for example, he surely cannot teach it. It's refuted. But that is not what Socrates does. Let's read the scene. Yes, or if you have it, read it. The fact is that not one of these is true. And if you have heard that I undertake to educate men and make money by so doing, that is not true either. Now, may I say one little thing which cannot be, uh, which could be brought out in the translation. Uh, he, he says that I do not educate human beings. That occurs all the time because uh, uh, that, is, that includes in itself also women and slaves, naturally. Uh, uh, the, the, Greek, the emphatic word is uh, uh, different from human beings, is men, andras, ombras. That has a kind of derogatory meaning that he... Uh, uh, teaches, educates such creatures, you know, such animals, men, yeah? So I think that it would be a fine thing to be able to educate. This too would be fine. Namely, just as astronomy and so on would be fine, yeah? As Gorgias of Leontina and Pranicus of Chios and Hippias of Elias do. For each of them, my friends, can go into any city and persuade the young men to leave the society of their fellow citizens, with any of whom they might associate for nothing, and to be only too glad to be allowed to pay money for the privilege of associating with themselves. And I believe that there is another wise man from Paros, residing in Athens at this moment. I happen to meet Callias, the son of Panicus. You know, that's true. I happen to, uh, to meet a ombre. He does not call him Callias, a big shot of an old family and uh, with, uh, well, and, uh, with all decorations uh, you could imagine. Uh, the, the, he, him he does not call a human being simply. He's an ombre, yeah? A man who has spent more money on sophists than in everyone else put together. So I said to him, he has two sons, Callias, if your two sons had been foals or calves, we could have hired a trainer for them who would have trained them to excel in doing what they are naturally capable of. He would have been either a groom or a farmer. But whom do you intend to take to train them, seeing that they are men? They are human beings, yes. You see, that's another animal species, yeah. Who understands the excellence? which a man and a citizen is capable of attaining. I suppose that... Middle who is an expert, let us say, in such, in, in that uh, excellence of this nature, the human as well as political excellence, yeah? I suppose that you must have thought of this because you have sons. 
Then it's also noted that because of the acquisition of sons, you see, just that she had acquired calves and, <laughs> and goats. This was, and the, the acquisition is here not by sale, obviously, yeah? And by purchase, I mean, yeah? Is there such a person or not? Certainly there is, he replied. Hmm? Who is he, I said. And where does he come from, and what does he speak? You see, where does he come from? He's, of course, not an Athenian. Yeah. 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 Socrates, he replied, from Peros, by Minai. You see how strictly he answers each question, yeah? Like a questionnaire. Who? <coughs> where from? For what? No. Yeah. Yes? Then I thought that Evans was a fortunate person if he really understood this art. Because there is an other field in our language, not the natural sciences, but the social sciences, which Socrates might teach. And I mean, the, the art of making human beings good as human beings and as citizens. That art exists with this wonderful to have it. I do not have it, unfortunately. The sugar is not so specific, yeah, but he treats the two subjects, natural science and social science, as I call it, or astronomy and educating human beings differently. Did you see how did he treat them differently? You must watch that. We cannot afford to go into all details in the work that somebody must call out. What does it mean? <coughs> With a specific, yeah, is, that is true. And uh, why does he do that? Why does he do that? Did well, he so mention... So essentially to proceed uh, on what uh, Carlos here would give him to Yeah, but why does he have to do that? I mean, it was a known fact that there were uh, professional teachers of the excellence of human beings and citizens. And why does he have to break that? Let me start from, I mean, I come back to that, that is, is correct. So I, I think the first point is this. In the first case, in the case of astronomy, he exhibits witnesses that he is, does not possess knowledge of that. Who are the witnesses? Too many. In the second case, regarding educating human beings and citizens, a parallel art to the art of educating colds and calves, he does not exhibit witnesses. Why not? He does not attempt even to prove that he possesses that art, or does not possess it. Why? Is it not notorious that he did? Is it not notorious that he does possess? I do not understand the, uh, the second half of your sentence. That he... That he does possess that art? Apparently not. Apparently no one in Athens believed for one moment that Sogades possesses the art of educating human beings and citizens. <coughs> The first was at least uh, that was believed. He had to prove it. No one thought that of Sylvanus, that he would educate. And he proves and he gives an indirect proof why no one believes it, by the story. What does he do? Yes, yes I know. Well, that he didn't possess the art that he would be a wealthy man because he would make money out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He is obviously not a wealthy man. That comes there for the... More simply, let's stick to the story here. Yeah. This man is an expert. He spends a lot of money looking for teachers of this type. He sends other people to the educators. He does not educate. And this, of course, also means that he, he thinks that's perfectly uh, all right. I mean, just as you, you have to bring up codes and you look for the best groom. Uh, so well as is only more informed about the best uh, trainers of humans, and if he hears there is someone around, he sends people. Is this and, and he, mind you, given the prejudice against these 
carry the foreign service. Yeah? If they try to play the act of course, it's still perfectly all right. Everyone does that who can afford it. Kaya is the richest man of Athens at some time. Uh, does it and naturally I helped him. I, I would have helped him, but but for the fact that Kaya said already anticipated me. Yeah. Well, isn't uh, this a witness and that Callias, who has paid for education of others and looked for teachers, does not recognize Socrates as a teacher? Yeah, he doesn't occur to him for one moment that Socrates would do that. Yeah? That only confirms. I mean, there, there was no suspicion of Socrates in education. Yeah, there is something else, however, the which was not settled between Mr. Kendrick and me. There is already uh, a teacher of these young men, an official teacher. Official? No. I know that's all private. Well, all private. Okay, well, that was... No, no, no welfare state. <laughs> it's all private. No, but it's something else. You see, he tells the story of Kalyas and of Oyenos of Paros. These are two individuals mentioned by proper names. But these are not said. There are some other proper names mentioned here before. We have to prove it on a proper basis. Chronicles, uh, uh, Hippias, and Gorgias. Did he mention any proper names when speaking of astronomers? Hmm? It's interesting. I suggest... Later. Later. Pardon? Later. Later. Yeah, yeah, sure, when he's compelled by, in self-defense, to mention his Anaxagoras, but I don't know. It is not odious in any way to be a teacher of human beings in the excellence of human beings and of citizens, but uh, astronomy is odious. That, I think, is the uh, explanation of that. So, he has finished, the first accusers. They don't have a link to stand yeah? Is there a series of trials before Socrates trials in Athens of other of sophists? I, I remember no, yeah, sure, sure. somewhere. There is, you can draw up a long list. Uh, you, uh, it is not even necessary to go into very uh, out of the way literature. But if you read only Diogenes Laertius' lives, yeah, and see who of them was got in trouble in Athens, the most famous case is Anaxagoras. And the case of Protagoras. Yeah? Protagoras was accused because he had written a book which begins with this sentence. Whether there are gods or not, I do not know. Obscurity of the matter, as well as the brevity of my life, prevents me from knowing it. Meaning, you know, the, that is, and that of course it was burned by the hangman, so to speak. Yeah? And it was thrown out. Sure, and uh, there are many other cases, I've forgotten how the name, but it's easy to, to uh, assemble them. There, there was a technical term. The charge was impiety, asebaya in Greek, and the asebaya trials played a great role. In the 19th century, and to some extent even up to our time, the tendency was not to believe that the real object of the trials was impiety because they believed that persecution is an invention of the Old Testament and therefore of Christianity and Islam, and classical antiquity was free from that vice, you know, and therefore they uh, said the real reason is political. And for example, Socrates was hated because of his connection with these subversive political fellows like Azibides and Christians. And that was only a prophecy, what is that? An excuse, pun? Pretense, a pretense. In, or, or what did you say? Pretext. A pretext, that's a thing. A pretext in order to live. And Burnett, who is one of the most respectable classical scholars of the last generation, his whole interpretation of, of Sugares and the trial is based on that. But one can only say, you cannot accuse Socrates on the basis of a pretext if this is not a crime. The, the provision was there. And it is made, I mean, I think that Burnett's interpretation can be refuted uh, not 100%, but 500% by the text of Plato's Apology alone, without going into any other uh, text of the same kind. And it was clearly, yeah, 
to introduce some of these modern terms, there was a kind of hysteria at the time of Socrates' trial. There is a brief writing of Isocrates of very great subtlety called the Pusiris. Pusiris. A very subtle piece. And Mr. Bloom, in his doctor's dissertation, which is unfortunately published, has interpreted it very well. And there, Isocrates speaks that philosophy was crushed completely by virtue of the trial and so that was a real, a real uh, flight and fear. I mean, that what some people think has happened in this country under McCarthy is, is absolutely child's play in every respect. The guiding people there were Denmark trucks, members of the Democratic Party, and the Athenian sense, please. <laughs> but, uh, as American says, uh, it's uh, true, but uh, it, and whether they were honest in that matter, whether they did not have, did not have the feeling so well as it was a kind of origin of all this going on and this uh, clubs and that, that is possible, no one knows. American person and hatred for you know. But the main point is they could appeal to a law and to a strong public sentiment supporting that law. That is undeniable, and there is no, I mean, it is absolutely silly to speak of Athens as a liberal city. A liberal city is a city which has a First Amendment on a group of them. Athens did not have a First Amendment, and it was a capital crime not to believe in the boss of the city. Proven clearly was the best case. That's a way in Athens also a substantial part of the population, say 50% of the population who saw it differently, is clear because Socrates was not unanimously condemned, and there was a shifting vote. Uh, th these people might have acquitted Socrates, mm -hmm. if Socrates had uh, perhaps flattered them a bit more, or whatever maybe. But uh, that this was that Socrates, uh, that, that this was a legal crime. There is no doubt about that. And even the other trial to which Socrates refers, the government said the generals and the side, that also was a religious crime. It was a question not of not saving shipwrecked sailors, but of, no, of not bringing home the corpses for Orthodox burial, and many other cases of this kind. So we, we, that is, I think, the modern liberal mind has created a kind of myth about the past, and uh, which uh, must be revised, because we are, as social scientists, we cannot afford the luxury to be mythologists, and therefore we have to try to bring this to life. Now, where are we now? So it has proven that the first accusers to the people do not have a leg to stand on. But that is very bad for him as an orator, because he has proven too much. How could he have become suspect in the first place if he had no Sophia, no wisdom whatever? After all, he was notorious as a wise man. And now he says, the two kinds of wisdom, natural science, science and social science, that's none of them. Will you read that, the beginning where he makes the transition? Perhaps some of you may reply, but Socrates, what is the trouble with that? So that is not very good to say. It would be better to say, what is your business? What is top pragma? What is the, so coming from prata and doing, doing? What is your business? What is your affair? Yeah. What has given rise to these prejudices against you? You must have been doing something out of the ordinary. All these re rumors and reports of you would never have arisen if you had not been doing something different from other men. So tell us what it is that we may not give our verdict arbitrarily. And I think that is a fair question. And I will try to explain to you what it is that has raised these prejudices against me and given me this reputation. And let me stop here. Yeah, this, yeah, this name and this calumny. Prejudice is not a word which has a critical. 
So this is going to answer the question. He repeats what he had said before. I will say, tell you the whole truth. And so what he says, as a matter of fact, I do possess some wisdom. And that is, is some wisdom, yes, but entirely different from these two things. It is perhaps the human wisdom. In contradistinction to the superhuman wisdom, of the astronomers and the sophists. Both the fact that Socrates possesses such wisdom and its character is vouched for by the Delphian god. The god in Delphi said something about Socrates' wisdom. But here's the difficulty. Under what conditions did the god speak? Did he suddenly say Socrates is wise? Or was there an incentive for the God to speak? His cohort, Serapon, went with, with a rhetorical question. Pardon? His, his friend went with the rhetorical question. Yeah, whether well, the question was rhetorical or not, we don't know. But if one thing is clear, the God spoke in reply to a question. Yeah, in fact, we can say, we say a question raised by Serapon. Good. Now let us consider Sherifon, a well-known comrade of Socrates of the first hour, the whole generation, and he is the a companion of Socrates in the clouds, you know, and, and frequently presented because of his paleness, and he was called a bat because he never went out by day, and this kind of thing. Yeah, all right, but how did Chelephon gets his idea to go to Delphi and to ask the god. After all, you don't go to, uh, to some place and ask, is this and this man wise? Yeah? I mean, uh, uh, or what do you think of that man's wisdom? I mean, there must be something. So there must have had something in him which induced Chelephon to go to Delphi and ask God. I'm not now concerned with his motives, whether he wanted to uh, prevent persecution of Socrates by that, as some people have, have suggested. That may be true, maybe not. But still, what is the premise of such a question in itself on the simplest, straightforward level? Uh, but he was. Yes, absolutely. Sherefon presupposes, prior to going to Delphi, that Socrates is wise. Yeah, and that he has this to a very great construction. As those of you who have read this assignment of today have all the data needed for getting a great surprise if they don't have it already. So when it describes in the immediate secret his wisdom. Yeah? But this wisdom of Socrates as described in the apology is, if I may say so, post-Delphic, that arises out of the oracle. The oracle induces him, induces Socrates to do certain things, and these certain things constitute Socrates' wisdom. But these things, this post-Delphic wisdom, was not the wisdom on the basis of which Sheridan went to Delphi. That seems to be a necessary conclusion. What was, what was that pre-Delphic wisdom of Socrates of which Sheriffon was aware? Not a word said that here. Anybody's guess. Anybody's guess. It might have been something like astronomy. We don't know. Here we are. That's very interesting. But there was a, there was a pre-Delphic wisdom is proven by the fact. You can also say, uh, uh, applying to uh, Sugar is a distinction which is uh, commonly applied to Kant, whose writings are uh, divided into the critical writings, critique of pure reason, etc., and the pre-critical writings, Kant's writings which Kant wrote prior to that. You can also say there was a cr uh, a critical Socrates wisdom, Socratic wisdom, the wisdom of the revered Socrates, which we know, and there was a pre-critical Socratic wisdom, 
of which we have a caricature in the clouds, and there is more evidence for that, wholly independent of Aristotle's for example, Socrates says in the Phaedo, what Xenophon indicates in the Economicus, and what Socrates indicates to some extent in the uh, what he indicates in the Parmenides as well as in the banquet, as I believe I have shown the last, uh, last quarter. But still, if we let us forget about these other things. Mr. Cohen. No, that, that was just my question. I see. Uh-huh. So Sherifon knew of a Socratic wisdom underdating the Delphi wisdom. But so he says something else about Sherifon, which is not unimportant. Sherifon is known to everyone. You see, he says here, uh, for Xerophon, you know somehow. And he does not say from that comedy of Aristophanes, which would have been most improper. But what does he say? How, do, do, how does everyone know of Xerophon? Yes? From youth upward, he was my constant companion or comrade, a partisan of your democracy. Well, literally, sharing and, your and, 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 uh, a comrade to your multitude, yeah? And he was exiled with you, yeah? And he returned with you. Now, here he refers, of course, not to every individual Athenian, because not every individual Athenian was exiled and returned. It was a fighting part of the democracy, yeah? The fighting part. Uh, especially the great leader was Thrasybulus, who had nothing to do with that. Yeah, Thrasybulus. And uh, that was uh, they. So Xerophon is the link between Socrates and the democracy, which implies, of course, and we cannot possibly uh, overlook that, that Socrates himself was not a comrade of the democracy. Xerophon was a link. Now, what did the God say? Let us read this sentence. That is a little bit uh, immediate after. Once he went to Delphi and ventured to put this question to the oracle. I entreat you again, my friends, not to interrupt me with your shouts. He asked if there was someone who was wiser than I. The priestess answered that there was no one. Charaphon himself is dead, but his brother here will witness to what I say. Yeah, so that is a true demonstrable fact, a living witness phenomenon. What did the priest, the Pythia, yeah, said, no one is wiser than Socrates. That started the whole thing. Yeah, but what, that is oracle, and oracles need interpretation. They are not unambiguous by nature. Yeah? There's a presupposition of wisdom here, though. Just because no one is wiser than Socrates doesn't mean that he is wise. Surely not. Absolutely. What, all right, what would be the alternative? I mean, in, in, in develop that thought. What could the priestess have meant? If you see what is important, it's not Apollos. Uh, Sherephon was not addressed by Apollo. He was addressed by a human being. S- speaking for Apollo. That's not unimportant. Now, this woman said, no one is wiser than Socrates. What could she have meant? All men are inverted and only the God is one. All men are, let us make it quite clear, all men are unwise. Sure. All men, that's it. But that, did Socrates choose to understand it this way? How did he understand it? Uh, after the investigation. That he is the wisest of all men, he said. Very clear in the sequel 21b, 5 to 6. What does he say asserting that I am most wise or the wise? I am not wise. He said, I know I am not wise. That he didn't know yet. He understood his statement, no one is wiser than Socrates, as meaning Socrates is most wise. Well, uh, in the sequel to this, uh, yeah, but that is what he finds out. You see, the God is much wiser than Socrates. Much wiser. Socrates uh, misunderstands the God. 
and thinks uh, uh, that he shows the gods. He understands the god to mean that the world is most wise. And then he starts on, a, on an inquiry as to the meaning of that absolutely unintelligible miracle play in the oracle because Socrates knows that he is not wise. And now the god tells him he's most wise. What, what does this mean? It's fantastic. And then he makes an in, in inquiry. And the result of the inquiry is that he understands the god to mean that Socrates, all men are unwise. And so was a particular thing. It's a slight change. So that is, is unwise, yes. But he is still wiser than everyone else because he knows that he is unwise. So you see, neither the one nor the other extreme interpretation is valid. Now this mere misunderstanding, this cross misunderstanding, that so that is, is most wise, is of course as some kind of psychology would tell you, not altogether meaningless, you see. So there must have had some notion. I mean, as though he, he, he couldn't believe that the God meant it so literally, but somehow if he had not had a feeling that uh, he was uh, not altogether unwise, he would not have misunderstood the God that way. But make it clear, let us assume that someone particularly ugly would be told by the goddess, you are the most handsome man, more handsome than Gary Cooper or any other hero. Uh, no, that would be that the god is crazy. Yeah? So this doesn't say the god is crazy. He doesn't understand it. But uh, he doesn't understand it, but he cannot simply reject it. Now, how does he argue? Yeah, we must now stop. At this point, we must be stopped. Now, what, what then does he say by, assert by saying that I am wisest? For he does not lie after all. Yeah? For it would not be right for him. It would not be right for Paul. What this sentence means can, or is the explanation of this, for it would not be right for him, is given in the second book of the Republic, where he is, uh, where Socrates discusses whether the gods may lie. Socrates is not aware of possessing any wisdom. On the other hand, he knows that the god does not lie, for it is not right for him to lie. Where does this wisdom lie? You see, we must follow that step by step. Always ask, what is the world's wisdom? Natural science excluded. Social science excluded. What is it? He, but he, he knows, he has knowledge. He knows that the God cannot lie. What is that wisdom? I mean, there's knowledge and wisdom. You can use them uh, exchangeably here. Should his wisdom not consist in believing in the oracles, then of course it would not be a distinctive wisdom because many other people believe in the oracles. Yeah? But we, we have to wait. But this hypothesis is unfortunately destroyed immediately after it has occurred to us because how does it go on? And for a long time I was I did not I was embarrassed as to what he asserts. Yeah? Do you have that? And thereafter, with some hemming and hawing, what Goodson said, I turned to an investigation of him, the God. I went to a man who was reputed to be wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I should prove the right answer wrong. And meaning quite I should, should refute the oracle. So a man who is going to about to refute an oracle is not a man who believes in oracles. Simply. That's impossible. I make this suggestion, which is also very tentative. After our attempt to identify Socrates' wisdom with belief in oracles has been refuted by the text, what, what new suggestion would develop from this immediate context as a very tentative suggestion? As it was in consistent skepticism. 
In not believing, yeah, let us be very simple, not to use such big terms. In not believing at all, perhaps, move them on. At any rate, now there begins a long disquisition of Socrates' attempt to refute the oracle, and this refutation consists in a simple uh, empirical test. The God has said, I'm wiser than my fellow citizens. Now I look at my fellow citizens, and I prove to be wiser than they, so the God is right. That is his wisdom. Yeah, but is there not one, uh, we must stop at this point, unfortunately. Is there not, there is one remarkable thing about this examination of fellow citizens. He doesn't examine everyone, he uses samples, naturally, as a, to this extent he is a practical man. But uh, does he use samples of all classes? No, no. philosophers. Yeah. How do you know that there were any philosophers? In Athens. But go on. You are on a, on a, on a scent. Well, politicians and public men, poets, and divinators and artisans, but the, the, the object of his search. <laughs> but as far as we did, do know, at least from from Plato, if we can believe Plato, that he did speak with uh, people whom he thought had ideas, even if this is, uh, and always his answers to them were just not politeness. He did think they had ideas and was willing to go along with their thoughts and investigate them. These men, he thought, had some type of wisdom. Do you mean as a craftsman? Friends. No, no, the people he was talking with in the Thunder Dialogue. Oh, some of them. and you don't know that yet. We are here. You see, you must not forget the apology of Socrates, the only platonic work with the name Socrates is a title. Yeah? And in a way, that is the entrance door to the whole thing. Here you get a presentation of Socrates, self-presentation of Socrates, given to the whole citizen body of Africa so to say, the official version. And because that is really, no, no occasion is more solemn than if you have to defend yourself against the capital charge relating to your whole life, not to a particular murder or so which you might have committed. And therefore, that is really a, a great thing. No, but you were on a scent, and let us try to, to uh, well, get... Well, I don't know whether I can agree with you, what you just said, because you say, all right, he mentioned some by indirection first, or by, uh, there might be others he did not talk to. No, but honestly, but what would you regard, uh, I mean, a, a competent examination? And he doesn't have to talk to every individual, because there are some people who are notoriously dumb. And uh, to, to, to accept it, that it's really a waste of time, although a social scientist today would perhaps think uh, they also should be uh, accepted. Well, he goes to those who are supported by public opinion. Very good. Supposed to be wise. That's the word. Now, supposed to be wise means, of course, the state, not The second, I mean, men who are able to manage the affairs of the city must be wiser than men who can only manage their own little household. Clear. The other kind is a poet, surely a man of authority, generally regarded as wise men about the whole human life and not only about the polity and policy of earth. And the other one are the specialists, who have some specialism. Uh, because this uh, craftsman includes, of course, such people as physicians, too. Good. So there is no other class in Athens which is omitted. If you say the oracle men, they are also uh, taking care of several of the posts. But the unscientific limitation of Socrates' test lies elsewhere. Yeah? Socrates did not conceive of himself as belonging to any of these inclusive classes. Yeah, but he could not. I mean, the question is, he, his examination could take on only the form of a comparative examination, compared with others. Is he wiser or not wiser than the others? And therefore, so as himself is, is out. But, but which, I mean, what kind of people does he not examine? 
a kind of people mentioned already, so we don't have to have any record of knowledge. Yes? The educators. Yeah. On what ground are they excluded from the examination? I mean, not from the explicit examination. Didn't the article said that 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 any opinion. Exactly. I mean, by limiting this long and detailed quest to his fellow citizens, fellow citizens, he excludes these distinguished foreigners who had uh, also according to ordinary opinion a very high claim to wisdom. Sugares, I mean, you are perfectly right, Sugares examines these fellows like, like uh, Protagoras and Gorgias and Hippias and the astronomers too, and the theatres for example. But in this presentation to the Athenian multitude, he does not refer to that except by a casual remark that he examined both fellow citizens and foreigners. He makes it, but there is no, there is no class. His class is not examined. That would be too high for that purpose. The whole mystery of this work, I think, is consistent in fact. That the ceiling, the horizon, is terribly low, and we uh, terribly low. So it is really talks down, has to talk down. In the spirit of this remark, we uh, I read to you from the gorgeous. And we must see later on how this comes out, and especially also, of course, later on he, he takes out one of these letter men. <laughs> Now, who is particularly pertinent for the occasion, name is the accuser, old Melito. And then he can easily show his superiority to him. But let us keep in mind this question. We have to see what is Socrates' wisdom. That is the most elemental presentation. So that is wisdom, the according to that. What does it consist? To repeat, uh, astronomy, natural science, on the one hand, educating human beings and citizens are both excluded. What is it? What is that? It's an absolute riddle. Where do we find it? Justice in the Republic, the question is, they can't find justice. And you know, they look around and then they say, there is lying in front of our feet, and that's the reason why we overlooked it. That is for something similar as true of that wisdom. It is so inconspicuous. And we must try to do that. Someone of you want to say again? Yeah, uh, when he talks about his three accusers and the people they represent, yeah. uh, the last one represents the orator. And I wonder, what are the orators as distinguished from the states, whom he also doesn't seem to question? Are they something like a domestic sophist, or...? The orators are not the rhetoricians. Gorgias is a teacher of orators. A teacher of orators is not itself necessarily an orator. Yeah. Nor are they statesmen. No, we, we must go to that. I mean, there is a certain... There is a certain ambiguity, and I think it is due to the fact it has something to do with the ambiguity of the Greek word, din your goi which is first used in the sense of artisans and then used in a different sense. We will take up this next time. Yes? Might it be that by the time a statesman is a statesman, he's living off the public and no longer has to have a, a livelihood like an orator might still have to have? And how does it affect the question of wisdom? Well, then you have the three types of uh, people then we will come, we will take that up next time. I mean, uh, uh, we will see that there, there are other irregularities there which we have to discuss. Good. And I think we don't need a paper uh, next Wednesday, this Wednesday, uh, but next Monday, Mr. Steinberger's presentation. Finish our discussion of the first part of the apology today. Perhaps I should say a word about the past as I discern it. There is first the Prohemion introduction, then the discussion of the first accusers, and 
and then the discussion with Melitus. And then a final part of the apology, of the defense. That goes till 34b, where it is explicitly said at the end of the defense. And then an epilogue. And then we have a new part in which the, the punishment is proposed. And finally, a speech after the condemnation. The speech after the condemnation is subdivided into an address on to those who have condemned him and one to those who have acquitted him. So you can say it consists of seven or eight parts. Is this, yeah, and we are now discussing still the, the first, the, uh, the apology against the first accusers. I remind you of the most important point. The first accusers said that Zuberlis is an astronomer and a rhetorician, and that he teaches others astronomy and rhetoric. He refutes that by an appeal to the accusers. You know that I do not do that. You, the many. But then, in order, he does something uh, supererogatory by showing that he does not teach also in another kind. He does not teach others human and political virtue, uh, meaning for pay. In this connection, the word sophist is used. It's very interesting. Sophist, well it's not a sophist, but sophist does not have here a derogatory meaning. These men who pay, who, who teach for pay, human for his virtue. So what is even says he in that he encourages people to send their sons to the sophists. But this wisdom too, he does not possess. Now, if we look at the discussion with some care, we see that Socrates does not truly refute the charge of the first accusers. He refutes only the assertion that he teaches these things for money. He teaches astronomy and rhetoric for money. That he teaches them publicly, because that, I say, he refutes it because anyone could have stood up and said, well, I know that you, my cousin or who else, went to take courses with you. Furthermore, we have seen that after the accusation is refuted, Socrates has to explain to the Athenians why did he become so famous, so notorious, so obnoxious. And then he tells the story of the oracle in Delphi. His comrade Chirophon went there in order to, to ask the god who is older than Socrates. Now Chirophon presupposed that Socrates was wise. But at that time, Socrates did not yet have that wisdom of which he speaks later. So that you must make a distinction between Socrates' pre-Delphic wisdom and his post-Delphic wisdom. And what that pre-Delphic wisdom was remains wholly obscure. We may imagine anything we please. Socrates does really not refute the charge that once upon a time, he was like Aristophanes, Socrates. The only thing which he refutes clearly is that he had ever any dealings with fellows like Strepsiades. Because if the Strepsiades had been around, he could have easily stood up and said, you lie, and you, I went to you, and so on. Now, we have to continue at this point and uh, to, in order, because we are confronted with that question which Socrates himself raises, what is Socrates' wisdom? What is Socrates' distinction? Because a man who is merely lacking wisdom is not for this reason conspicuous, and uh, is not for this reason likely to become the target of accusation. <coughs> There is only one very little point which I thought I should mention to you. In his report about his conversation with Callias, about Callias' two sons, do you remember that? That is in 28. He says, Callias has two sons, yeah? I asked him for he has two sons, Callias, if uh, there is two sons, 
where two cards or poems, uh, or poems, there is always a dual in Greek nature. A dual in the, so that is emphasized. That's funny with the two sons. I mean, you can, of course, say that it was a historical fact that Kalias did have two sons, and I, I'm sure that is so. But still, it is a, it's a strange. Why two? I read to you a passage from the Laws, 666e to 667a, that's in the second book. The Athenian stranger speaking to Cretan and Trump. Your polity is that of an army rather than that of city dwellers. And you keep your young people massed together like a herd of colts at grass. None of you takes his own colt, dragging him away from his fellows in spite of his fretting and fuming and puts a special groom in charge of him and trains him by rubbing him down and stroking him and using all the means proper to child nursing so that he may turn out not only a good soldier but also able to manage a city and cities. You see, the Spartan education is mass education. Of course, not what we understand today by mass education, but uh, of herds, of herds. This is, the Kalias is a true education, is that of an individual, is a private tutor who cares for him alone. Kalias' position is in between. He seeks a teacher, a tutor for his two sons. Therefore, and that is a, a symbol for the fact that the virtue which his uh, children and sons are going to achieve are those of um, belonging to the virtue of a human being and of a citizen. You, the virtue of a human being simply would be that of the individual, that of the citizen of a group. Two is in between. Now, let us begin at 21b9, at the moment where Socrates begins his examination of his fellow citizens. I went to interview a man with a high reputation for wisdom and <coughs> told him that here, if anywhere, I should succeed in disproving the oracle and pointing out to my divine authority. You said that I was the wisest of men, but here is a man who is wiser than I am. Well, I gave a thorough examination to this person, I need not mention his name, but it was one of our politicians that I was studying when I had this experience. And in conversation with him, I formed the impression that although in many people's opinion, and especially in his own, he appeared to be wise, in fact, he was not. That when I began to try to show him that he only thought he was wise and was not really so, my efforts were resented, both by him and by many of the other people present. However, I reflected as I walked away, well, I am certainly wiser than this man, it is only too likely that neither of us has any knowledge to boast of. But he thinks that he knows something which he does not know, whereas I am quite conscious of my ignorance. At any rate, it seems that I am wiser than he is to this small extent, that I do not think that I know what I do not know. After this, I went on to interview a man with an even greater reputation for wisdom, and I formed the same impression again. And here, too, I incur the resentment of the man himself, and a number of others. Yeah, let me start. Many of them. Yeah? Many of them. So the first examination is then of a party of the political man. And there is one expression which is crucial. For a, uh, a neither of us, he says, seems to know anything noble and good. Anything noble and good. In other words, none is completely ignorant, for example. Clearly they know, each knows that the other is a human being and that they are the city of Athens and so the word knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is here used in the widest sense. But they know nothing worthwhile, nothing noble and good. And one can also say, it, this implies also, they do not know what the noble and the good is. And that is a grave complication as will appear later. 
Uh, let us read the Im uh, the uh, immediate uh, sequel where we left off. We cannot possibly read the whole. From that time on, I interviewed one person after another. I realized with distress and alarm that I was making myself unpopular, but I felt compelled to put my religious... And may I say that I became hated. Unpopular <laughs> is a, a euphemism. <laughs> but I felt compelled to put my religious duty first. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> Nevertheless, it seemed to me necessary the affair of the God, uh, to esteem most highly the affair of the God. Since I was trying to find out the meaning of the oracle, I was bound to interview everyone who had a reputation for knowledge. And by dog, gentlemen, for I must be frank with you, my honest impression was this. It seemed to me, as I pursued my investigation of the God's command, that the people with the greatest reputations were almost entirely deficient while others who were supposed to be their inferiors were much better qualified in practical intelligence. Yeah, no matter. Yeah, with a view to, sen to being sensible would be a better concept. Or to, with a view to conducting themselves sensibly. You see that the examination of the God, the critical examination of the oracle, turns into obeying an injunction of the God. And that is of very great importance. Namely, the injunction to find out the meaning of the oracle. And the whole quest of Socrates is, proves to be a vindication of the oracle. Starting with the distrust of the oracle, it culminates in a vindication of the oracle. Socrates proves to be more sense, the most sensible of all the, of these men. What does sensibility mean? A phronis is a Greek word. Prudence is a traditional translation of the word, the old sense of the word. Prudence, practical wisdom. So there is this more practical wisdom than the others. So astronomers do not have, they are wise, they do not have practical wisdom. These men who can educate human beings, you remember, in civic and human virtue, they also have wisdom. Practical wisdom is a prudence. That is what Socrates has. In what does it consist? In what does Socrates' practical wisdom consist? Practical wisdom is that wisdom which we need for acting as sensible human beings. For that purpose, we do not need uh, astronomy or rhetoric. Now, in what does this uh, practical wisdom consist? In Socrates' case. Yes? Accurate knowledge of what you know. You are pointing the right direction, but a simpler and more hard hitting expression. Knowledge of his ignorance. Yeah, but how then can he live if he knows only that he's ignorant? How can he act? What guides him? What gives him guidance? What guides him? And he tells us in a way what that is. The oracle. The oracle. We have to be, we have to fix this. Uh, the oracle, not the oracle as completely self evident, very far from it, the enigmatic character, the obscure character of the oracle. That cuts it. We can perhaps put it as for us taking a much later expression. So is his, in a way, faith in the oracle. And he tries to understand that oracle, that which was later on called by Augustine, faith seeking understanding of what was believed in. in so there is that is something of this kind, and we must see whether this works out. Now we come now to the second step. He turns now to other people. Well, there is one point which we must discuss. By the dog, that was a question which uh, you raised uh, us uh, for class. What does this all mean? It was not a coinage of Socrates, it occurs in Aristotle. But what does it mean? I mean, it occurs more than once in, in Platonic writings, although not everywhere. It never occurs in Xenophon. What does it mean? What is that? And I've got it, it's a strange oath. The bottle, colloquial oath, not uh, belonging to elegant diction. Yes? 
Was it an attempt to avoid using the name of God? Answer yourself. Yes. No. No. Because he swears all the time by Zeus and by uh, I think he swears in this very context somewhere by Zeus. But he swears by Zeus all the time. No. That can't be true. There is in the gorgeous, in gorgeous 482e, there is a little explanation skill. By the dogs, the Lord of the Egyptians. That gives us some indication. Who were the Egyptians? I mean, apart from being the, uh, it's for the fact that they developed in the Nile Valley and built pyramids. The Egyptians were, were presented by Herodotus in his great work as men of excessive piety. They worshipped anything. And one could first say that it is a part of the fact that Socrates has a kind of extreme piety that he worshipped everything. There is a funny passage in the dialogue of Lysis, 211e. Uh, which I will read. Uh, one, a, a one man wants to get possession of horses, another dogs, another money, and another honors. Of these things I like little, but for the possession of friends I have quite a passionate longing, and would rather obtain a good friend than the best quail or cock in the world. Yes, by Zeus, rather than any horse or dog, meaning beings which are infinitely more valuable than a quail or a cock. By Zeus, rather than a horse and a dog. I believe even by the dog that rather than all Darius's gold, the Persian king's gold, I would choose to gain a dear comrade. You see, we have some two together, by Zeus, by the dog. And in the connection where he mentions dogs as a, a rather desirable possession, not, yeah, a dog is mentioned together with a horse. Is anyone I say never mentions uh, uh, sets oaths of Socrates? But he does something in a criminal. He tells a story of a man who has a herd threatened by wolves, and he is, uh, seeks a dog protects her. And then there is a conversation, if I remember well, between the dog and the wool. And then there's a, the conversation between the dog and uh, between the dog and someone else. And then the dog swears by Zeus. <laughs> that is the difference between play and understand. By this little uh, difference. Now what what really does it mean? If we uh, do not take uh, this uh, ironical excessive piety to seriously. It, I believe it is a joke and, in a way, a rather uh, annoying joke. But I cannot prove that. I mean, there are certain suggestions in the Hudifron which brought me to believe that, but I, I don't know whether this would stand up under an analysis of all the passages. It is a kind of joke at vulgar piety the belief in uh, Zeus, Hera, and so on. So as I believe, say this, you talk all the time about these gods as if you knew them, yeah? And, uh, and you, as you knew them, the poets talk about them, they tell them stories as if they have been present. There are beings, say they are presented as beings who take a special interest in men, are very much concerned with men. Now, but Examine that. You say that the gods are a species of living beings who care for men. You do not know that. And you would have to, many profound studies would be needed to prove such beings caring for men. But there is one species of living beings which is empirically known to everyone as caring for men, and one species only. And what is that? It's really, in, a, in itself, an extraordinary fact, I think. It's the dogs. It's the dogs are the only species 
who take to the name in their name a threat. Is that, I, I think that is a part of his story. Part, I don't know whether it's a the whole. Now Sogolis turns to the poets, but it is to, be, uh, to what kind of poets? To the poets of tragedies and of epigrams and the others. That in a way, he means, of course, all poets, but it is very remarkable that he does not mention here the comic poets. Now, what about, what about the, the wisdom of the poets, which was much more admirable than that of the politicians? What did we see here? Now, let us read that. Tricky taking up their poems, which seem to be, uh, uh, they have been most carefully made by them. Yeah. I used to pick up what I thought were some of their most perfect works and question them closely about the meaning of what they had written in the hope of incidentally enlarging my own knowledge. Well, gentlemen, I hesitate to tell you the truth, but it must be told. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that any of the bystanders could have explained the, those poems better than their actual authors. So I soon made up my mind about the poets, too. I decided that it was not wisdom that enabled them to write their poetry, but a kind of instinct or inspiration. Yeah, but by some nature, what is it going say? By some nature and God possessed. Yeah? Such as you find in seers and prophets who deliver all their sublime messages without knowing in the least what they mean. It seemed clear to me that the poets were in much the same case. And I also observed that the very fact that they were poets made them think that they had a perfect understanding of all other subjects, of which they were totally ignorant. So I left that line of inquiry, too, with the same sense of advantage that I had felt in the case of the politicians. Yeah. The poets understand their own doings less than the hearers. The poets were not by wisdom, but by some nature or inspiration. Like whom? Like some other human beings. Priests? They are priests, not exactly, but the soothsayers and, and, and soothsayers, and like the Pythia. You remember, uh, uh, Seraphon hadn't heard this from Apollo, he had heard it from the Pythia. So there is leaves then, I believe in the order. So it is beliefs in the utterances of an unwise being. Because what is true of the poets is true of the, the prophets in, in Delphi too. Yet he examines these utterances of an unwise being. This is his wisdom. He is wiser than the Pythia, than, than the uh, than all of them. So the result of all these things is that Socrates is hated and envied, but also, that's all the other side of it, a certain feeling of superiority on Socrates' side. He is free from that illusion of service. You see, the poet's explanation is the central part. The central part, and it is quite clear why it is the central part, because it throws light on the problem of the oracle, and the oracle is the starting point of the oracle. Now, the third stage, the artists, well, the manual workers, not good on what happened there? They possess knowledge. The shoemaker knows why he does what he does, whereas the poet, according to this description, does not know what he does. But they believe that they are wise in the greatest things, and there they are absolutely wrong. They are, have a limited wisdom, but they claim to be simply wise in this area. Now, this passage, this is the third sentence, reflect of, but for Athenians, they seem to me to have the same effect as the poets. Do you have that? But gentlemen, these professional experts seem to share the same failing which I had noticed in the poets. I mean, that on the no, strength no, that is not correct. There is something else. The, the poets and the good craftsman. He, he omitted that. And the good craftsman. He spoke here of the, let us say, of the manual artisans, if I may try to bring out the meaning of the Greek term. 
And now he says they, these men will have to sit there in the same protect as the Poles and the good craftsmen. Who are these good craftsmen? But the Greek word for which I translated now by craftsmen, being your boy, being your boy. I write rather singular, being your boy. That is also used for craftsmen, but it has a wider meaning. So it can also be used in the sense of magistrates. Well, literally it means something like the people who work in the multitude, in the demons. But these are not only the shoemakers, they are also the magistrates. And you only have to look back at it's cock, says the, the English Greek the English dictionary, you see that this is a term in the sense term that the magistrate, the meaning of magistrate occurs in Thucydides and in other classical writers, say nothing of inscriptions. Now, see, they all have some, the politicians too are a kind of craftsman. The politicians too have a technique, have an art. It's a good one. But what Socrates says is also implied. It's just that Socrates lacks the wisdom of the astronomers. And as he lacks the wisdom of the educators, he also lacks the wisdom of the statesmen. It's important. And needless to say that he lacks the wisdom of the, the craftsman in the simple sense, that he is not a shoemaker, and so on. All these men, even the good salesmen, have some wisdom, but not the wisdom regarding the highest things. Many Athenians are wiser than Socrates. They all know, they all have a, a sphere in which they are competent, in which they can give reasons why they do what they do. But these Athenians are wiser than Socrates in partial things, in little things. He is wiser than all Athenians in the greatest things because he knows that he has no knowledge of them. But don't overlook the claim which Socrates makes while being prosecuted for a capital crime. I am wiser, he says, than all of you. Imagine this insolence. Therefore, as Xenophon puts it, that Socrates' defense speech was famous because of the big mouth, one could almost say, which he had. Megalegoria, which is a, is a derogatory term for talking big. Talk big. He was talking. So he, he is not. He does not flatter his, his uh, accusers or judges. We mentioned this is the end of the examination. I mentioned last time that Socrates did not examine the astronomers and the sophists, at least not according to this report. The people for one of whom he could be mistaken. Why did he not examine that? It was an oracle, of course. The Delphi God, by implication, denies the wisdom of the astronomers and the sophists by saying no one is wiser than Socrates. But the verdict of the Delphi God cannot be accepted without examination, as we have seen. And in this most important respect, the oracle was not examined. If we knew only the apology, and the simple listener, the intelligent listener to Socrates' events knew only the apology, yeah. no writings of Socrates, and he had never talked to Socrates. Uh, history must be bewildered at this point. What, I repeat then the question, what is the content of Socrates' wisdom? And let us read an answer which he gives in the immediate sequel, 2385. But in this respect, the God seems, in truth, to be wise. Do you have that? And in, its, in this oracle, to make this assertion, that human wisdom is of little or no worth. Do you have that? Yes. Yeah. But the truth of the matter, gentlemen, is pretty certainly this. That real wisdom is the property of God, and this oracle is his way of telling us that human wisdom has little or no value. It seems to me that he is not referring literally to Socrates, 
but has merely taken my name as an example, as if he would say to us, the wisest of you men is he who has realized, like Socrates, that in respect of wisdom, he is really worthless. Yeah. So, Socrates possesses human wisdom, i.e. wisdom of little or no value. This human wisdom is distinguished from wisdom proper, which would be superhuman, as either the gods have it or the astronomers and sophists may have it for all we know. Yet to become aware of this ignorance, regarding the greatest things, and to make others aware of it, is service to the god, as is said in the immediate sequel is served. Now we could read this up to this point as follows. Human wisdom is identical with humility. But on the other hand, lest we misunderstood the senses in a biblical sense, humility is nothing to be proud of, if I may express myself a bit comically uh, or contradictory. If you want. In other words, this humility is simply a, a sobriety to be aware of your ignorance. But then Socrates uses a somewhat different expression. Let us read the immediate statement you left out. That is why I still go about seeking and searching in obedience to the divine command. If I think that anyone is wise, whether citizen or stranger. And you see, there is here a careful reference to the strangers which would include gorgeous and regardless of stupidity. But uh, nothing is said about the subject they examination. Yeah? And when I think that any person is not wise, I try to help the cause of God by proving that he is not. Yeah, more literally, I assist the God. I come to the help of the God. That is important. This service to the God is an assistance to the God. Now, as, as an assistance to the God is, of course, something to be proud of. Not everyone can assist Apollo. Why does the God need assistance? Why does he need it? I mean, the answer is in what we have seen before. We have here a practical example before why Apollo needs assistance. He needs no assistance for inspiring the people. Yeah. I mean, that, that uh, it takes care of. But once the Pythia has spoken, what, what happens next? The oracles were famous for their ambiguity, for their obscurity, for their lack of clarity. The God cannot produce that or will not produce it. But the men need clarity. And this is done by a human examination. And this then the God needs assistance here. Is, is not Socrates' use of the oracle, uh, could it not be interpreted as simply Socrates' irony to a united hero? On one hand, he's being tried for impiety. On the other hand, he claims that everything he does is the expression of his duty to his own. You are not a high state on this. It's, no, 99% sorry. You see, let me state this as good as I can. In a strict sense, everything is ironic in a platonic dialogue. I mean, ironic doesn't mean sneering or, or, or you know, this kind of thing. Uh, what does irony mean originally? We have to go back to the original meaning. Originally, it's simply a advice and means dissimulation. And it is applied. I, if I remember when it is applied in the clouds, or is it in a other comical fragment? I don't know. Two sovereigns. But then it acquires, through sovereignism and probability, good meaning. Dissimulation has a good meaning if there is a noble dissimulation. Now, in this sense, the word is used by Aristotle when he speaks of the magnanimous man in the ethics. The magnanimous man is ironical towards the many. What does this mean? 
there are a lot of the men, uh, uh, the magnanimous man is Aristotle the Pandit, is a man of, who possesses all virtues and is aware of them. So the magnanimous man is a man of noble pride about his achievements, you can say. But when speaking to the men, to the people without achievements, he dissembles his superiority. That is his humanity. So noble dissimulation means to dissimulate one's superiority. It does not mean consist in saying to a man who is blind, what wonderful eyes you have, or not, I mean, or any, uh, or man who has any other effect to assert. But it is a dissimulation of, of the superiority on the part of superior man. Now, and that applies especially to that kind of superiority which the ancient thinkers regarded as the highest and to wisdom. The irony in the Socratic sense is dissembling one's wisdom in the sense of one's superiority. But what, what does it mean to, to, uh, uh, to, to dissemble one's wisdom? To present oneself as less intelligent than one is. And that, of course, is what Socratism very does. I mean, the famous stories, I don't know, and so it's asked questions, never answered them, the famous story. That is irony in one way. But it is, uh, one must see the background of this, uh, of the humanity in it. And when, so whenever Socrates speaks to anyone in the time, he speaks with a view to what the other fellow can understand. Or, will, or, or what will be useful to that other man. That is the irony. Now, if this is fundamental irony, everything's irony. Therefore, we have to raise this. Now, uh, can you repeat you now your statement, Mr. Faulkner? I think I, I stated or implied that his use of the oracle was, in a way, simply a joke. Um, yeah, the people. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, that is clear. That, that is, uh, I can't do that. But that doesn't dispose of the problem. Yeah. Because you have only to generalize that. You have here an unwise saying. Yeah. I mean, a, a saying going back to a human being who did not know what she was saying. Yeah. And this proves to be wiser than she could have thought. Yeah, but this is not so. Is, I mean, let's generalize, let's forget about the honor. This is not our human situation regarding knowledge altogether, if you generalize that. We are told certain things. Opinions are embodied in our institutions in our problems, in the very terms of our language. Yeah? You know, and, and they, the, the, the language doesn't know why, and the opinions don't know why. But then they prove to have, to make sense on examination. All our attempts at knowledge are preceded by opinions which we have not made and which are not fully wise because they don't know why, but which embody this. Yeah, I mean, to, to come to present day, the oracle, and yeah, replace for one moment the oracle by tradition. So this does not accept traditions in Mexico, yeah? but he doesn't reject them either. They contain some wisdom, and perhaps much wisdom that depends on what kind of tradition. So I think we have to take this uh, more seriously. I mean, that is true, that Socrates did not believe that the Pythia and uh, Apollo I, I, I would uh, take that for granted. And uh, so, but it is not a merely joking, not a merely joking. In Plato's seriousness, there is always playfulness, but also vice versa. In all his playfulness, there is seriousness. 
I mean, this is, of course, an apology, a very solemn thing. Is in a way a grotesque comedy. You can isolate it a lot. Yeah? Very easily. The sugar is here and does refuse to charge. And then, in a way, he tells them, and what you know about me from Aristophanes is, I mean, if you read it just with some care, uh, that is all true. Uh, except it's strep silence. I never did such a foolish thing. Only it is no longer true now than I did when I was much younger. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, com is, is, is in a way suggested. And many other things, it's a whole conversation with Melitos. I mean, that is a simple comedy, you know, that is a poet where it's, uh, uh, the accusation is self contradictory. He doesn't even have to prove that he believes in the gods because the accusation admits that he believes in the gods. Yeah, and so on. As, uh, but on the other hand, the playful is also not nearly that. Therefore, one, it is never sufficient to say it's ironic. Never. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Please. When it says God, in my book it's singular. Now, in the translation is, uh, should it be God or does it refer to no, a specific no. God? Yeah, that's a very good point, a very important point. Now, there are people who would, and I believe most of them would translate in the translation, when God occurs in the singular God with a capital G. And when they occur in the plural, of course, God with a, with a small g. Yeah, that is misleading, because this distinction, as we know it through the biblical tradition, between the one true God and the many false gods is, of course, not a Greek distinction in this way. Yeah? I mean, even those who were, in a way, monotheists, like Plato, admitted also other gods. I mean, they were not simply monotheists. I mean, they didn't accept Susan Hira, but the, the stars, for example. Uh, therefore, I think what, what, what the Greek word, when, when it occurs, hothios, yeah. the god, that may mean, and it means in many cases, that particular god we are speaking about, Apollo. Uh, therefore, one should translate it, I mean, in, in the perfect translation, which, which I suppose doesn't exist, it would have to be translated the God with a, with a small g. And of course, it may also be uh, without the article, then I would translate it a God. Also, write it with Jack Cabinet G, not suggest more than the text really says. The God, of course, could also be the highest God, actually. Yeah. There is the rule of the universe that could very well be. It depends on the context. But the God may very well mean the God in question. You know, in, in some occasions, maybe Apollo, in other cases, maybe Dionysus or whatever. Yeah. Otherwise, how does he know that he should assist the God uh, and uh, point out to others that they are not wise? I mean, isn't it enough just to find out that they are, aren't wise? without pointing it out to them. And pointing it out to them when he's arousing uh, their empathy. He takes up the question later. You know, but then, uh, then that is a, belongs to that broad question about which I'm working my way. What does Socrates know? How can he live? If, he do, if as he claims, he does not know anything. I mean, the fact that he knows that he's an Athenian citizen and does not even prove that he should obey the laws of Athens because there's still the question, should one obey the laws? But, but how does he, that, I mean, but how does he your question as you stated in it? Uh, how does he know? He knows, he believes that the God must say the truth. Yeah? Mm. It's not right for him to buy it. What the God says, literally, as he understands it, is manifestly not true. That's, yeah, yeah, I mean, as far as he knows, that he should be wise. And he wants to find out. You can say it's a mere curiosity. But by the examination, the God proves to be right. The prestige of the God increases. And he has a feeling that uh, this means this obscure and apparently absurd statement 
that Zubinus is wiser than the others, uh, is true and therefore it includes an incentive, an injunction to Zubinus, always to go through that process by which the God's hidden wisdom belongs man. And that is what he's doing. Well, we'll need to point out to others that they are on what, that they are not How can he find out? General, did you see that is so? Uh, he is not concerned with the others. He is concerned with the people of the God in him. But he cannot find out the truth of the God's statement, so as it's wiser than the others, except by looking at the others and finding out by conversations with them that they are this one. Well, I mean, is, can, can't he examine them and talk to them and thereby prove to himself that, yeah, but, yeah, but, without then going and outright and telling them what it means? No, he, he doesn't have to tap them. It is perfectly sufficient. They say saying something. I know what is absolutely true. And then he says, how do you know? Well, I would reason. And then there's what he says. Yeah, but you get these reasons. Reason number one is he's strong. This number B is wrong. This number C is wrong. So, and if we, even if we would be perfect, he's silent at that point. Humiliate. And so that's what we call, quote, unpopular, I call it, with that fact. I mean, that, uh, that cannot be avoided. I mean, as, an enemy, as a very misanthropic man once said, Hobbes, to disagree with a man means tacitly to accuse him of ignorance. <laughs> and uh, and you, you would be surprised how a very perceptive and sensitive many people who otherwise are not perceptive at all are in this manner. So that is widely known as vanity, but that is unfortunately a part of of the human scene. Well, if we leave aside for a second the possibility that the people, the people who convict Socrates have been hurt by him and want to get back at him, isn't it quite possible that Socrates has misread the knowledge level of the audience in the sense that he either overrates them or underrates them? In fact, his irony is discovered. It's not irony. It's actually sarcasm. I mean, last semester we were talking about this in the other dialogue. When the other person realizes that it's irony on your part, or it becomes sarcasm and insolence. Insolence, insolence, yeah, sure. Yeah, but then uh, what would follow? Is that Socrates would not, have, uh, would not, would not dispose of the enmity, yeah? the hatred of him. He would even confirm it and perhaps increase it. Yeah. Sure. That seems to have happened. And that would uh, raise the question, uh, did, uh, I mean, uh, is Sugar is not responsible for his own condemnation? But on the, that's a moot question, because on the other hand, uh, is it not so that Sugar is tells them in a language which they can understand? I cannot live differently than I live. That is uh, what he says, and I, that I believe is literally true. He could not live differently than he lived. And, since his way of life created the hatred, he had, to, he had to bear the consequences. We come to that later. Now, Sugadeh's service or assistance to the God has a consequence that Sugadeh has no political nor domestic activity, he has no time, and hence he lives in 10,000-fold poverty. He uses this, uh, he, uh, uh, he uses this uh, suggestion of very great wealth, 10,000, in order to bring out how, how, very, how could you do that in English? I don't know, I don't know a good um, English parallel to that. In 10,000 dollars. College professor. Yeah, it would be right. <laughs> sure. No, they, they, but some of them live even in much less um, uh, fold poverty. I mean, uh, some get to much less than 10,000, as you can see from the statistics. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, now, 
Yeah, he lives in, in a, you could perhaps say he lives, uh, he belongs to one of the highest poverty brackets in the country. That is very strange. Although he, is, uh, although he lives in such a poor man, his companions are the son of the wealthiest. You know, the wealthiest man. This incidentally answers a simple question which we must be realistic enough to try. What were the sources of Sukhani's livelihood? After all, he didn't work. He didn't make money to so to live. It's an absolutely proper question, it seems to me. And I think it is answered most beautifully in Xenophon's Economicus, which deals with economics, with Sukhani and uh, with global economics, that is. And therefore, since Sukhani is a teacher of economics, we have, of course, to apply the question to him. And I think the answer is the question, a, a, a brief discussion at the beginning, where they say what is money, what is property, and by virtue of a very uh, sophisticated definition of property, they arrive at the conclusion that friends may be money. And also there is money here, as we see. Now, being this young man and wealthy, they were, of course, insolent. Yeah, that uh, is a common experience. Yeah? I mean, that's good. with good breathing externally, but still, yeah. And they, of course, made so much the more hated because they thought it was very great fun to uh, go to a pompous ass and uh, with all decorations and uh, uh, dignities and then to show him up. Yeah, but. That it redounded to the Sukhani's unpopularity. You remember the previous statement about the, the older comrade of Sukhani's, Chalifon, who was a friend of the multitude, and that's a different generation. The consequence of this story that Sukhani was accompanied by these young and wealthy men, who uh, is that he corrupted the young, because these dignitaries naturally didn't think that this was the right thing to do, but it was a collapse. And now, in this connection, the economy against Socrates is reformulated in 23, 5 to 7. Yes, these unmasked men say then that what people say, because they can't possibly say he has found me out. So they must calumniate Socrates, and they, they say about him what they say uh, what is generally said about all philosophers, namely the things are loft and those under the earth, and not believing the gods, and making the weaker speech stronger. You see that the not believing the gods is now in the center because we call that we will see that this is a crucial issue later. And then he speaks of the three accusers by name, Melitus, Anitus, and Lico. Melitus spoke for the poets. Uh, was only on behalf of the poets. Anitus was only on behalf of the craftsmen and politicians, and Lycon on behalf of the orators. Of the orators. Uh, so the orators are now added, as you see, and the artisans and politicians uh, are represented by one, and the politicians are represented by one same man, namely. Both artisans and politicians have to do with the demos. Either they belong to the demos, as artisans proper, or they work in the demos, on, on the demos, the politician. Anitos is in the middle, he seems to have been the most important of the three, as is shown also by the dialogue Mino. Now then, Sugaris so turns to the defense against the present accusers. Then he quotes the uh, Charge, the formal charge. Do you have that in 24b? No, let us take the, the charge. Yeah. This charge made that. Do you have that? I shall now try to defend myself against Milagas, high principled and patriotic as he claims to be, and after that against the rest. Let us first consider their deposition again, as though it represented a fresh, a fresh prosecution. It runs something like this. You so, see something like this, yeah? Socrates is guilty of corrupting the minds of the young and of believing in deities of his own invention in 
instead of the gods recognized by the state. Literally, not believe in the gods which the city recognizes, not believes, but other strange de demonic things. Yes. Such is the charge. Let us examine. Yes, such, not this. You see, Plato makes it clear by so references before and after that the charge is not quoted literally. Let's examine the charge uh, 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 by a fortunate accident. The literal version of the charge has been preserved in Diogenes the Thirtieth. Xenophon too does not quote the charge literally, but Xenophon makes very minor, almost invisible things. Plato makes very big changes. In the true charge, the charge of impiety comes first before the charge of corruption. And secondly, Plato admits, uh, um, omits one word, namely, in the charge is not believing the gods which is silly believes, but introducing other new divinities. This introducing is, is uh, a proper uh, by Plato. Good, whatever that may mean. Now we come to the corruption charge. Uh, he, uh, he, in which he takes up in the first place. So there is corruption. He makes the young worse. That makes sense only if there are people who make the young better. What makes the young better, asks Socrates? Answer first, the answer of Meditus, 24 DN. The law. So this does not question that. But what does the other do that? The question about the laws. But this is not what I asked my best. But which human being who in the first place knows this very thing, namely the laws? Yeah. Why does why is the answer the laws not sufficient? So this does not question the proposition that the laws make men better makes the young better. What does this mean, this transition? Why does he appeal from the laws to human beings, or even a single human being? Yes. The laws are conventional, they mean, but people... Yeah, well, that is very good, but that is not said here. And that we must begin from what he explicitly says. He doesn't speak of the making of the laws, but of the knowing of the laws. Now, what he suggests is the laws become effective on the young, only by human, be human beings who act in accordance with the laws, and therefore who know these laws. Yeah. The question of the laws as an authority goes through the work, as we shall see later, but it is not the theme, it becomes a theme in the Crito, where we will read we, we, we afterwards. Yeah, who are then the human beings who make the young better? And Meditus gives an answer which is uh, in accordance with, with democracy as then understood. Everyone who judges the, the, the jurymen, the men in the assembly, and so on and so on, the men in the council, all Athenian citizens are good educated. Let us consider that for a moment. To accuse someone of corrupting of making certain things worse means that I know what is good. Otherwise, the charge makes no sense. Meritus claims, as a matter of course, that he knows what is good. And he implies that it is easy to know it. Everyone knows it. All the seniors know it. Perhaps he means even all men know it. If, now, how could all men know what is good? Lies the rejection of this. There is no naturally available knowledge of good. It may be acquired. But it's not by nature available. There is by nature available something like a divination of the good. That's purely what Plato means. As his divination is not knowledge, and therefore you can in no way rely on it. 
so that is, you remember Sura's previous assertion about his wisdom, which implied that he does not know what is a good. He is ignorant regarding the Christ said. But he also doubts whether, the, whether what the Athenians believe to be good is good, because he knows that Athenians do not know. He doubts whether the Athenians know what is a good. And he spreads this doubt by making it clear to everyone that it was not. That is corruption. To that extent, Socrates proves the charge of corruption from the Athenian point of view. The question is whether it's not a higher point of view. But the question is also whether this higher point of view can be brought out in a popular speech except by reference to the Apollo. Now, what is Sugata's main argument against the assertion all Athenians know what is good? A typically Socratic axiom which goes through all uh, these, uh, these kind of discussions. In all fields of knowledge, there are only a few who know. Experts are rare in every field. And, but knowledge is expert knowledge. Hence, expert knowledge regarding good and bad is oh, the only genuine knowledge is also rare. Now, you see that this is confirmed by another feature which we have observed, which you may very well call ironical, but which, as we have seen before, the ironical things have to be taken as seriously as non ironical since in all fields there are only a few who know, Socrates, with perfect consistency, sends people to the professional educators, to the sophists. On this basis, inevitable. Still, whatever this uh, knowledge may be, which, which God has and such people possess, Socrates does not possess that knowledge of the good. So let us keep this in mind. We do not know Socrates' wisdom. Knowledge of his ignorance includes, as such, ignorance of the good. How can he live? I repeat that. Let's keep this question all in mind. Now let us turn, we cannot possibly read the whole, to 25C5, and when he says to Meditus, now tell us, by Zeus, Meditus, whether it is better to live among good citizens or wicked citizens. Do you have that? Here is another point. Tell me seriously, Melodus, is it better to live in a good or in a bad community? Okay. Answer my question like a good fellow. There is nothing difficult about it. Is it not true that wicked people have a bad effect upon those with whom they are in the closest contact and that good people have a good effect? Quite true. Is there anyone who prefers to be harmed rather than benefited by his associates? Answer me, my good man. The law commands you to answer. Is there anyone who prefers to be harmed? Of course not. Well then, when you summon me before this court for corrupting the young and making their characters worse, do you mean that I do so intentionally or unintentionally? I mean intentionally. Why, Melodus, are you at your age so much wiser than I at mine? You have discovered that bad people always have a bad effect, and good people a good effect upon their nearest neighbors. Am I so hopelessly ignorant as not even to realize that by spoiling the character of one of my companions, I shall run the risk of getting some harm from him? Because nothing else would make me commit this grave offense intentionally. No, I do not believe it, Melodus, and I do not suppose that anyone else does. Either I have not a bad influence, or it is unintentional. So that in either case, your accusation, your accusation is false. And if I unintentionally have a bad influence, the correct procedure in cases of such involuntary misdemeanors is not to summon the culprit before this court, but to take him aside privately for instruction and reproof. Because obviously, if my eyes are open, I shall not, I shall stop doing what I do not intend to do. You know, let stop here. What Zubaris says here is this: the charge is groundless. Groundless. Why? Because no one corrupts willingly. 
for no one wishes to be harmed. Everyone wishes to be benefited, but the good benefit and the bad harm. No one wishes to make others bad. No one wishes to corrupt others. So if Sugares corrupts others, he does it unintentionally. Sugares goes beyond that. If anyone corrupts anyone, he does it unintentionally. What's the consequence? Yeah. Well, the, the war then uh, would be uh, meaningless. Absolutely, absolutely. Punishment is, is unjustified. Because as we, we can easily enlarge that and prove it from other dialogues, the thesis of Sugaris was all sinning is involuntary. And involuntary sinning is not punishable. This thesis by itself leads to the denial of the legitimacy of punishment. Punishment is an irrational act of revenge, not more. Which is of course a terrific assertion if you are accused of undermining the police you say such an immensely valuable institution as gallows and penitentiaries are irrational institutions, well, you, you destroy the city as far as you know. He, he's really very, very extreme. You see, Sugaris is in one way very uh, um, reticent and very polite and doesn't uh, say uh, things which are hard on the ear. But what he in fact says is, is very harsh, you know, if you have fears for that. No, yeah, but, but that is not, that is the consequence. The consequence is, uh, you are perfectly right, uh, no one can punish anyone rationally. But that is another thing, not only the consequence is uh, remarkable, it's the premise. What is the premise? No one wishes to be harmed. Everyone wishes to be benefited. That presupposes what? Presupposes that people are able to tell what to harm and what to benefit. Yes, very good. Now say it more gently. Because the implication of benefit and harm is more simple. Everyone knows what good and bad is. Yeah? Everyone. Yeah, everyone knows what is good, but this was denied. Now, if we do not know what good and bad is, we cannot teach others, we cannot improve others. Not only is punishment irrational, instruction is irrational, at least in this way. It's fantastic. But we must really see where we find some ground. We must see first, look in that abyss. The conclusion which Sugar destroys, since no one can punish and no one can instruct in matters of good and bad, and therefore there can also not be corruption in particular. The corruption charge is groundless. Groundless. You see, Sugar doesn't argue the matter out on common sense grounds here. That's a fantastic thing. In such a speech, where only common sense would be in order. I mean, everyone knew what corruption, and knows today what corruption means in a practical way. I mean, you can even, uh, if you take Xenophon, who is much more pedestrian than, you think, than Plato, uh, for example, one thing, corrupting the young boys could mean a certain uh, sexual misconduct. And Xenophon uh, even goes a bit out of his way to show that Sugares was a perfectly decent man in that respect. But it could also mean, for example, uh, other things to make them bad uh, Democrats. That was also discussed, for example, you know, by his, by his relations to Alcibiades and Christians. So that is uh, had a politically corrupting influence. So this doesn't speak of that here at all. He says the corruption charge is groundless, but the grounds of this demonstration are absolutely fantastic. So uh, they imply the line of the police end of knowledge in any significant sense. So, now we come to the impiety charge. Let us read the beginning of it. Yes, now a man of Athens, this is uh, then clear, manifest. Well, yeah, what I have said, that many of us 
has not taken care, has not been concerned in these matters, either a little much or a little, I even not at all. It is a constant joke on, uh, on the name, Melitos, that um, reads like a Greek word for caring, that carer hasn't cared for education, that goes through the whole Now, nevertheless, tell us, how do you say that I corrupt the young ones? You see, so now we come back to common sense, to a specific charge of corruption, yes? Show the terms of your indictment and make it clear that you accuse me of teaching them to believe in new deities instead of the gods recognized by the state. Is not that the teaching of mine which you have, which you say has this demoralizing effect? Oh, that's extremely bad. Is this is the opinion? Yeah. I, my, I retract my praise. Right. Uh, is it not with you? Is it not by teaching this that I corrupt? The word corrupt must be perfectly clear. In other words, what he does now that is very important, he reduces the corruption charge to the impiety charge. The real thing is not the corruption charge. The, re the real thing is the charge of impiety. And that is a, a point which must be stressed because Burnett especially did everything he could to minimize impiety charge. The question does no longer concern knowledge. That is important. But, yes, it's the Greek word which so hard to translate. No mid signs. And so it is taught not no mid signs because sit. Now, no mid signs, that, that comes from the word no. No. But it has in itself roughly these two relevant meanings. Not to worship the God and not to believe the God. That is indistinguishable when you have this such a theory. It becomes distinguishable. If it is said that someone does not know mid sign that the gods are, then you must translate it. Does not believe. You know, because you cannot say he does not worship that the gods are. It has this essential view. But now the emphasis, as I say, is not knowledge. It's worship and or belief. Now, with the uh, Sugaris, um, Okay, now, uh, what, how do you call this? What do you do? No, I never know this. Uh, uh, to irritate uh, the fellow so that he makes a statement which is then, by which he is licked, by making it which he is licked. How do you do it? Provoke. Provoke. Yeah. Now, so what is best? Do you mean to say that I do not believe in the gods of the city, but in some other gods, you know, which would be my, after all mine, that the Belgian says, no, in no gods were all, you are straight atheists. So, now let us, uh, after this point, let us go on. But you, you, you strange or marvelous meditators. Yeah? Go on. He certainly does. Um, By Zeus, he says, uh, you, uh, gentlemen of the jury. Because he says that the sun is a stone and the moon is earth or earthy. Yeah? What is that? That we must consider. The solace has a kind of a retreat. Of course, it's not retreat. He says, now, rather for a moment that I don't believe in Zeus and Hera, I would at least believe in sun and moon, in stars, in what we call the cosmic rock. You remember, some of you may remember our discussion about the banquet, that they played such a role. Yeah. The cosmic gods, gods which natural reason perceives to be gods, self moving and resplendent beings, which everyone can see, gods, mystical gods, mystical gods, mystical gods, the gods which all human beings believe in. Yeah. So, when it, you know, how does someone answer to that? Or, or how does... No, Meritus says, no. He says, they are no gods. They are just inanimate things. Stones and earth. And how does it like that? Sir? Yeah. Do you imagine you are prosecuting Anaxagoras, my dear Melodus? Have you so poor an opinion of these gentlemen, and do you assume them to be so literate as not to know that the writings of Anaxagoras are full of theories like these? And do you seriously suggest 
that it is from me that the young get these ideas when they can buy them on occasion in the marketplace for a shilling at most, and so have to laugh on Socrates. <laughs> He can't translate it. He them to his own to say nothing of their being so silly. Tell me honestly, Melodus, is that your opinion of me? Do I believe in no God? No, not at all. Not in the slightest degree. They both swear, by the way. So there swears in his question addressed to Melodus and Melodus and by Zeus each one. Now, not even the cosmic gods, so let's believe which all men believe in. So let us does not prove that much has become clear. That he believes in the gods which the city believes. Yeah. Because it had been uh, pulled out, granted or not granted, but that had, it, it, the question is now only the cosmic gods. And what does he say regarding the cosmic gods? Well, he uses at least an argument. Yeah. And the argument is, I am not an Anaxagoras. And Anaxagoras is a fellow who is an atheist, but not I. Yeah. No, no, that's all. So, uh, um, uh, in other words, that Socrates believes in the cosmic gods is a bit more plausible, just be, just be cautious, and then that he believes in the Olympian gods. Yeah. And then, well, I cannot repeat an argument which I developed at some length when we discussed the banquet last time. Anaxagoras was an atheist. By stating his view in writings, as we see, Anaxagoras was corrupting the young, or at least trying to corrupt the young. Yeah, but in the, now we know what corruption is, don't we? What does corruption mean now? Impiety. Impiety, yeah. Yeah, but impiety, not believing. And that comes from nomos. The standard is the nomos. No one knows whether the gods are. And in particular, whether sun and moon are not just stones and other inanimate things. The nomos, perhaps a kind of universal nomos, says so. We must first conclude the discussion of uh, this argument before we turn to a general discussion, we still have time. Now, how does the argument go on from here? So let's argue the last story. That is, you have never heard me say that, uh, or write, that uh, the sun and moon are inanimate things. What, with what right can you accuse me of such a thing? That we all lack to stand on. And now Socrates turns the table and says, I can prove to you now that I do believe in the gods of the city from your own charge. How is that? Socrates imports, or I don't know, here, believes in other new demonic things. That it was admitted by the accuser, and so here. And that is a simple piece of forensic rhetoric. He who believes in horse things believes that there are horses. He who believes in elephantic things believes that there are elephants. And therefore, he who believes in demonic things believes that they are demons. Yeah. There can't be demonic things if they are demons. Now, what are demons? Demons are either gods or children of gods. In either way, he, a man who believes in demons believes in God. But which are the gods who are generated especially by the inner cause of human beings and gods, and are more particularly called demons in contradistinction to gods. Which are these gods? Sun and moon? No. The Olympic gods. That's it. And Zoris uses the rather blasphemous example of moons. He who admits moons, half asses, as they are called here, admits that there are horses and asses. 
Therefore, someone who believes in beings mixed, created by the mixture of gods and men, believes that they are gods. That's it. You know, that argument doesn't prove anything. It only proves that the Sugaris was a much better rhetorician than the man was who formulated the charge. The, the charge of impiety is not refuted in any way. Yeah? It's not refuted in any way. The only uh, part of the argument which has an element of the proof is that regarding the cosmic gods. Because this is something in which we human beings, meaning all human beings with the exception of some freaks like uh, Anaxagoras, believe it. And uh, so that would then also be cannot go beyond that. Now what is so this is a defense. I mean, the, the other things uh, are a defense of Sugaris's way of life, you know, and a justification. But they are not a defense against the church. That's the refutation of the church. But that is the least important thing of the apology, although it is not uh, by no means negligible. Sugaris's whole presentation is, ba- is, is the whole presentation, uh, which is uh, uh, underlying also the explicit reputations of the charge, is that his wisdom consists in ignorance, in knowledge of the ignorance. By the way, you see how important this issue of the cosmic gods is. How, I mean, after all, it's the greatest charge is to be in this. It is a less great charge not to believe in God. Safe, obvious. Yeah. Now, how? So, the greatest charge is that he would need to deny that even Sun and Moon are gods. How could a man arrive at this, at this conclusion that the Sun is merely a stone? How could he arrive at this conclusion? What would he have to do? Astronomy. What Suez was accused of of doing, you know, walking on the air and uh, look around and down on the sun. That was what he was said to have done in the clouds. So the, uh, the astronomy issue is of course important. Suez knows then nothing of the greatest things neither of the gods nor of the good. How then can he live? That's the question. How can he live? If he is, because you, it is easy to say, it's to show that every knowledge which he does possess, for example, the reason Athenian citizen and uh, married to San Tipi and what have you, that this does not permit him to live. How should he conduct himself as an Athenian citizen and as a husband of some Tibet or other things, the guiding questions, the crude questions he cannot answer. How can he live as far as we see up to now? What is his wisdom? You know that by now. In what does his wisdom consist? According to his own declaration, Miss Hill? In knowing what and what he doesn't know. In, yeah, in, in knowledge of his ignorance regarding the greatest things. Yeah, but, all right, what does it lead to, the knowledge of his ignorance? What follows if, I, if he knows that he is ignorant? Pardon? Huh? Yeah, but let us assume, yeah, but let us assume that this is impossible for some reason or other. That appears to be the, the way we, that appears to be the way in which the issue is, is stated here. Well great caution. Yeah. Not to ascend. Not to ascend. Not to ascend to what he does not know. Not to know its Yeah? Not to believe. Not to believe. Because he does not know. But examine again and again, see whether one cannot perhaps know and yet probably be met back to the same result. But there is an alternative. Let me finish the question. There is an alternative. The first is not knowing science. And the other is 
the only alternative to not know it. No means that. And many, many acceptance and knowers live by the non That is, of course, partly also, you know, the, therefore the origin and so on. That is not the last word that we are speaking of only of what has appeared up to now. You want to say something? No, I'm not sure I follow you, but to know and to believe, they are not the same thing. No. No, I mean, uh, yeah, what, uh, all right, what is the difference as it has come to light here? That's a very long question. But because this word, I mean, belief has here this rather innocent use. You know, when you say, for example, someone says, uh, is, uh, X is in a hospital. Yeah. I don't believe he is. Yeah. I have seen him around this morning. You know, that uh, there is not a, a, a solemn meaning. But believing surely means here uh, to ascend to something of which one does not know that it is true. Yeah. Knowledge is here used uh, rather, I mean, not in any technical sense. And so the technical sense is not excluded. Uh, so it's, uh, to repeat, so it does of course not say, I know that I know nothing, literally understood because he knows that he's accused, among other things. But he, he says he does, he's ignorant regarding the most important things, and these most important things are obviously the gods and the good, whatever the relation between the gods and the good may be. Now, did I answer your question? Yes. No, uh, what? does not know would imply that he knows what it would be like to know something. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't understand how, how this, this, this seemingly two statements reconcile with one another. Yeah, but is it not uh, um, your earlier? Yeah. That one would really have to go beyond what you said, but that is the first thing that you say. In order to say that I know that I do not know, I have to know one body. Yeah, well, that is true, but is this not also possible to have a common sense knowledge of knowledge? as distinguished from a fully developed I mean this. Uh, for example, uh, in the people they disagree as regards to some uh, consensible matter. And the other says, no, it is so. I mean, it's seen it. I mean, we don't go into a very subtle question how such knowledge is possible through sense perception. So, but we all understand whether it makes sense. All right. And we also know that there is a kind of legitimate inference in theory and reasoning. And without having a developed doctrine of the syllogism, uh, we can see if someone contradicts himself, you know. So we can also see that someone makes assertions and that they are formally content. Like Menetros here, who says, so it is not believe in gods, but believes in demons. Yeah? One can do that. That doesn't require a very long theology of the You know? But I would go on to do that for the rest of your question and say, if I say I do not know the most important thing, I know what's the most important thing. So, yeah, that is all you have to the, two, the most important things appear to be the gods of the world. Now, can one not Prove that things are not possible. I mean, on the basis of, of our everyday knowledge, which no sensible man would ever, would, would ever question, and which uh, uh, cannot prove that. I mean, that is of the utmost importance for human, for man as a whole, for human life as a whole, whether they are or they are not gods. But, uh, but uh, 
the effect that they're being drugs has on men. What do you, what you take? I mean, the formal medicine is safe, most important, and it's specified in the state. Uh, it's the way it's said, no one is most important for men. And surely, let's forget about the laws. It's a very complicated case because they do it. If you do not know what the good is, you cannot act that. I mean, you don't know what to choose. I mean, whether you should not rather, uh, whether one should not rather commit suicide or, or do what this principle did, shooting, you know, and this kind of thing, and, and accepting the consequences of the trauma. If we really are ignorant, I mean, it is uh, this is uh, this is uh, this kind of knowledge is not going to be uh, confined to to one man only. If I say that it says that manager says all of these. Now, so that it looks it out and asks some of the Indians, say, a reason and a normal citizen. And how do you know that ultimately he can care of something? This is how our fathers live. Yeah. And then so does the entire say. Yeah. Uh, your fathers also said certain things about uh, the distance from Athens to Sparta, so let me explain. And we know now that the distance is given. That, so the tradition don't cancel it. All right. And what about uh, the Dawn? How does he know? How does he know? And it need to, to be uh, uh, something like tradition of the fathers. And that's not sufficient. I mean, how the, is it, I mean, I thought this was... Well, the gods in the words of the people is something that is otherwise unthinkable or un... That would be more great. That would be more great to say <coughs> the answer of all is true can be, uh, the great words can be given only by the gods. And therefore there must be gods. Yeah, but still, that we can be accepted. How do we know that there are gods? Now, if the gods are questionable, <laughs> Uh, then it's a good looking question on that, good looking question on that, you know, too. So we don't know. How can someone say? It? And the, up to this point, we cannot say more than there is this alternative <laughs> of either obeying the laws, because uh, not obeying the laws, who claims to know, and who is surely more respected than any chance you may be. Surely. Yes, but uh, at least it makes some popular sense. And then the alternative is the alternative is not to act. And that is what Socrates is going to say immediately after. I did not act. I mean, he says first, I did not act politically. But then he enlarges it. He did not act. But obviously, that cannot be literally true, but it's not reality. And he went to the war, and then to the jury, and so on, to the lover. So that cannot be quite literally true. Yeah. But that we, must, we must face that, because this is a question where, I mean, uh, we see from this, uh, at this point that Zubaris knew that difficulty, which is now calling us in the social sciences. Only it is not, it is much broader, and it is not set in terms of value judgments in particular. But that is implied. Yeah. What was the way which he found out? And somehow it seems, at, up to this point, that it was precisely the reflection on his ignorance, and it's not knowing which let him out of the difficulty. Whether that can be become fully clear from the apology, we must see, but surely that must be become clearer than it is now from the rest of the, the rest of the world. Did I answer your question? Well, I think that I think that I mean at least to that extent that I pointed to the way which we have to say. Yeah, so the question, no, the, uh, the question will be uh, will it, is stated in this work with a very, very radical 
punishment. It is suggested that punishment, if it is to be rational, would of course presuppose knowledge of good. Yeah. And instruction also is distinguished from knowledge. Do you remember the distinction in the Aristotelian is making people bring it by words and by whippings. That is the same distinction. Both are impossible. Yeah, but it goes beyond that. Look at the punitive systems. It is generally assumed, at least as far as the generalists would say, the amount of punishments which men inflict upon one another, capital punishment is a verse. I mean, I do not wish to go down to the niceties of a gradation among capital punishment, you know, drawing, quartering, hanging, and But let us look at the general statement that capital punishment is generally regarded as much worse than a fine, and not a fine or something else, or even imprisonment, and so on. What is it being taught? Knowledge that life is of much higher value than freedom to circulate and a money possession. Yeah. You presuppose that life is valuable. Uh, on reflection, you would perhaps say it is not necessarily the highest uh, value, but it is surely a uh, very high value. And you know what we do? Tremendous medical establishments uh, are approved of how uh, high the value no. Towards the end of this book, it is suggested that death, being dead, being asleep without dreams, is perhaps better than almost everything which we esteem. But no, everything breaks up. Because if you say, for example, well, life is not the highest thing, but virtue. All right, that virtue is the means of virtue of a living human being. Or if you take Socrates' um, special assertion, the philosophic life, the life of examination, is the best. Yeah. I think that becomes the question. Is not, by this question, is not death a dreamless sleep, which is then indistinguishable, of course, from simple, non-being, one night, meaning life, what we call life, one long night uh, is better than the day. That is better. If that were complex question, everything is true. Everything is based on confession. And yet, so that is, as a paradoxical fact is, that so is, in spite of it, is dedicated, as essentially in its own life, to the, what he regards as the one thing needed. And uh, somehow, on the basis of knowledge, that's his human wisdom. And we must try what we think, what we think. Mr. Gill, uh, in Socrates rests content with a common sense understanding of what knowledge is, any more than with a common sense understanding of what good and evil is in the last philosophy. I, I, mean, I don't see the steps. You said a tentative answer to this, a tentative answer to the Soren's question, that there was a common sense understanding of knowledge of ignorance, yeah. which he is not. But there is also a common sense of understanding of good and bad. Now, let me put it this way. I would draw this conclusion one um, from what you say. Would one not have to go beyond that, what I said? That Socrates has... No, no. Uh, Socrates has knowledge of it. I mean, there is really, uh, you see, that is not mere common sense knowledge. 
For example, when, let us take the simple case of Oxford's refutation of Meletus. Yeah? And let us take it as a, the, the statement of Meletus, the charge of Meletus, as it stands. That this is self-contradictory and therefore absurd is knowledge. And no other knowledge which you acquire by studying, say, formal logic and so on, could improve that knowledge as regarding the self-contradictory character of Meletus' statement. And therefore, it is more than common sense knowledge. The alternative would be this, that to say that Sugaris does not know that he does not know, but that he only opines that he does not know. That was a, a line taken by a certain skeptical school in Greece later on. Yeah. And Sugaris contradicted himself by claiming to know his ignorance. Sugaris did not contradict himself. And, and uh, at any rate, that is exactly the difference between Sugaris and skepticism, because as you observe that whenever the mere, the fact that some knowledge is possible, as admitted by Socrates, that alone can be the cure for his problem. Yes. So, and one, of course the question would be, even to establish that, what uh, are those people who say we do not have any knowledge, the real skeptic, yeah. Uh, is this not a terrible position? And I think that is implied in the work of Plato, not developed in this one, but implied throughout, that skepticism proper is impossible. And one only needs to look at the simple fact that all skepticism uses arguments to show that we do not know. And these arguments all imply knowledge, They're very simple. They prove one uh, old stock topic of skepticism is the unreliability of the senses. Yeah? They give specimens of that. And they never uh, speak of the errors of our ears regarding sounds and of our eyes regarding colors. Uh, I'm sorry, of, of our eyes regarding sounds and of our ears regarding colors, they know that the hearing has its object sounds and sight has its object colors and so on. All skepticism thrives on physical knowledge. Whether this is knowledge in the highest sense, that is an other man. I mean, that is a long way, but that it cannot be uh, uh, it, it cannot be, uh, without it, no, no possible uh, argument, and hence no possible human position of any kind is that. But the question concerns, uh, and what so of, uh, implies naturally, and we must see later on whether we can bring this out, is that this knowledge, which no one uh, can reject, it does not necessarily give us an indication as to what is good and bad. And that is, of course, what he said. Yeah, ultimately, the Socratic argument will have to be a recourse to the nature of man. That is, that is but uh, we must see whether, to what extent, this is a clear. The references to it are uh, there from the very beginning. When he uses these homely similes, if you had acquired coals or cars, and now you have acquired sons, yeah? <coughs> Sons are not cars. Uh, men are not roots. That gives us a key. What is good, we mean primarily what's good for man. And what man is and what, uh, what is characteristic of man, it, it gives us, is ultimately the basis for the answer of what is good. Yeah, I think we will first turn to the next time. We have, we'll have a report. By Mr. Strickland, this one. I, I always miss you <coughs> because your names begin both with an ST. Yeah, Mr. Sunny and Mr. Johnson, uh, you will have that, yeah. And a week later, uh, Mr. Berger will be back on the title. Oh, you get it, I know. Well, then uh, Rabbi Weiss or Mr. White.
One of you will read it, and the other will have it. That will give you a week from now. Uh, it doesn't mean that it solves all questions, naturally, as you would expect. Now, let me see. You said that this section, prior to the condemnation, is real apology. And I think that is true, that it's really the central part of the apology. You rightly noted the provocative character, so that we uh, really spoke of insolence. And that is also a remarkable. I further, further noted that you made clear an important implication is that it is not only Socrates and the Athenian citizens, but the law itself, which is ignorant. The law, the nomos itself, is ignorant. In other words, there is no, uh, that is of crucial point. The other point you made is that, the, that there is the difference between the Delphic Oracle and so that it is private voice, as it is called here, the Bimonia. But you did not go into the question of their relation. Yes, I also did not go into because I did not fully understand the relationship. Although it seems to me that the Daimonia is somehow also related to what Socrates initially began with in the marketplace as opinions of the people, is somehow an opinion. And yeah, that is, of course, a question whether the daimonion has anything to do with Sogata's activity as described in his apology. Well, I'm not that it had necessarily had any connection with the activity, but that it is a, somehow of the same nature as opinions. It, yeah. It's not, it's not the opinion. Yeah, that, uh, that is, but before we turn to that, I think one point is very crucial. Sogata starts not trains. His activity, his talking to the fellow citizens, he does not trace that to his daimonia. He trace only his uh, withdrawal from political life proper, etc. Then you make a very important, interesting and important point that the Delphic Oracle is not knowledge. Yeah, it's just handed down. And Socrates finds out indeed by his examination that it is knowledge, but whether that is what the oracle had said, that's a moot question. Yes. And now, and that the daimonion as such is not knowledge, you rightly stress. You also, also what you said towards the end, said the apology of Socrates is a bridge between Socrates and the demons. That is, I think, perfectly correct, because the apology is the only utterance of Socrates, or Plato Socrates, addressed to the citizen body. All other utterances are addressed to individuals, one or more. One thing I did not understand, because you read rather fast, you know, and that is how the Delphic Oracle was turned by Socrates into a command. You spoke of that more than once, and that apparently was a crucial part of your argument. That I did not understand. My understanding, by, by the act of questioning itself, that is raising the question, what is wisdom? Socrates, in reflecting on this, saw that the life of wisdom is the proper life of man. He's reflecting upon man's nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, but how does it work out? The, the article says no one is wiser than Socrates. Well, this and is that's a mere assertion, this is only an incredible assertion in a way for Socrates. And then, because it is incredible, and Socrates uh, is, as a pious man, he says a god can't lie, and uh, tries to find out whether the god uh, did not lie in this particular case. And so he examined it. But you could say, by restoring his sh momentarily shaken faith 
in the veracity of the Jesuit God, he fulfilled a religious duty that one could say. Yeah, but the Pythia, the priestess, is not one, but Apollo might be one. And there is a certain pipeline between Apollo and the Pythia. You know? Uh, see, see this, that, that really Sakis do was to have nothing to do with the God at all. Yeah, but, all right, but, and uh, this but, but sure. you cannot, I mean, I also don't believe that Sugar is believed in the Delphian Oracle in any way. But still, that is in itself a mere guess. I mean, that uh, needs a long argument. You cannot neglect that, however, you know, because that is said. Uh, but uh, how would you say then, yeah, but then, if you didn't believe in the wisdom of the oracle in the first place, then you would have to restate the situation in entirely different terms. I have nothing against that, but would you, you did not do that. Then you cannot say he turned the oracle into something else. You have to give an entirely uh, a presentation of Soviet activity in terms, in a sentence, of, say, in which the term oracle wouldn't occur. All right, do that. Well, I don't think that. I can do that because I don't think that's the case. I, I am not sure at all whether Socrates initially believed in the Delta Corp or any way at all. So this is not. I have nothing. I think it's a very sensible. Uh, supposing that he did believe in the Delta Corp initially. Then, what then I said for? To, then to, uh, order to examine the Delta Corp, to discover what was meant. But in this examination, he, he moves to a different level. He finds that the Delta Corp really is not. It's all right. Seven, yeah, but, but then, uh, what, all right, what, what, let's forget about the episode. Uh, what is then the motivation of surveillance activity? What is according the, to the nature of man to do this, this activity? The question of the action. Yeah, but can we have any basis in the text for the same? This, the passage that I quoted, I think is the, the to me at least the clearest that he says, that he must look to himself first, or to the state before the interest. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but what is the reason given for being concerned first with oneself, and then with the things which one has, possessions, and so on? So one that somehow has to understand the nature of man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. So that is, you see, I, in a way, you are on the right track, of course. But that is not the argument of Kant. Why what is the reason explicitly given? Why one should be concerned more with oneself and with oneself evil than with one's thing? Well, the good of the state, I suppose, in the way that it is. It's right. It's a case of the state which is the same thing as the case of the so that uh, why should you be more concerned with the soul of the state than with the things of the state? It's the same as the case the world. What's the reason here? Because anyone of you read it, that's very important. Why is it more important to take care of the soul than of your possessions? It's an explicit reason here. You see, I, I'm sure that there is a problem with the Delphic Oracle. But then, uh, if you suggest an alternative, that alternative must have a support in the text and not an intelligent guess. Hmm? I mean, you understand my criticism. It's not mentioned in any harsh way. Now, what, why should I... There's no see. What is the reason why it is more important to be concerned with the soul than with possessions and honor for that? What's the explicit reason given? Mr. Jones. Uh, it says that from virtue come the possessions. Uh-huh. And not from possession comes virtue. Good, but what does this mean? Except so that's the passage of the sermon. Uh, on one point, I think it means that uh, any time you get any possession on one level, it presupposes civic life. And unless you have some virtue in the city, you can't have any virtue. No, no, let's forget about the city. Let's speak of the city. And then, 
on the second part on the individual is a proper harmony that Jumao is so sophisticated. <laughs> so what is, the apology is the opposite of sophistication. It's very simple. What he says is something about. I mean, this is a huge question. What does he say? He talks to someone who is very much concerned with his estate, with his business, whatever, but doesn't care for his soul. And someone just tells him, but you have to take care of your soul first. Something extremely simple. The soul is a possession which continues with him. No, but it's a final state in practical terms. I mean, the soul is immortal. Yeah, but that is something much more simple than common therapy at best. There are sometimes people who say, I wish I had one. I wish I mean, you say, okay, there's a day, nothing, but there's only $100,000. Yeah? Well, the state of your soul determines what you will do with your possessions, whether or not you will do good with your possessions. Yeah, but very practical. On the lowest level, well, what is an example of, like, if you have, have if you work all the time, I mean, the same carrying over to Aristotle and the question of, of the person who is involved, involved in business activities all the time, where he can get all these possessions and they are no use to him because he puts all his effort into obtaining the possessions. Yeah, this is the same regard in Oxford's course, you know, and that's not very similar. He has always returned in two years at the latest. You will not have a single cent left because for the you will have dissipated it. So you must first acquire the habit of frugality, thrift, which is the quality of the soul. Or the other way around, also for acquiring the money. Work hard. Yeah. Be industrious, the quality of the soul. So qualities of the soul, virtue. Acquire possessions. And the possessions do not really make you acquire the virtues. You think of what you pay for. Where possessions and the use of what you pay for. That is it. Yes, it's a wonderful practical happening. But what is the effect? What is the reason for given for preferring virtue to possessions? Possessions. So virtue is purely instrumental. And this purely instrumental virtue is not the virtue which so has many minds, the virtue of other persons. And that is, uh, that is a problem. And therefore, um, now, what was your question which led to this reason? Uh, yeah, yeah, the argument of Socrates in favor of virtue, which is wholly independent of the of God, that doesn't exist. Because it is that argument which has a certain plausibility, but which breaks now on reflection. It is utilitarian virtue, and uh, which makes much sense, you know, uh, how is it similar from that? With, uh, about uh, which, honesty is the best quality, oh, yeah? And uh, where the question, yeah, which is a good rule, and it's quite true, but it is also very insufficient, because the question is, is the motivation policy, or is the motivation policy? <laughs> In other words, this is an extremely popular speech, the apology, but also an extremely difficult speech. And the reason is very simple. What someone is, is really doing, he cannot explain, not because it is subversive or, or shocking or similar, but the people wouldn't understand. He must state to them what he is doing in terms intelligible to them. And that's impossible. So it can come out only in a caricature, yeah? in, in, a, in a caricature, which is very funny, naturally, at the same time also very sad, because uh, since they don't understand him, they are practically compelled to condemn him. Yes? Now let's then turn to a coherent discussion. And I would like to introduce it with a general statement, summing up the points we made last time. Now, Sovereign's wisdom, as we have seen, is human wisdom, in contradistinction to the superhuman wisdom of the astronomers and so on, 
and this is of course astronomers, astronomers too is indicated by Anaxagoras so you remember the reference who denied that the sun and the moon objects of astronomy are not gods so well, this is nothing to be this stuff so well, this knows only that he does not know the great things the stars gods the things beneath the earth, which means, of course, also the metaverse, the Hades, and the good. He knows that there are arts, and amongst them the political art. But he does not possess any of the arts. Yet the arts are not sufficient, because they are all based on the assumption that their end, the purpose which they pursue, is good the shoemaker. The Armstrong is based on the premise that protection of the feet is good. And that is linked up with the broader question, protection of the body, protection of life, preservation of life. Yeah. What do, so that's the theme going through the book. What do we know as to whether life is good? So you will never forget the link up with, uh, of Sugar's embarrassment with present-day social science. I mean, not, uh, well, I must uh, plead for forgiveness for this uh, comparison, but for a twofold reason. But the merely negative part of this assertion is, of course, also implied in Sokolis. We do not know. We do not know. Just as I say, uh, we do not know whether uh, social science can't say anything as to whether the atomic destruction of the human race is preferable to its preservation. <clears throat> Only most people happen to prefer the preservation, and we are on, the, on this kind of market research, we build a social science which acts on the premise that the preservation is preferable, not in itself. So the, the arts cannot justify their premise. Therefore, they are ignorant as such regarding the greatest things. But not only Sugaris, but everyone is ignorant regarding the greatest things. How then? Can he live? The first answer would be knowledge of ignorance means not to assent to anything we do not know, i.e. not believing. Now, I use the Greek term to make this quite clear, and it's also the Spanish word, not nomitsa. Which is the derivative from nomos, no. Not acting on the norms. The other is no, that you can't act at all if you don't, if you merely suspend judgment. You have to obey the norms. You can live only by believing in this sense, in the simple sense, by acting on the law. I know it's. But that is not the way in which Socrates justifies his way of life. He traces his way of life, as we have seen, to the order. And from this point of view, his way of life appears as service to the God and even assistance to the God, obviously. He assists to the God by proving to all men that in his case, at any rate, the oracle was true, which enhances the prestige of the Apollo, and that is an assistance to the God. And this activity consists in examining himself and others. And examining means, of course, inducing people to suspend judgment. So what happens is that Socrates induces himself and others not to believe, not to assent, on the basis of an assent to the oracle. That is, uh, that, and the difficulty, I believe, is in this point. But we must hear a distinction, and to which Mr. Steinreich alluded, so that his knowledge of his ignorance is one thing. And that may have needed in the first stages talking to others. But finally, that after a few steps, he had seen that. Why does he go on all the time to try to convince others of their ignorance? Why is so that his knowledge of his ignorance good so that he spreads that good? by convincing others of their ignorance. Why is it better than the alternative, namely 
believing to know what one does not know and going on believing to know what one does not know. Now, why is that better? And let us forget about the Delphic Oracle because there is really a question there, but why is it in itself going? Why is it better? What does a man do who believes to know while he does not know? Take any case, I mean, take a simple case from your own experience where you have seen that someone uh, was cocksure about something else and then he was refuted. What happened? I mean, what's the reaction of him and the bystanders? A mistake. A mistake. Well, yeah, but, uh, what? Pardon? Well, he doesn't, well, uh, he doesn't achieve his goal his goal. Yeah, yeah, but I wish only that you would say it more precisely because we frequently uh, don't uh, reach our goal and uh, that's not fatal to us. Yeah? And so why is this, however, so fatal? Again, the lowest level is the most uh, proper because uh, there we understand directly. Yeah? It's disillusion or despair. Yeah, but why, why should he despair? I mean, uh, why should he despair? And what is the precise reason for this paper? I mean, for example, someone says something about the uh, Vice President Nixon, yes? and then he is refuted about that. He wouldn't despair, necessarily. But what? Yes? Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Because it comes closer to the issue. But you one can, of course, also say a sensible man does not care particularly whether uh, he's critical or not. Yeah, but after all, that's not the highest criteria. But why is it important? I mean, why is it more than mere fear of the ridicule? It is a, special, a very special kind of ridicule. You see, if someone is just, say, plain stupid, that is in perhaps deplorable for him or, or so, or people that know him, but it is not ridiculous in itself. Yeah? I mean, uh, or only a, a very callous individual would say that it's ridiculous in itself. But here that's a special kind of thing. If someone makes an assertion, he lays a claim, claim to knowledge. By, found out, by being found out that he does not know, he is condemned by his own standards. In other words, in this case is a especially important case of boasting. If the stupid man is merely stupid, and does his work, it's not ridiculous. But if he boasts, then he becomes ridiculous because he, ap- he admits, this is a simple stupid man, he doesn't recognize the standard of intelligence, you can say. He says, I'm who I want to am. But the man who claims, lays claim to knowledge, erects a standard without having been, been called to do so. And then, by that standard, he condemns himself. He really contradicts himself in a matter by which he claims to live. Boasting, that is boasting. And boasting in this case means self, you know, boasting means in all cases self-condemnation. Yeah? Clear, self-condemnation. And therefore boasters are particularly ridiculous, ridiculous people. And this self-condemnation is a self-contradiction. That comes a bit closer to the issue. There is something because he says, I know, yeah, I live up to my standard. And he is shown not to live up to his standard. All right, but why is this examining others good? After all, we can say he uh, tries to make them non boasters, or more radically, to, to not contradicting themselves. The first answer we can say, well, a simple law of human beings, fellow human beings. Yeah? I mean, a, a man who is not vicious, wishes to help other people, perhaps not necessarily more than himself, but he, if he can do it, yeah, so to say, without going out of his way, he will not do it, yeah? if he's not vicious. But the explicit reason, the Delphic Oracle, yes, the Delphic Oracle did not tell Socrates to examine others. So we are still not clear. Now I will try to explain it now in a, in a very impressionistic way. And there is nothing wrong, I believe, with impressionistic remarks, no. provided one admits it. 
And provided one knows that it's really a disgraceful state, that one cannot do more than that. Now, when I read the apology, I'm impressed by what I called, uh, 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 impressionistically, it's a low ceiling. We don't go up beyond a very low point. And I've been trying to uh, articulate that a bit. Human wisdom, as defined there, is knowledge of ignorance. But that means, as defined here, knowledge of nothing regarding the greatest thing. A blank. That's with To have that blank in front of you. So igno ignorant people don't have that blank, but they don't know it. But they do know that you have that blank. Blindness. Conscious blindness. The situation described here is not that in the apology of the blind led by the blind, which is a very sad picture, as you know, but the blind who do not know that they are blind, except one among them who knows it. Now, this blind man who knows that he's blind tries to show the others that they are blind too. What's the consequence? I mean, what did they do as long as they did not know that they were blind? I mean it again on the most pedestrian level. Think of that similar in, in practical proposition. They don't know that they are blind. What do they do? Live happily in ignorance. Pardon? Live happily in ignorance. Yet do, do they live happily? I mean, what happens? They are blind and they don't know. What do they do? Act in a way which is not yeah, so abstract. They stumble around. They don't they want to stumble. They, oh, they feel it. <laughs> <laughs> they bump into one another all the time. And into ditches and all kinds of things. Now, when the blind man tells them, you are blind, what's the consequence? You say, see, no, it's not. Well, again, it's the simplest case, I mean, the simplest formula. They will no longer, they will sit still. They will become paralyzed. They will sit still, always sit still. Now, does this suggest anything to you? Men reduced to a state where they sit still. Did you ever hear men's situation described in terms of sitting still? Pan? Can you amplify that level? In the place of symbol of the cave, the Republic, yeah. Men sitting in the cave fettered. They cannot move. Sugaris tries to bring about such a state in which they are not externally fettered, but fettered by their negative wisdom. That's not a thing. Fine. So, it's a good state. But as also, the, it's indicated since men is supposed to leave the cave, is of course, it can't be the end. No suggestion of any leaving the cave in the apology. So let us leave it in the apology, only they should not run around, they should sit still. What happens then? I mean, a point which is also not unimportant for the, for the cave itself, but we let it be, let us not uh, go. What happens? They sit still. They are no falling into ditches anymore, not uh, bumping into one another anymore, but what happens? Mr. Cohen? Yes, it would be You're sure? But that's, that's exactly what, it, what the cave means. You know? they, they, they just talk, they don't fight wars anymore. Exactly. Huh? Somebody has to bring food. Food? Yeah. Exactly. And that is really a practical amount of life. So, they, because we have been thinking, they will starve. Sure. Absolutely. That is the suggestion of the apology. Because what is your objection to this policy of starving? What would you as, as a natural human being say? Pardon? You want to die. You want to do not want to die. Why do you why do you not want to die? On the assumption that life's better than that. Do you know that? No. That is the argument of the apology. The, the refusal to sit still and starve is based on the alleged knowledge that you know gets new. 
<laughs> it is very funny, but it is not, uh, not uh, we must not try uh, to find out what it is. So, uh, death is better than life, perhaps. Socrates chooses death, as we have seen, by his very provocative language. But he does not know that death is better than life. He knows nothing of the best, uh, of the greatest things. He knows only, uh, he doesn't, uh, he also does know the opposite. And furthermore, which is much graver, so he had not always chosen death. He chooses it now. Why? The first answer again is the Delphic Oracle. Ex uh, his activity, which presupposes, of course, that he is alive, is a service to the God. And this justifies his relative clinging to life. It is a duty to live if it is a duty to assist the God. But again, the Delphic Oracle did not tell him to examine others. So that is, is he, and now we come now to, we are now beginning to uh, read or to discuss the assignment of the day. So that is, is endangering his life. This much has become clear by the end of the meritorious discussion which we discussed last time. And here a question arises, right at the beginning of today's assignment, 28b, 3 to 5. Is this not disgraceful? Now that's a very strange thing. Why should it be disgraceful to endanger one's life? I mean, to say it's foolish is one thing, but to say it's disgraceful is another thing. That's a straight objection. It would imply that it is noble to save one's life. Now, no one since the world, the world exists has ever said that if someone saves his life by taking the right kind of pills, for example, he commits a noble action. It's a useful action, but not a noble action. But the emphasis shifts on this question of nobility. Socrates now speaks more emphatically than ever before as a man, ombre, to other ombres. You, you, you know, I can't bring out that in English. As the Greeks have the word anea, uh, which means male human being, yeah? like Latin beer. And so in, in English it cannot be put out, and in, in Spanish you can bring it out. So I speaks as a he-man, we could say, to other he-men who are concerned with nobility and not with mere uh, usefulness. And he has to teach them the very elements of manliness, which is that life is not the highest good. Disgrace is worse than death. He, in other words, he presents himself as being confronted with people who do not know this element of manliness, who think it is disgraceful not to save one's life. And then he must tell them the first element, which everyone knows from Homer at least, that uh, it, life is not the highest good, disgrace is worse than death. Now, then in the sequel, that's in 28b to c, he gives a Homeric example. The demigods in Homer, you remember the demigods who, be, who played such a great role in the discussion with Meletos, yeah. demons and other intermediate beings, as models. They despised death and they regard it as just that one should avenge one's friends. The example is Achilles and Patroclus. That's the worst model. Now, again, mere opinion. So demigods are higher than human beings. And what they do is surely good, surely noble. The question would be, of course, if does Socrates follow Achilles also by avenging his friends? Uh, or or is this, uh, yeah, has this no meaning? How could Socrates avenge his friends by what he is doing now? Who are his friends? Especially if you would look up the verses from the Iliad he quotes here, in the context, you would see that Socrates changes the model. Achilles doesn't say a word about justice of his action. That Socrates change. Now what is that? How far could Socrates avenge his friends for what he is doing? An entirely tentative suggestion. Socrates' trial and condemnation 
led to the consequence that no other philosopher was condemned to death in Athens anymore. He somehow brought about an act of repentance on this part of the city of Athens. And there was a certain reconciliation, not a complete, but a search, because Aristotle too had to escape. And that may have been due in the case of Aristotle to political problems, you know, because of Macedonia and Philip, Alexander, that may have been a different story. But a relative reconciliation between Athens and philosophy was brought about by Sugaristes because Athenians repented afterwards. So, you know, that Sugaristes avenges in a way his friends, the other philosophers who had been persecuted in Athens. Yeah, so Sugaristes compares himself here to Achilles, the 70 years old Sugaristes, to that youthful Achilles. Yeah, that's his mother. Uh, do you remember the further fate of Achilles in Homer? That, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was killed by Paris. But then other things happened in the Odyssey. Do you remember? Do you seem to remember? When he says to the Egyptians, I'd rather be a slave when the... I'd rather serve as a slave when Earth will be king of hell. King of Hades, in Hades. Yeah, so in other words, Achilles, after his death, we know this, unfortunately, not from Achilles himself, but only through the mouth of Odysseus, you know, and, uh, but still, Odysseus met him in Hades, and there Achilles revoked the whole principle of his heroic life. He said it is better to be a, a slave in the light of the sun than to be a king among the dead. That is, we must not forget. But at, uh, here on the surface we see only Sogaris taking Achilles as his model. Disgrace is worse than death. But what is disgraceful? Let us turn to 28d6 following. Thus it is, you men of Athens, in truth. Yeah? This is true, gentlemen. Wherever a man places himself, believing it to be the best place, or wherever he has been placed by his captain, there he must stay, as I think, and run any risk there is, calculating neither death or anything before disgrace. Then, gentlemen, I should have been acting strangely if I thought of Aeon and Phyllis and Dion. I stayed where I was posted by the captains, whom you had chosen to command me, like anyone else in this death. But where God posted me, as I thought and believed, with the duty to be a philosopher and to test myself and others, there I should fear either death or anything else and desert my post. Now let us stop here. So here, that's the answer. To run away from the enemy, that is disgraceful. It's the most elementary form of what everyone knows that's disgraceful. Not to stay where one has been put by one's captains, as he says, but more literally and simply by one's rulers. And there, that's clear. That's the most, and there, of course, a minor difficulty arises, as is pointed out in the Lachis, that in some cases it is brave to run away, I mean, to lure the enemy into, a, into an ambush, for example. Yeah? So, strictly speaking, to withstand to understand. And so on, certain difficulties. But let us take it, leave it at the simple uh, notion to, to stand, uh, to um, stand, uh, stay where one has been put. But it is noble, in other words, to follow the opinion regarding the best rather than fear for one's life, regardless of whether that opinion of the best is the law. That would mean the rulers, or one's own opinion. That is a conflict. I mean, uh, one's own opinion, which can and cannot be traced to the God. Just as when people speak, I, I follow my conscience and not the law, they mean, of course, not merely something in the earth, but ultimately a deep, something divine designed. That's the question. There is a possible conflict there. So, in other words, we grant that. Human nobility begins with not clinging to life. 
anything you prefer, if you follow any opinion and regard it as more sacred than your life, you are in principle no. There is, however, even on this level, a possible conflict between two kinds of opinions. The opinion of the community, the nomos, or your own opinion. Now, what does Sugadeh say? What deserves preference in case of such a conflict between the opinion of the society as expressed in the law and the opinion of the individual? Yeah? The law. In, is it so? Which opinion of the better does he follow by his life? The law didn't tell him to philosophize. The law did not tell him to philosophize. Then there's no concept if the law doesn't tell him to Yeah, but the law apparently quasi forbids it. And I mean, forbids it by implication. At any rate, by the way, in this respect, I believe that is an ordinary interpretation of the apology, that here a man stands up for the principle that one must stand up for one's own convictions, regardless of what the community thinks. At any rate, Socrates prefers, follows his ruler in the sense of the god, not in the sense of any Athenian majesty. Well, we are so familiar with this view. And it is extremely interesting that it occurs in a rudimentary form in the Suez. Today one would say one must be loyal to one's conviction. That's what Sogan is saying. And that alone gives a man nobility. But the crucial implication, just as in the modern view, the conviction cannot, to which, to which we, one must remain loyal, cannot be that life is the highest good. Look at the coward. You would say, I follow my conviction. <laughs> and that is exactly, that, no, that cannot be a conviction. That's understood. It may be modern have a beautiful word for expressing that, which for deep reasons could not express by the poor Greeks. We speak of idealists. The idealists are exactly the people who imply that life cannot be the highest good, and that means, of course, also possessions and, and uh, honors and this kind of thing. Yeah? That is what Socrates seems to express, and that is one reason why this book is so popular, and everyone knows it. Yeah, an idea is more sacred than any decision of the citizen body. It's a whole notion of political crime and of a respect for the political criminal as distinguished from the common criminal is of course based on this guy. He, he didn't uh, shoot this man because uh, he wanted to rob him or because he was jealous of him or so, but he did it, uh, it was a political murder. So you know that. It's a very important element of modern liberal thought. An idealist, according to this view, is a man who follows a conviction different from any conviction that life and the external goods are the highest good. That is not idealism. You see where we have sunk uh, today by virtue of the substitution of value for idea. As long as people spoke of ideas, which is also a loose term, but it had a certain respectability, it was excluded that someone could say, my value is uh, to have four square meals a day. That you couldn't possibly say it's an idealist, but you can call it a value, isn't it? You know, uh, that is uh, important. But the trouble is, value is, is an wholly impossible thing. Ideas is also not good enough, and that's the reason why Socrates didn't speak of ideas. For why is ideas not good enough? And simply to say, so human, to, to repeat this point, human nobility consists in being loyal to one's convictions regardless. But conviction in this sense can never mean that life and the external goods are the highest good. Yeah. Um, 
I don't quite follow that because according to the, the premise under which he's working, uh, all, of, all of his convictions or opinion are merely that. And he can't, he can't further distinguish that one is correct and another is not That is what I mean. But that is, since we, uh, you see, it is very important for us to understand Plato. But it is more, or so as, but it is more important for us to understand, for example, such a thing as, quote, ideas, unquote, yeah? What it means. It's not that. And we must not completely disregard it. Now, why is the concept of ideal as I sketched it, and as it is underlying popular, popular usage, and of course also the learned literature to some extent, why is this a very inadequate notion? Or for that matter, it's a notion of conviction or of conscience, as ordinarily used. Why is this inadequate? I mean, it, it does make a distinction between a brutish life, a life unworthy of human being, and a non-brutish life. But why is it so wholly insufficient? Well, this again gets to the problem of, um, the, of justifying the ideal. Unless, it can, unless one can show why the ideal is worth doing things for, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's too uh, vague. So yeah, in, uh, in other words, what is the criterion for, it's a precise criterion, for distinguishing between an idea and a mere preference? Yeah. That's the question. And the, the difficulty here induced people to abandon the problem and say, let's forget about ideas, let's speak of preference as preference, i.e. values. That is what happened, which is, of course, a, is a less desirable thing to do. Because if you say an ideal is characterized by the willingness of a man to die for it, it's obviously insufficient because people die for all kinds of things. They die even for the, in order to get property, as we know. Or for reasons because they are mortified by losing their property, which is also meaning dying for property. It's really insufficient. So Socrates cannot possibly leave it at that. In the passage which we read in 28, 4 to 5, at the end of the verse, when he says, the God commanded me, or, or, or put me there, uh, that I must, as I believed as well as assumed, yeah, that I ought to live to, uh, by, while philosophizing, and so on. As I believed and assumed, that is the basis for Socrates' dedicated life. It seems that Socrates' life is based on an opinion. Or does he merely mean that he ascribes his way of life to Apollo is a mere opinion. But the choice of that way of life itself is not. What does he mean by that? What is the basis of Socrates' I dedication to an idea. What is the base of Socrates' idea, if you use that term? His conviction that no one knows the greatest things is not opinion, according to representation here, but knowledge. That's the difference, Tony. Uh, but the connection, the conviction that he ought to examine others, that is not based on knowledge. That is based on the belief that the God has commissioned him to do so. But the mere Socrates knowledge that he knows nothing is not the issue, because he would never have been condemned for that, never been accused for that. Now let us go on where we left off in 29a. For it would be, for it would be awful, and one could then truly and ju justly uh, bring me into the law court that I do not believe that God exists by being disobedient to the oracle and uh, fearing death and believing to be wise while not being wise. Do you have that? Yes. Go on. For in fear of death, gentlemen, you only think you are wise when you are not, or is to think you know what you don't know. No one? knows whether death is really the greatest blessing a man can have. But they fear it is the greatest curse, as it may go well. Surely this is the objectionable kind of ignorance, 
think one knows what one does not know. But in this gentleman, here also perhaps I am different from the general run of mankind. And if I should claim to be wiser than someone in something, it would be amiss. But as I do not know well enough about what happens in the house of Hades, so I do not think I know. Uh, yeah, I do not believe to I know. Let us stop here. Incidentally, you see here, he says, to fear death is to claim to know what one does not know. We don't know what happened after death. Death may be a very great good, but we must add, if we read carefully, but it may also be a great evil. We don't know. What then does Socrates know? You see the paralysis following necessarily from this kind of thing. One little point uh, which is meant for those who like subtleties. Socrates mentions here three grounds of accusation. A, that he doesn't believe in the gods. B, that he fears death. And three, that he regards himself as wise while being it. The only thing taken up in the secret is the central one. He does not fear God. I mean, that's what the little example is. This central is what is in the center is always the most important in the context. The question is the context is the status of death. Yes, now the next sentence where you left off. But to do wrong and disobey those who are better than myself, whether God or man, that I know to be bad and disgraceful. Yeah, no stop. So this has knowledge. Here we know. He has no whether death is good or bad, he does not. But that one must do one's duty to say in any word, that he knows. How does he know? That would be a terribly important thing. Naturally, because then he has a guide for, for everything. It is evil, to translate more literally, it is evil and disgraceful to act unjustly and to disobey one's betters. So there is no sense, the most important thing, like Kant, if anyone has read Kant, we do not know anything about the thing in itself, about true reality. But we know the moral law, and it's all <coughs> a complete darkness. But one light, the light of the moral law within us, is sufficient, is sufficient, if true. Now one could say, in other words, but so this is not Kant, Plato is not Kant, and that is, although many people have tried to equate them, that doesn't work. So there is no then the most important things, it would seem. One question which we must raise. But it could also be the other way around. That these things which we regard as the most important are not the most important things. Now what could this mean? Now what does it mean to do wrong? As it is said, Adikai. What is the most simple meaning of them? Disobey. Whom? One's betters. No, no, that is distinguished here. It's distinguished here. What does it mean? Disobey law. Law, surely. That's always the first thing. Uh, justice means primarily comply with the law. So, to, to transgress the law. And the other thing is to transgress to the verdict of one's betters. That's not necessary. That may very well be different from the law. Which, but they may conflict. Which is to be preferred in case of conflict? The decision of the law or the verdict of one's betters? The answer is surely not given here. So we can say this, and uh, provisionally, and that is perhaps sufficient for the present occasion. This knowledge which Socrates says is less knowledge than the problem. It leads you up immediately to a great problem. And therefore, it is not complete ignorance, because problem is an essential problem. But it is not a simple guide for life, because you are confronted with an alternative and have no key as to the solution. But Socrates seems to indicate a solution in the secret. Perhaps we read that, where we left off. Therefore, in comparison with bad things which I know to be bad, rather will I never fear or flee from what may be good things for all I know. For even if you let me go now and refuse to listen to anecdotes, 
to remember what he said. He said that either I ought not to have been brought into court at all, or if I was, that death was the only possible penalty. And why? He told you, if I escaped, your sons would at once practice what Socrates teaches, and they would all be utterly corrupted. Then if you were to say to me in answer to this, we, we will not this time listen to Anatos, my dear Socrates. We will let you go free, but on this condition, that you will no longer spend your time in the search or in philosophy. And if you are caught in doing this again, you shall not. If you should let me go free on these terms, which I have mentioned, I should answer you. Many thanks indeed for your kindness, gentlemen, but I will obey to God rather than you. And as long as I have breath in me and remain able to do it, I will never cease being the philosopher and exhorting you and showing what is in me to any one of you I may meet by speaking to him in my usual way. And so on. And then there comes a long speech of Socrates. Now, what does this mean? Socrates refuses to accept the Quedal under a condition. That's obvious. But this could be formulated much more strictly. So he could say, all right, we acquit you. But at the next assembly, they are bringing in a bill forbidding to philosophize and defining philosophizing by what Socrates done. And it would be a law. And what does Socrates then say? Regarding that law, he will not obey it. He will not obey it. So in other words, Socrates gives an answer to the alternative. He says in case of conflict, between the law and the commandment of the God, he obeys the commandment of the God. Yeah, but then, of course, that is a difficult thing because that is not a commandment of the God as uh, a believer in the Bible could say, quoting chapter and verse, you know. That is a very dubious interpretation of a very dubious oracle. So Socrates simply sets his own conviction against the, a possible law. Yeah. Don't we get another aspect of the answer in terms of his action and that he is trying to, by pleading, or trying to persuade the citizens, he's trying to change the law? You know, um, this whole yeah. argument is based on the premise, naturally, that Socrates did not transgress the uh, law. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah? Sure. No, I'm, I believe he Socrates did, in fact, transgress the law because the law forbidding impiety, yeah, uh, that uh, was, of course, not very clearly formulated. Uh, but uh, that was sufficiently large, according to the spirit of the legislator, to cover Sugaris strange things. Uh, that's clear. Uh, but, uh, no, Sugaris, of course, uh, in fact, already... Sugaris, of course, uh, in fact, already in his whole pre life. But now Keller says the law is not absolutely sacred for me. So he follows his own conviction. I mean, Sowers would never say that anyone, everyone has a right to prefer his convictions to the law. He limits it to certain people, like himself, and that is the insolence and provocation uh, of which uh, Mr. Steinberg has spoken. And we must see later whether that is a mere impudence on the part of Socrates or whether it has a true basis. But to come back now, Socrates claims to have knowledge. And this knowledge, he knows nothing about whether death is an evil or good. But he knows that if one must follow the better. And that implies he knows somehow the good because otherwise he could not recognize that better is better. We do not know. We have mere, the mere assertion. We have no specimen of it, no proof of it. We must wait for that. Now, so he speaks that in the secret, we cannot read that, of his activity, namely what he has been doing all the time and at. Now, what is the gist of that? Is this. He, what he did was to admonish people to virtue. Or in other words, he admonished people to take care of their souls rather than of anything else. Now, what is the basis of that? It's the command of the God. Yeah, but so there is conviction, so perhaps so there is conviction that the best 
is virtue. The best is virtue. A virtuous life. You note here there is a transition. Previously he had spoken from, of knowledge of ignorance, which he was spreading. Now he says he is spreading concern with virtue. How does one is know that virtue is good? Because that is his knowledge. And the answer we find in the passage to which we have referred before in 30b is in somewhat later on. And Mr. Johnson, I trust you can find it. Yeah. To take more, to prepare more heat for the soul, to make it as good as possible. But I tell you that virtue comes not from money, but from virtue comes both money and all other good things from mankind, both in private and in public. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is his truth. So that is so much knowledge that he knows. And he doesn't elaborate that, but we can all uh, see that. For example, uh, you cannot remain, become rich, and remain rich if you are not uh, thrifty and industrious. Yeah, close. And uh, furthermore, you cannot be honored in your city if you uh, do not have certain interests of the soul by virtue of which you are elected a congressman and perhaps even to higher ranks in society. Yeah? Uh, so virtue is demonstrably the condition of all good. A, a man who is notoriously nothing but a beach comma will not get money, honors, or any other external good. It can be demonstrated. If he should get it, it would be by mere accident. Yeah, that could be. I mean, he could have uh, 50 different aunts who leave him their money at different times, <laughs> whenever he's bankrupt. But that's a mere accident, you can't count on that, not a rational procedure. So uh, that it can be proven. But it has one great difficulty, as we pointed out before. Virtue is instrumental. Virtue is instrumental for the external goods, including life itself. Yeah, but if that is virtue, it has it implies a decision of a question of which we were told it we cannot decide it, namely. Absolutely. Virtue cannot consist in sacrificing life. So it, in other words, this notion of virtue implies that we know that life is good, better than that. So we are still there with them. We have to if, if the whole in other words. So that even the commandment of the God, go, uh, God to the extent to which it is an encouragement to virtue, to a virtuous life, implies that life is good, because you cannot possibly live virtuously without living. Now, he goes on, since he does nothing but admonish his fellow citizens to virtue, the Athenians will only hurt themselves, not him, by killing him. For life is not a great good. And virtue is a great good. In this connection, he also mentions exile is, as, as one thing which the Athenians might do. Women says, exile is not a great evil. That will play a great role in the discussion of the Crito. Is what about exile? Now, here we have to turn again uh, to the text in 30 degrees. Now, in the next paragraph, maybe that, however, he might uh, put me to death or banish me or make me outcast. Do you have that? However, he might put me to death or banish me or make me outcast. Perhaps he thinks, per perhaps others think these are great evils, but I am not. I think rather that what he is now doing is evil, when he tries unjustly to put a man to death. Now, therefore, gentlemen, so far from pleading for my own sake, as one might expect, I plead for your sakes, that you may not offend about God's gift by condemning me. For and let us stop here. By the God's gift, we have this question. How does the rest know either that virtue is a greater good than life, 
or that virtue is only instrumental then to life and therefore inferior to life. How does he know? It is a gift of God that he knows that virtue is a greater good than life. Or, that is not clear, that he has a capacity to admonish people to virtue. And then he develops this famous passage, unfortunately we cannot read that, that Socrates is sent as a god, by the gods, to the Athenians as a gadfly. The Greek word for gadfly, myops, means literally a closing or contracting the eyes. And therefore, where mysticism comes from, closing the eyes. And ops is, is uh, sight. Yes. And therefore, that is applied to short-sighted people, as you, you know that what's when they want to look, yeah? Short-sighted is also the, is the primary meaning of the word. So this is short-sighted. He's not blind. And we will see later on uh, uh, what that is. Now, and here also he said, so he sent uh, as, as a gadfly to the city of Earth. He spends the whole di- day wherever he is in awakening the Athenians as a gadfly. Uh, and the Athenians would like to spend their whole life asleep. That is again the, the theme of the Republic. Life or death. The virtuous life is an awake life. And that's a good life. That's one proposition. Nothing of virtue as instrumental. That is in itself good. And this is obviously preferable to death understood as non-being and nothing else. So as is sent by the God, his activity is entirely selfless, no instrumental virtue. As he says, yeah, I think we should read that, uh, that I happen to be uh, such a man uh, of such a character as to be given by the God to the city you might be able to recognize from the following point. Do you have that? It does, it, yeah. Whoever has to trace it. That is uh, 31b. That I am really one given to you by God, you can easily see from this. From what this, and what follows, yeah. For it does not seem human that I have neglected all my own interests. I have been content with the neglect of my domestic affairs all these years, while always I was attending to your interests, approaching each of you privately like a father or elder brother, and persuading you to care for virtue. And indeed, if I had gained any advantage from this and taken fees for my advice, there would have been some reason in it. Yeah, it, is, yeah it would have been reasonable, one could say. It would have been reasonable. But as it is, you see yourselves that my accusers, although accusing me so shamelessly of everything else, had not the effrontery or ability to produce a single witness to testify that I ever exacted or asked for a fee. And I produce, I think, the sufficient witness that I speak the truth, my poverty. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen carefully to this. Someone says in the first place, I did not, I always did your business. Yeah. Does this ring a bell? So by doing, if he always did the business of others, how could he find time for doing, minding his own business? <laughs> his activity is entirely selfless. It is irrational, as he puts it. Yeah? Uh, if I had gotten some money for that, you see, he comes down now to the instrumental value of it. Yeah. Then it would have been made sense. But I didn't do that. The, the irrationality of his action proves the divine inspiration. A merely human wouldn't, uh, inspiration wouldn't do that. He takes care of the things like a father takes care of his children. He replaces the fathers. And here you become, is, is implied an other theme, which we know already. By replacing the fathers, by doing much better what the fathers ought to do than the fathers did, he brings a certain dishonor on the fathers. 
and so on. We, we remember that what we saw. In so, to repeat, what Sugar is presenting is his pure virtue, which has nothing to do with virtue as an instrument. I repeat, how does he know that his pure selfless virtue is good? That it is not irrational. We get a kind of answer in the immediate season. And that is a pastor of the utmost importance, in a way the center of the apology. Yeah? Thank you. Well, how does it may seem odd that although I go about and give all this advice privately, quite a busy body. Yeah, busy body. It's the same thing. That thing which is, you know, as a republic, to mind one's own business, the opposite of being a busy body. Yeah? Yet I dare not appear before your public assembly and advise the state. The reason for this is one which you have often heard me giving in many places. That something divine and spiritual comes to me. Yeah, divine and demonic comes to me. Yeah. Which Malenkos puts into the indictment. No, no, then I, 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 they, they omit something, uh, even in the text here. Uh, uh, something divine and demonic comes to me, comma, a voice, comma, yeah. Which Malenkos puts into the indictment in caricature. This has always been about me since my boyhood, a voice, which, when it comes, always turns me away from doing something I am intending to do, but never urges me on. That is what opposes my taking up public business, and quite right too, I think. For you may be sure, gentlemen, that if I had meddled with public business in the past, I should have perished long ago and done no good either to you or to myself. Do not be annoyed at my telling the truth. The fact is that no man in the world would come off safe who honestly opposes either you or any other multitude and tries to hinder the many unjust and illegal things done in a state. It is necessary that one who really and truly fights for the right, if he is to survive even for a short time, shall act as a private man, not as a public man. Yeah, that is very crucial. And because we are find now a new reference, a wholly unexpected reference, to a, a superhuman source of knowledge, different from the dead world. It is brought in a rather accidental. Sugares has explained why he was active by talking to individuals, to every Athenian individual. That was due to the Delphic oracles. But then the question was, yeah, but if you are such a busybody, so you can walk around the whole day in Athens, in the streets, marketplace, and gymnasia, and buttonhole everyone and say, did you care for your virtue today? <laughs> now, honestly, that's the way we should say it. Then, why did you not go into politics, what was obviously the duty of an intelligent man? Why did he not dare that's term used, to be politically active. Answer, something divine and demonic happens to him. A voice, a voice, that's important, because it is only a voice, and therefore the question is, can you draw any inference from the voice that there are demons, do you remember? And if there, you, you know the argument against Melitus, if the voice doesn't, the demonic voice doesn't prove that there are demons, except in a purely verbal way, when you say a demonic voice, voice must be demon. And then, of course, you cannot prove that Sugar is believed in the gods in the way in which Sugar has proved it to Melodos. A voice. That voice opposes to act, uh, action. It never incites to action. The incitement to action came from the Delphic oracle, not from the demon. And it always opposes political action seems to be an irrational thing. But, as Sugares makes clear in 31d6, its verdict is intelligible. It seemed to me, as Sugares says, uh, to oppose political action in a, in a perfectly beautiful way. Pan Carlos, perfectly beautiful way. The same, a perfectly intelligible way. Now, why is it so intelligible? Why is the verdict of that voice so intelligible? Quite. Self-preservation. That's it. 
Political activity would have led to the rest death. For political activity is fatal to decent men. We dis I disregard now this crucial implication that political activity is fatal to decent men. I'm now concerned only with that point which Mr. Johnson has observed, that the demonion is presented here in the apology, whatever Plato may say in other dialogues, is concerned with self-preservation, with super self-preservation. It is cautionary. The demonic thing as presented here is caution. That is the simple meaning of the keeping back. For this reason, life is a condition of any other good. The demonic thing leads to private life with a view to self-preservation, whereas the Delphic oracle leads to that quasi-public life, you know, button-holding everyone, complete disregard of self-preservation, completely selfless virtue as we have seen before. The demonia is directly concerned with Socrates' preservation. And what does this mean in terms of the key question of the apology? What is that key question? To make it quite clear, why is Socrates so absolutely ignorant? And what does it mean? What's the concentrated form of this question? Virtue above self-preservation. Yeah, more simply. Is death an evil or a good? The demonic thing assures him that life is good because it points him towards self-preservation. And therefore also, although that is not made clear here at all, that to be awake is better than to be asleep because sleep is akin to death. Yeah? To be awake is better and therefore to awaken others is better than to keep them asleep. Very well. But what is the demonic thing? What is the demonic thing? Well, the demonic thing is mentioned in other words, and the clearest presentation of the demonic is given in a dialogue called Theatres, which is almost universally considered Spirit. I say also because I believe I'm the only one I think <laughs> the spirit is strange. And here we find one thing that is very beautiful. It is a very crude presentation of the dialogue. A big about that is the reason is the only dialogue of Solaris with a rustic. And people don't consider the fact that Venezuela talks to so much of upstate. <laughs> Because, you know, it's really upstate, I can see. He cannot talk in the same way as he would talk to a sophisticated downstate. That is the case. Now, in the city, by the way, there is, uh, this point was developed very nicely in a master thesis for the comedians of the thought by Seth and Adete. If you want to read that, it's a very enjoyable thesis, by the way. And uh, now, what he does in the theater is this. A fellow of the fellow from downstate, uh, uh, said his son wants to study with Sophia because he, he doesn't know quite well, but he wants to become famous. And as always finds out soon he wants to become a trainer. And he thinks the right thing is to go to school so that so it's not born to have. And then he says, you see there's something strange with me. I have to be one kind of knowledge. And that is the eroticism. And that means, uh, you know, let's well, put it so crudely, but it implies it. If I am attracted, I take him on. If I'm not attracted, I do not take him. And, uh, but he goes to the labor that point because it would be offensive. And so he really says, I have no knowledge except eroticism. And then they laugh and say, What do you do? And then they say, All right. And then, and that's very difficult. And then he speaks of the demonic thing. You see, if he clicks, then I accept him. He doesn't click at all. And then, in order to describe the demonic thing, he tells an absolutely awful horror story. <laughs> 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 and that's the reason why the interpreters think 
it is a, it is not that late, you know, because of the goodness. But it makes perfect sense in the context that because he can't convince him by this elegant argument or take from eroticism, then he really loses fire and burns to the <laughs> sense. Now the point is somebody substitutes here here introduces errors and uses daimonium as a substitute for it. Arnie suggests that errors and daimonium are the same thing. Okay, I mean the notion of the voice of conscience is that is really no better. Now let me explain that errors you must not think of Sigmund Freud. Uh, errors they have still a broad meaning. It means all natural inclination. But particularly those which are which are indicated by the word. But if it means all natural inclinations, it means of course also the basic one. And what is that? Uh, uh, there is perfect agreement, uh, I mean, perfect consistency. The demonic thing has, uh, uh, Sugaris has a demonium that means that the natural inclinations are unusually powerful. So that they, over, they are more powerful than any media of being. And that shows on all levels. It must also show what the level is. Therefore, that Sugaris was a man of common sense, it's a true sense of the word. You know, I had a certain sense of self-preservation, and you know, is implied in that. So there's his sobriety itself. Yes? Doesn't Socrates say that he knows he's right to go to death because the voice doesn't interfere? And this would indicate that self-preservation isn't the... the it's not the highest consideration. But it is, of course, also something in him. But in answer to the question which you very legitimately raised, it is. You have to consider the circumstances. Yeah? What is the most massive circumstance of this, uh, this affair, this condemnation? I mean, external circumstances. I mean, after all, you know what circumstances mean. I mean, it, for example, at what time? Was he? Did he say the place? Yeah. So, in other words, a sensible man of 70 will have a different position to the value of his life for him than a young man of 30. We come to that when we read the Crito. You see, in the Crito that is discussed at some length, why should, should somebody escape or not? There is on the one place a simple answer, obey the laws. But that is not so simple as we shall see. And therefore a prudential consideration enters. And there, in a prudential consideration, the simple verdict of the law is not sufficient to consider the circumstances. And one important circumstance surely is so as age. I mean, if he were a young man, he might have taken a different... Uh... Yeah, we don't know. It might be. If old age was a relevant consideration, it is a fair question at any rate. Which course he would have taken when he was 40. Mm -hmm. and that is the point. But that we can only decide when we come to the trial. Good. So, now let me first finish this one, if you don't mind. Now the natural revulsion against death and against stupor and torpor. Look back now to the Delphic Oracle. The Delphic Oracle, by inducing Sogaris to expose himself to hatred, unpopularity, death, says just the opposite. And here I can only remind you, because it would lead us too far, of the Wasps. Do you remember the action of the Wasps, of the hero of the Wasps, was also based on Delphic Oracle. This action also was misanthropic not guided by uh, love of man. The daimonion is guided by, if we personify it, by love of human beings, <coughs> philanthropy. Eros, the philanthropic god, as you may remember from the banquet. Now, Mr. Gilman? Uh, there seems to be a parallel 
between the daimonium and the kind of action uh, which he decides not to take politically. Because the daimonium tells him what not to do. And the kind of action he speaks of consists in hindering unjust and illegal acts. In other words, it would seem to be, it would be, it would seem to be it's very good. It's impossible for him to be the daimonion of Athens. There is no place, there's place for such a voice in an individual, not in a political community. And, uh, uh, or have I ruined it? No, no, but I, I will come to that, but keep it in mind. I didn't think of it, but uh, it links up very well with the point which uh, comes up. Uh, uh, only a word about the implication. The just political life, which Sogares would have regarded as the only one feasible for him, is essentially, he makes clear, a life in opposition to the multitude because of the essential injustice of the multitude. That is said very strong. A just man, he cannot remain just among the politics. Clearly, that implies that Sogares knows what justice is. And we do not know yet what, where the knowledge set. In the sequel, he gives proofs of his justice and the injustice of the multitude under the democracy. But what, in what did his justice consist in this case? I do not mean now the somewhat more subtle point raised by Mr. Gill. How did he show, how did, what is his justice? Very simple. Oh. Pardon? Oh. Legality. So as it is on legality. Yeah. Then if they wanted to condemn the generals all at one, at by one verdict, whereas according to the law, everyone had to be a judge by himself. So it's obeyed by the law. And that is, of course, clear. One meaning, the primary meaning of legality, of justice, is to obey the law and not follow your passions, naturally. That's the reason why people establish laws to have a protection against irrational judgment. But in this particular case, and I think that it's very important that I think we should read. No, no, that comes later, I'm sorry. This particular law that appears on the context is obviously also a wise law. Yeah? It is not merely happened to be that thing, you know, the sensible. And this tells us one little thing, as though it is not developed here. In any way, the justice, while being primarily legality, is not identical with legality, because otherwise we could not speak of unjust laws. And to speak of unjust laws is obviously necessary. That is only indicative. As for this question of Sogares' knowledge of justice, I would like to say only one word, because we can't all develop this out. That, I believe, is identical here, in this context, with his admission that there is a political art, although he is not competent in it. And I will speak of that problem next time. In the sequel, he speaks also of Socrates, as of how he behaved legally under an oligarchy. In both cases, as Mr. Gilden said, Sogares' injustice really consists, strictly speaking, in doing, in preventing an injustice, in not doing anything unjust. But was he positively just? That is the question which you meant. Yeah? Did he, for example, that is a question which we also will take up next time. And then we have to take up this whole question, the whole description. I can only say the problem. The whole description of Sogares' life is given in the Apology. The Apology, as said on a former occasion, is a kind of entrance gate to that cosmos of the Platonic dialogue. Here, Sogares is presented as presenting himself to the Athenian people, to the Athenian demon. Well, we should expect that this will be confirmed, this button-holding business, you know by the many dialogues which they wrote. According to the apology, so that is the man who gets up at uh, four in the morning, goes out and begins approaching Mr. Zorro. Yeah. What is your job? Uh, did you care for your soul? What did you give to your soul? <laughs> so that is always the initiative. A different expression. 
that all dialogues are voluntary. The sense that so there is six. Yeah. But if you look at the dialogues, you see that the only part of them are voluntary. Another part is imposed on Socrates. They approach him. If any button holding is done, it's done by others. So, and furthermore, we see that the dialogues show us Socrates engaged not in conversation with a chance fellow citizen. There are only two exceptions to that. And the, the, the exceptions prove it. He, um, so he talks, when he goes up, he comes home from a campaign, exhausted, and uh, it was a tough time. What does he do? Where does he go the next morning? In a gymnasium, where there are young men, youth, communists, talks to him, that he likes. But then he goes also perhaps to places where God does. You know, to talk to God. That's not nothing in six months. Yeah. And uh, he didn't, uh, I mean, there's no question that he uh, was this guy. So there are no dialogues. Yes, there is only a single dialogue that which complies with that description of the tractor. Plato refutes this description of the race by his own order of that. There are two dialogues in which the race really has put his initiative and approaches a nameless fellow, a chance acquaintance. These dialogues are the minors and the departures. Two small dialogues which are, again, almost universally regarded as curious. And they are <laughs> The minus begins very <laughs> slow. And the result of the dialogue is really rather subversive. I mean, if you put a big question behind the segments of the thing you The process begins also. What is not okay? And it leads up to a certain justification or vindication of silly Athenian tyrant departures, which is also not what he claims to do. You see, there are strange, as I say, the exceptions. When he has it in his immediate addressing a chance fellow in the a crew, so he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And that, of course, is the most interesting question regarding the apology. What does this presentation of Socrates, this wholly unrealistic presentation, mean? After all, this was not the, the defense speech actually delivered by Socrates in the years of That was written years, perhaps 10 years, perhaps 20 years, no one knows after the death of Socrates, and in a way in which that was a kind of, which had of course a relation to the accusation, not, but which had, a kind, had also the function, as I say, to give the only popular speech which Socrates ever made. You see, he, you remember there was a sketch of a popular speech uh, given here in uh, third in, in 29, yeah? Where he, I love you, uh, no, uh, you best of men, uh, being a genius, um, and so on and so on. In, in third in 29, the following. There are such speeches. Xenophon, whose delivery principle is to leave everything at the most pedestrian level, the low ceiling, he gives at least one such speech in the third chapter of Sogadi of the Lamorabilia, in which Sogadi is presented as a kind of stump orator. Yeah? He goes as a stump and makes a speech in favor of continents, <laughs> which is very plausible, but also uh, someone less uh, gifted than Sogadi could have made it. You know, the, it uh, contains this uh, very uh, charming passage when he says, Whom to whom would you entrust your, uh, if you die early, uh, your sons for education and your daughters for what? Which includes the idea that girls don't need education. 
and stop supply comes in the bananas all the time. And uh, that is not, I mean, that is a kind of caricature of a benevolent caricature of Socrates. Okay. That's it. See the idea behind this? It is impossible for a philosopher to present what he is doing in a popular speech, in a speech addressed to the demons of it. It's impossible. They wouldn't understand. And from what is immediately audible is, of course, something which is in no way comic. Yeah? I mean, it has a great elevation and so on, and which uh, this elevation, however, is when you understand more deeply a mere reflection of the true elevations. That is, an elevation as it can be understood by the ordinary man, and that is when you understand the true elevation. Only a caricature. And there is a deep element of the comedy in this presentation, as I think we will see next time. Now, next time we will have to discuss the end of the apology, and uh, Monday we will have the paper on the crypto. Mr. Bergen, so you, so you gave it to me. Then, uh, do you want to read it or um, in class? Because the law is I see. So then I will ask her by rights to very second to read it in class. Have it ready for next Monday? And Mr. Wright, you know that it's ready. In, but you must send it in in the other But the Delphic Oracle leads him to realize the knowledge of ignorance the depreciation of human wisdom, it's of no word, and implies we don't know whether the de de whether death is not a great good after all. The demonic thing, on the other hand, pushes him to concern with self-preservation and therefore conveys the message that life is good. Now, I interpreted that since the demonion in sugar is in verse stands for the natural inclinations. And that implies the natural inclinations are as such good. This problem we have to discuss uh, because it is absolutely crucial for the whole later history of social thought and social science up to the present day. The notion that the natural inclinations are good is underlying the concepts of natural right and natural law. Natural right means, in the original meaning of the term, that which is intrinsically right, as distinguished from everything which is right only by human arrangements. But the intrinsically right is that what is by nature right. Nature is the standard. The same applies also to the concept of natural law. Now, you all know that this view that nature supplies us with a standard is today rejected. But this rejection of nature as a standard is not a recent thing, but is implied in modern political thought from the very beginning. One can state that the position of modern philosophy from the very beginning was this. The ancient philosophers made the dogmatic premise that nature is good. Why should it be good? In other words, that they, the modern thinkers, I will give you some names later, that they had discovered a problem in which the ancient thinkers had not seen a problem at all. To indicate the present day view, the most beautiful statement of that, I, which I've ever read or heard, occurs somewhere in Melville. I have called that figure. In, in one of his stories uh, on the I think it's on the Mississippi, a confidence man. You will know which story it is, mm -hmm. because I have read it only in the book on that. Someone, uh, this confidence man, this trickster, says something about the goodness of creation, the goodness of nature, and to, uh, uh, to which he owes everything. And the fellow to whom he addresses that remark says, my eyes, for example, 
that they work. I owe not to nature, but to an oculist in Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, because he had to improve nature so that he could see it all. So nature, in other words, is nothing. The real uh, nature is in constant need of improvement and change of human art, of technology, of the conquest of nature. Conquest of nature, never forget, means that nature is an enemy. You don't conquer your friends. In the recent book by Arnold Brecht, Political Theory, this is the guiding theme, you can say. The usual distinction between facts and values is there presented as follows. So conclusion, the radical distinction between facts and values is indispensable because there is no possibility of making an inference, a legitimate inference, from the is to the ought. You have heard this ten times, that you know that this and this is so. It doesn't prove that it is good that it is so. And Brecht, who is an oldish man, uh, and belongs to an older stratum of this kind of theory, which a uh, stratum which was more solid, I must say, than what we have now, is that the conclusion from the is to the ought would be legitimate only if the is were knowable as a work of the good God, then the is would be intrinsically good. But this that the, I mean, that reality is a work of the good God is not knowable, and therefore the inference is not legitimate. Yes? May I ask you what was this book Arnold Brecht, B-R-E-C-H-T, Political Theory, Princeton, 1958 or 59. First World War, I mean, it is not an original book in any way, but it is a respectable book uh, because it gives you a coherent history of this fact-value distinction and presents in a sober way, a sober, I think one can say, the accepted opinion. Yeah. And what he calls uh, social science. How does he call it, Mr. Schrock, social science relativism? Yes, that's it. Or scientific relativism, yeah. Uh, uh, it's scientific it, he, I, I, If you look at it, may I take the liberty of telling you that he criticizes my criticism of this view and says I hadn't understood the whole of this. But I, I don't uh, regard this as uh, in any way a detraction from the book because it, the value of the book consists in being a presentation of an, a sober presentation of the accepted opinion and that was lacking. And most people who presented it were uh, real savages, I'm sorry to say, who, uh, without any inkling of the debates, simply uh, said the values are just prevalent, you know. Uh, someone likes steaks and other likes uh, pineapples, and that's all there is to it. Brecht is much better than that. But to come back to the, uh, I mean, to uh, stress it to the origin, Hobbes, he's talked of the state of nature, a term which didn't play any role in political theory before. Hobbes really made it the key term. State of nature is bad. The real thing is to get out of the state of nature. If one would apply the term state of nature to earlier thought, it would mean the state of nature is a good state. It's a state of perfection. That was an ordinary meaning. The term doesn't occur in, in political theory before. It stems from theology, from Christian theology, and is not at home in political thought, only in Hobbes. So the state of nature is bad, that means, of course, also, nature provides a standard, but only a negative standard. Nature tells us from what we should get away, and wherewith it gives us direction, but it is not itself the standard. But the profoundest presentation of this basic premise occurs in Descartes' meditation, where Descartes speaks of a bad genius, a, you, you can say a bad god, as a key ground for doubt. We do not know whether we have or not the work of an evil genius, and all our natural faculties are not his work. Uh, this may all be delusions, you know, that we see things and, and various kinds of things. They may all be delusions. 
we may be exposed to the clever the, to, to the artifices of a clever deceiver who has no other intentions as we than to deceive us. And Descartes then tries to show that even if it were as bad, we still could protect ourselves against him, because if he wants to deceive us, he must give us some intelligence. Yes. You can't deceive his dog. And this intelligence, which he had to give us in order to deceive us, is our protection. But it is only this intelligence or this reason, not nature, on which we can rely. And from, uh, so not nature, but reason gives us guidance. Nature and reason here used as opposites. And this culminates in Kant's doctrine, according to which the moral law is a law of freedom in contradistinction to the law of nature. The traditional view was that the moral law is the law of nature for Kant that is incompatible. So this problem, which is so crucial for modern thought, occurs to us in the apology, among other writers. The apology shows that Socrates or Plato was aware of this problem that he faced. And the expression of that is, death may be better than life. How Socrates solved it, that we must try to understand. Now, to return to the immediately visible part of the argument, Socrates says that he is ignorant of the greatest things, but also he knows that it is evil and disgraceful to act unjustly and to disobey one's betters. Now, I interpret this to mean it is evil and disgraceful to transgress the law and to transgress the intrinsically right. Wrongdoing law, disobey one's betters, to transgress intrinsically right. Now, this intrinsically right proves to be superior to the law, at least in the case of Socrates. Socrates, as we have seen, refuses to obey a possible law which would forbid him to philosophize. We have said that. Therefore, all right, Socrates, it's a crucial point that Socrates knows the intrinsically right. How does he know it? He gives the example of his conduct at the trial of the generals, ten generals, after the battle of the Agenusa. Socrates acted justly at that trial. In what did his just action consist? He obeyed the law. The multitude wanted to condemn them altogether, whereas the law provided that each one should be uh, judged by himself. But there is more to that. That law was not merely the actual law of Athens. A moment's reflection tells everyone that it was a wise law. I mean, that it is an impossible procedure to condemn people on block and not to look at each case at the guilt or the degree of guilt. So, Socrates has another criteria that is clear for justice than the mere law. Now let us turn to 37A, 7B, that is on page, in the translation on page 442, beginning of the second paragraph. Well, let's see. Perhaps you think that in saying this? Yeah. Perhaps you think that in saying this, very much as I spoke of appeals for pity, I am just showing off. No such thing, gentlemen. I will tell you what I mean. I am convinced that I never willingly wronged anyone, but I cannot convince you, for we have conversed together only a short time. If we had a law, as other people have, that a trial for life or death is to be spread over many days and not confined to one, I think you would have been convinced. But as it is, I cannot disperse great prejudices in a moment. Now let me stop here. You see here is how, what are so going to do here in this passage? He criticizes the law. He criticizes the law, yeah. On such an occasion. It's quite extraordinary. And on what grounds? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, but he has to say more than that. Yeah, name me. Uh, that doesn't give him enough time to kind of make a poor judgment. Poor yeah, he's a bad, no. So he has a cry. So he has a criterion for distinguishing between bad and good laws. And that means the identification of justice with obedience to the law, with legality, it's untenable, manifestly untenable. And I, I don't know what a, an addict of the value fact distinction would say, but I must confess to an excellent argument, a rational argument that such a law is a better law than as proposed by the words and the existing law, because the law wants to punish the guilty and, the, and not the innocent. Any penal law. Whatever the law, the legislator might understand, but you know, there can be all kinds of funny notions as to what constitutes innocence and the guilty. But the penal law tries to find out who is guilty and who is and to discriminate between the guilty and innocent. And then it must take the necessary precautions in order not to punish the innocent. Take even the Nazi system. They didn't want to, to destroy good Nazis. Yeah. Obviously not. And therefore the, the legal procedure had, would have to be, if they had had any sense, at least to discriminate clearly between good Nazis who might have looked as bad Nazis for a moment, and other people. So, so that's really intrinsically sound, although very insufficient, as my specimen, uh, my uh, yeah, example show. Soares claims then to possess knowledge of justice, but he denies that he possesses knowledge of the greatest things. How can this seeming contradiction be resolved? Justice is not Knowledge of justice does not belong to knowledge of the Christ. Yeah. It is stated differently. Knowledge of justice is part of knowledge of the human things. And the human things are by definition distinguished from the divine things. And the divine things are the Christ. Sure, but so is, to come back to the point, so is, claims to possess knowledge of justice. And we have to understand that. On an earlier occasion, we have seen that Socrates admitted that there is a political art which he denied, however, to possess. And he says of that political art, or of the political man, rather, that they know nothing noble and good, i.e. nothing of the crisis things. But the, the political art is an art. For example, like the art of Schumacher's. You can Whatever you may say, it is possible for you to distinguish between a good and bad shoemaker. I mean, just put on the shoe They're made by a good and by a bad shoemaker, then you will see the difference. And you, in a, in a little bit more complicated, but in the long run, also easy to distinguish between a good and bad statesman. Yeah. It's more, I mean, the consumption takes such a longer time to test, yeah? you know? For example, a Chamberlain might have appeared in a different light in 1937, Neville Chamberlain, I mean, than 1939. Yeah. It needed these two years to bring out certain things which showed his lack of judgment on certain important matters. But in principle, it's the same thing. What is that political art, then? And that we must clarify because our subject is the origins of political science. Now, what is an art? Comparable to the art of the shoemaker, although more ambitious in every sense. The art of managing the affairs of the city by deed and by speech. This art is a pre-philosophic art, as the art of the shoemaker that exists or can exist among savages as well as among the most civilized people. Still, the awareness that it is an art is somehow connected with philosophy. It is, it is as it were, unconsciously used as an art. 
everywhere where men live in societies. But that men are aware this is art is connected with philosophy. External sign of that. I mean that King David in the Bible possessed the political art can hardly be doubted. But there is no Hebrew word for the political art, no biblical word. The Greeks had that word. And not only, uh, I mean, acquired it indeed in the period when their way of speaking had already become influenced by philosophy. Now let us look into that political art, keeping in mind its relation to the, question, the knowledge of justice. And let us first understand it in terms. This political art in Greek, uh, the usage in Greek has uh, uh, two different words. One is techne, and the other is episteme. Now, the Indonesian translation is for that art, for that science. But uh, in the classical period, they are used rather in this term. You know, I mean, the strict take and formal distinction occurs in Aristotle, uh, but uh, even Aristotle does not always use them strict terminology. Uh, things. So we can also say the political science, it doesn't make any difference. Political science is political art. Now, what is, it, oh, is this political uh, science in the primary sense? The art or science possessed by the good politician or statesman. Where do we, does anyone of you know where we find the first presentation of that? In its, as, uh, of that science. In its pre philosophical <coughs> It's a very important question. I believe I have discussed that subject for some years in my classes, otherwise uh, you would know. Some of you know. Yeah. The G statement occurs in Aristotle's rhetoric. Book 1, Chapter 4. I have been reading it. Aristotle's rhetoric deals with the art of speech, naturally. One kind of speech is deliberative speech. It's a speech in political assemblies concerned with what is expedient or inexpedient for the policy. We must first ascertain about what kind of good or bad things the deliberative orator advises since he cannot do so about everything, but only about things which may possibly happen or not. Everything which of necessity either is or will be, or which cannot possibly be or come to pass, is outside the scope of deliberation. Indeed, even in the case of things that are possible, advice is not universally appropriate, for they include certain advantages, natural and accidental, about which it is not worthwhile to offer advice. But it is clear that advice is limited to those subjects about which we take counsel, and such are all those which can naturally be referred to ourselves, and the first cause of whose origination is in our own power. For our examination is limited to finding out whether such things are possible or impossible for us to perform not whether they are possible for angels, or for that matter, for foreigners. We are discussing what we in this community can do. However, there is no need at present to endeavor to enumerate with scrupulous exactness or to classify those subjects which men are wont to discuss, or to define them as far as possible with strict accuracy, since this is not the function of the rhetorical art but of one that is more intelligent and exact. And further, more than its legitimate subjects of inquiry have already been assigned to it. For what we have said before is true, that rhetoric is composed of logic, let me say, and of that political science which is concerned with characters. Aristotle doesn't mean by that that there is a political science which is not concerned with characters, but he only wants to exclude any notion that there could be a political science which does not deal ultimately with characters, with good and bad men. So, in other words, the strict discussion would belong rather to political science, but here he has to give at least a sketch because of the overlapping of rhetoric and political art.
Now we must say that the most important subjects about which all men deliberate and deliberative orators harangue are five in number, to wit, ways and means, war and peace, the defense of the country, imports and exports, legislation. These are the five things. So you, you see he makes a distinction between the defense of the country which means you're ordinarily guarding your know, fortress and support frontiers. And the question, should we now make war or keep peace between a different question? Yeah? And then he develops these themes. Uh, let me only read what he says about legislation. With a view to the safety of the city, it is necessary that the orator should be able to judge of all these questions, I mean, food, Imports and exports, ways and means, war and peace, and, and the guarding of the country. But an understanding of legislation is of special importance, for it is on the law as the safety of the city and space. Therefore, he must know how many regimes there are, what is expedient for each and the natural causes of its own downfall, whether they are peculiar to the particular form of government or opposed to it. By being ruined by causes peculiar to itself, I mean that, with the exception of the best regime, all the rest are ruined by being relaxed or strained to excess. Thus democracy not only when relaxed, but also when strained to excess, becomes weaker and will end in oligarchy. Similarly, not only does an aquiline or snub nose reach the mean when one of these defects is relaxed, yeah? you know, the aquiline, the opposites, but when it becomes aquiline or snub to excess, it is altered to such an extent that even the likeness of a nose is lost. But if they would come to the middle, they would have given you a normal nose. That is a perfect regime. You know, as a perfect regime. That's all right, but good. Moreover, with reference to acts of legislation, it is useful not only to understand what regime is expedient by judging in the light of the past, I mean, reading histories, but also to become acquainted with those in existence in other nations, comparative commonwealth to learn what regimes are suitable to what kinds of people. For example, the, for, the, for the Persians, their kind of kingship may be much better and they would be lost by, in a republic. It is clear, therefore, that for legislation, books of travel are useful. Yeah? You see, he doesn't say scientific books on uh, South America. He says books of travel because he thinks intelligent travelers are perfectly good guys for the thing. Since they have to, has to understand the laws of other nations and for political debates, historical works, where you find models of political speeches. All these things, however, belong to politics and not to rhetoric. So you have here the framework of what political science even today fundamentally means. The kind of knowledge which man needs for acting wisely in political matters. So there is no reflection on methodology because the methodology is implied. You know how to go about it. If you want to find out about uh, Nehru's India, surely you may also need some statistics because you can't count the heads and uh, you can't count the amount of uh, food uh, India needs. Are you sure? That's easy. It may be technically difficult, but uh, it's not a serious problem, intellectual problem. And uh, so, that's it. Now, that is then really a, a classic statement, which should, if, if there were a good reader in the Dutch political science, that would be in it. But what has this to do with our present problem? So got it. Now, the answer is simple. What Aristotle does here is based on a Socratic statement. Mr. Kendrick, do you recognize him? No, I understand. Huh? I understand. I say Aristotle's statement, which I read in parts, is based on a Socratic statement. First, no, no, no. 
In the memorabilia, book three, chapter six, a conversation of Socrates with Glaucon, the fellow whom you know from Plato's Republic. The son of Aristo, Glaucon, was attempting to become an orator and striving for headship in the polis. So he was less than 20 years old. And none of his friends or relations could check him. So he would get himself dragged from the platform and make himself a laughingstock. Only Socrates, who was benevolent to him for the sake of Plato and for the sake of Charmides, the son of Glaucon, alone managed to check him. For once on meeting him, he stopped him and contrived to engage his intention by saying, Glaucon, have you made up your mind to be our chief man in the polis? I have, so good. Well, by Zeus, there is no more honorable ambition in the world. For obviously, if you gain your object, you will be able to get whatever you want, and you will have the means of helping your friends. You will lift up your father's house and exalt, exalt your fatherland and you will make a name for yourself first at home, later on in Greece, and possibly like the Mistocles in foreign lands as well. <laughs> Wherever you go, you will be a man of mark. When Glaucon heard this, he felt proud and gladly stayed on. Next, Socrates asked, Well, Glaucon, as you want to be in honor, is it not obvious that you must benefit your city? Most certainly. By the gods, don't be resistant then. But tell us how you propose to begin your services to the polis. As Glaucon remained silent, apparently considering for the first time how to begin, Sugaris said, if you wanted to add to a friend's fortune, you would set about making him richer. Will you try then to make the, our city richer? Certainly. Would she not be richer if she had a larger revenue? Oh, yes, oh, obviously. Now tell me, from what source are the city's revenues at present derived, and what is their total? No doubt you have gone into this matter in order to raise the amount of any that are deficient and supply any that are lacking. Certainly not, exclaimed Glaucon. I haven't gone into that. Well, if you have left that out, tell us the expenditure of the city. No doubt you intend to cut down any items that are excessive. The fact is that I haven't time yet for that either. Or oh, then we will postpone the business of making the city richer. For how is it possible to look after income and expenditure without knowing what they are? Well, Socrates, one can make our enemies contribute to the city. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I shoes. Provided he is stronger than they. But if he be weaker, he may lose what he has got instead. True. Therefore, in order to advise her whom to fight, it is necessary to know the strength of the city and of the enemy, so that if the city be stronger, one may recommend her to go to war. But if weaker, then the enemy may persuade her to beware. You are right. First, then, tell us the naval and military strength of our city and that of her enemies. Uh, by Zeus, I can't tell you that out of my head. Well, if you have made notes, fetch them, for I should greatly like to hear this. But by Zeus, I haven't yet made any notes either. Then we will postpone offering advice about war too, for the present. You are new to power and perhaps have had no time to investigate such big things. But the defense of the country now, you see, defense of the country is a different question from war and peace. I feel sure that you have thought about that and know how many of the garrisons are well placed and how many are not and how many of the guards are efficient, and how many are not. And you will propose to strengthen the well-placed garrisons and to do away with those that are superfluous. By Zeus, I shall propose to do away with them all, for the only effect of maintaining them is that our crops are stolen. Apparently, here you know something. But if you do away with the garrisons, don't you think that anyone will be at liberty to rob us openly? However, have you been on a tour of inspection? Or how do you know that they are badly maintained? By Gessler. Then shall we wait to offer advice on this question too, until we really know instead of merely guessing. 
perhaps it would be better, said Loma. Now for the silver mines, which was a major source of flammable sediments, I'm sure you have not visited them, and so can't tell by the amount that I've from there has fallen. No, indeed, I have not been there. But by Zeus, the district, the district is considered unhealthy, and therefore the people leave the silver mines. And so when you have to offer advice on the problem, this excuse will serve. You are joking at my expense, says Glaucon. Ah, but there is one question I feel sure you have not overlooked. No doubt you have reckoned how long the corn ground in the country will maintain the population and how much is needed annually. So that you may not be caught napping, should the city at any time be short and may come to the rescue and relieve the city by giving expert advice about food. What an overwhelming task, says Laucon, if one has got to include such things as that in one's duties. But you know, says Sogaris, no one will ever manage even his own household successfully unless he knows all its needs and sees that they are all supplied. Seeing that our city contains more than 10,000 houses and it is difficult to look after so many families at once, you must have tried to make a start by doing something for one. I mean your uncles, if the property shamanists. It needs it, and if you succeed with that one, you can set to work on a larger number. But if you can't do anything for one, how are you going to succeed with many? If a man can't carry one talent, it's absurd for him to try to carry more than one, isn't it? Well, said Malcolm, I could do something for uncle's household if only he would listen to me. What, said Sogres, you can't persuade your uncle, and yet you suppose you will be able to persuade all the Athenians, including your uncle. <laughs> Very take care, Glaucon, that your daring ambition does not lead to a fall. Don't you see how risky it is to say or do what you don't understand? Think of others whom you know to be the sort of men who say and do what they obviously don't understand. Do you think they get praise or blame by it? And think of those who understand what they say and what they do. You will find that the men who are famous and admired always come from those who have the widest knowledge and the infamous and despised from the most ignorant. Therefore, if you want to win fame and admiration in public life, try to get a thorough knowledge of what you propose to do. It, uh, and so on. And you see, that is stronger and, and it is much richer than appears in the first reading. But so it gives you a sketch of what, just as Aristotle does, only Aristotle doesn't do it jocularly, what political knowledge is revenue, food, bodies, gardening of the country. For reasons which uh, would be interesting to explore, Socrates does not mention legislation, which Aristotle mentions. But that is, uh, we can see. But to come back to one point, these are the, the two earliest statements of Socrates. One thing is striking. Both statements are silent on justice. I mean, I have read only excerpts what you would see in the Why then? The, does political science in the original sense have nothing to do with justice? Surely not. As Aristotle makes clear in the rhetoric, in the passage of rhetoric, political science has to do with legislation, and therefore with the distinction between good and bad laws. And here is the justice. Even in the case of war and peace, the question of justice comes in, as you see from any political debates, into civics. Yeah, but what so the, the true states, good statesman, must then have knowledge of justice. And that is presupposed. Yeah, but this knowledge is not far-fetched. Everyone has that. There are current opinions in Athens as well as today which tell us this. For example, there is no doubt that to steal, to cheat, to rob, to murder are unjust actions, regardless of what the law says. Behind it, to summarize it, justice consists in respecting what belongs to others. That is the point. To respect the other's property. 
Property means, of course, not mere possession. It's these fellows who collaborated with uh, this young man, uh, the policeman, and had in their possession radios, and so their property was always not their property. And so property means always lawful possession. So the respect for law, so that's clear, everyone. That says true even in Soviet Russia yesterday. The question is not the mood, question is only whether at the limits there may not be confiscatory law. And there is always a question, is confiscation by law not robbery in the form of law? That's a very important question. But still, for, that, uh, for the private man, there is no question. It is also clear that wrongdoing is to be punished, meaning that the guilty must be punished. And this implies proper judicial procedure. This, that proper judicial procedure may not be available, and that's a bad law. For example, people may think they find out the criminal the guilty by torture. And a little reflection shows that this is not the proper way, because uh, by torture, not your guilt or innocence is tested, but uh, your nerves, which is an entirely different proposition. And uh, so that torture is therefore an unreasonable, um, unreasonable mean. At the beginning of the Republic, you get a crude notion, also what we all as for justice, one part is paying debts, not implied in the very idea. You got something from another fellow with the understanding that you pay that. Clear. If you don't, you cheat. On this rule, there is based this grave problem of the relations of creditors and debtors, and which can lead to very grave political problems, as you know from Shea, as well as from Solon in Greek history. Implied is also something, a notion like a decent rate of interest if you blow money. A borrows a horse from B. He's not supposed to return two horses. But if he borrows money, an amount A, he, he may be supposed to return two A. It's not absurd. No absurd. So it, is that really then a problem? Is not interest altogether unjust? Long discussions in Aristotle, but they are based on common sense, you know, on our primary notions. Uh, borrowing cannot possibly mean uh, paying back much more than you took in the first place. Or take an other simple rule. First come, first served. The idea being, if everyone is equal, either absolutely or in a certain context, yeah? as customers, for example, then not all can be served at the same time. The fairest thing is, of course, to give him first who came first, because he took the trouble of getting up at four in the morning, and uh, there should be some proper relation between pain taken and rewards. That is a simple law of justice. Or other things. For, uh, for example, from everyone according to his obligation and to everyone according to his merits. On this is based that foreigners may have to pay heavier taxes than citizens because they invested, they have a much greater obligation. They are protected without military service, for example. Also, various degrees of punishment that you can't pay, punish petty theft as you can um, punish murder. And here, an important point comes in, important for the argument of the apology. What is the greatest punishment? According to the text. So what does, it, what does the legislator imply by making Punishment, ever making every punishment the greatest punishment? This is the greatest thing to ever have. So life is a very great good, if not the greatest good. Yeah. Life is a very great good and has to be protected by the laws. And you see how great, therefore, Socrates' questioning is whether life is such a good. If it is not a good, why should it be protected? Now, 
is this a mere assumption that life is a good or not? An arbitrary assumption. What does Socrates tell us about that? At least up to the point we have read hitherto. What does he say? Well, his daimonion tells him that the desire for keeping alive is a natural inclination, and therefore the legislator is right in uh, his notion that carbon punishment is a great punishment. But we must add that the impulse to life is not the only natural inclination. If it were the only natural inclination, virtue would be merely instrument. There could never be a question of sacrificing one's life being a virtuous act. Yeah? Virtue could only be vulgar virtue, as it is called in Plato's terminology, a merely instrument. Why? Uh, yeah, but still maybe that's a sound view. Maybe a, a, a simplistic utilitarianism is the only right view. Why can one not leave it at that? Why can one not leave it at the equation of virtue with vulgar virtue? At this point we go on. So that is, let us turn to 32, uh, 32C4, uh, where we left off last time. So he had spoken of his just conduct under the democracy. And that now it goes on. Later. And this happened by the city still was democratically ruled. But after the oligarchy came in, do you have that? Yeah. Read on. Yeah. This happened while the government was still democratic. And when the oligarchy came in, the 30 again summoned me and four others to the dome and ordered us to bring Leon of Salamis from Salamis, whom they meant to put to death. Such things did those people used often to do to others, wishing to make as many as possible share their guilt. Then, however, I showed again by acts, not by words, that as for death, if it is not too vulgar to use the expression, I cared not one jot. But all my anxiety was to do nothing unjust or wrong. That government... Unjust or, in, or unholy. Yeah. Uh, that government did not terrify me, strong as it was, into doing injustice. <clears throat> but when we came out of the dome, the other four went to Salamis and brought Leon, but I went away home. And perhaps I should have been put to death for that if the government had not been overthrown soon. You will find many witnesses of this. Yeah, thank you. He did not refer to witnesses when he spoke of his conduct in the assembly because that was a public event and this was more, more private. He refused to do something unjust again. Now, I mention here only one point. So that it indicates here that he is neither, uh, in these two sections, uh, he was neither a Democrat nor an adherent of the oligarchy. What is the alternative? Mystery. Yeah, but was a, but, uh, what was a, that you can say? But there is also a, a simpler term for that. Uh, the primary meaning of this. Uh, aristocracy. The rule of the best. Yes, the rule of the best. Why wasn't he a Democrat? Uh, you see what he said about the multitude uh, in, in 31 and 32 beginning. When the multitude rules, it is impossible to act just. Yeah, that's the market. Yeah. Even when they uh, uh, propose the laws or make the laws? Huh? Isn't he following the laws which were made by the... Yeah, but that, what he makes is that this is characteristic of the multitude when it gets hysterical. He disobeys or not. He doesn't go into this matter here, but uh, that is clear in line. So the aristocracy is the right thing. Rule of the best. But what is goodness? What is virtue? This shows the difficulty of the concept of virtue as merely instrumental. The aristocracy means the rule of the virtuous men who do not understand virtue as instrumental. 
had a choice for, the, for its own sake. Now, this, if followed up, which is not done in the apology, would lead to the broad notion of the political art, of the political science, which starts with the question, what is virtue? I.e., what is general virtue? This is Socrates' wisdom. He declines to possess the political art in the vulgar sense, in the democratic or oligarchic sense. He doesn't care for that. But if it were understood properly, then he has it. Now, I mention it in a little curiosity. We know from a contemporary orator that the man who brought Leon from Salamis to Athens was a guy called Meletos. Uh, and uh, uh, it is not certain that he is identical with the accuser, but it is an interesting suggestion that he might have been the same fellow. And how delicate of Socrates not to say so. In this, in this example, uh, is it possible for the oligarchy to make the law in such a way that whatever they say, uh, they well, I mean, is, is he following here a prior law? Uh, yeah, that is a very good question. That is developed by Xenophon in this discussion. In Xenophon, he says, he upholds the laws of Athens over against the 30 times. Yeah. So there was a prior law. Yeah, yeah, but the question is, of course, you see, that is one of, what shall I say, of the delicacies uh, of political life. And you find the similar things existed also in Nazi Germany and other places. This notion of the sanctity of the law implies that the laws are higher than any government. But a short reflection shows that laws depend on the government, because our laws are made by a legislative assembly, as a legislative assembly that is a regime, yeah? and always determined. And uh, that, that is, of course, underlying the title, where the notion of the sanctity of the laws is developed. Yeah? And uh, where the question lies, can the river rise higher than the source? If the laws are the laws of the demos, made by the demos, and the demos is as despicable as it is presented there, where does the sanctity of the democratic laws come from? The only consistent way of doing that would be to make a distinction between the martial law, which intrinsically antedates any law, yeah? and the merely possible. That's one way. But that is leads to the uh, surely. So this does not here refer to the laws in this kind, whereas he refers to the law in the democratic uh, manuscript of the democracy. That is uh, the rule of laws, which is a very good uh, uh, and persuasive term, it is also a very difficult term. You know, it, it conceals also great problems. Because laws never rule. I mean, this is a metaphoric expression. Laws uh, must be administered and applied. In the first place, they must be laid down. And that is, it, that, that is exactly where the political problem is distinguished from the legal problem. Now, here he says, if this immediate secret, be you left up. Uh, then do you think I should have survived all these years if I had engaged in public business? And if then I had acted as a good man should, and not and defend with the just, and made that as, as one's duty, my chief concern, far from yeah, that. Let me stop here. So that is did nothing unjust that was shown. But was he positively just? You see, he refused to comply with the unjust command of the talents, of the thirty talents. But he went home, he went home, that's all he did. He did not engage in an action to subvert these dirty fellows, as other patriotic Athenian citizens did. Was he not concerned with self-preservation rather than with positively doing the just things? This is a criticism you find it's developed in the first book of Cicero's Republic, where 
Cicero, or a part of Cicero, refers to the statement of Socrates that justice consists in not injuring others. Is this not too narrow a notion of justice? Does it not also include benefiting others? That's a problem. Now, as Mr. Gilden suggested last time, there seems the context shortly before the Daimonion was. The context suggests this. The Daimonion, is stated here, is merely negative. It keeps him from acting, keeps him back from injustice. Does it incite him to justice? And that seems to be denied. But one must also say that there is no explicit connection between the negative character of the demonia and the negative character of Socrates' action regarding justice. Negative action means avoiding injustice is not the full meaning of justice. He develops there in the sequence this theme, we don't have to read everything. So that it did not make anyone unjust. He takes the absolute theme of corrupting the young. He did not teach anyone anything. This is written implication. He did not teach Srepsiades or Fidibides in the clouds. Nor did he teach Alcibiades. The, the great uh, evil under the democracy, or Critias, the great evil under the oligarchy. If something, uh, someone listening to him became unjust, Socrates cannot be blamed for that, because that cannot be traced to Socrates' teaching. Yeah? Uh, there were other sources of corruption around. And now let us read here a point. In uh, that is in 33b at the end. So Socrates do, does not, did not corrupt anyone, any young man. But why did the young man come to him and enjoy being together with him? <laughs> because if he did not corrupt them, that's a job. Now, do you have to why do some people enjoy spending much time with me? But why ever do some people enjoy spending a great deal of time with me? Yeah. You have heard why, gentlemen. I have told you the whole truth. They enjoy hearing men cross-examined who think they are wise and are not. Indeed, that is not unpleasant. You know, this topic is not unpleasant. So they are not attracted so much by Sugatis' admonitions to virtue, but they are amused. They are not unpleasant. You remember the previous description? Sugares buttonholing, all and sundry. Yeah? Virtue. Did you hear virtue? And yet there is a small group of men who, spending, who are spending much time with them. The others, only buttonholes, don't spend much time with them. And they spend much time with them and like it. What did they like? Listening to Socrates' sermons exhorting virtue, is this pleasant? Then, is this pleasant? No. They like to listen to Socrates' examining, for this was not unpleasant. That is the slight understanding. Yeah. Now let us reflect here for one moment on what this analysis throws on Socrates. The key thesis of the apology. Socrates has only human wisdom, no true wisdom. And this wisdom consists in knowledge of his ignorance. He makes others aware of their blindness, and of course he himself is aware of his blindness. And what does this mean to become aware of one's blindness? That is not naturally meant bodily blindness. Where there was formerly a content yeah, thought to be true, there is now nothing. A blank, as if, in the most important thing. What is the result of that? If the things which you regard as the most important things, of which you were absolutely sure it appeared, you know nothing about them. The most important things. What is the result on any normal human being of that? Despair can't be different. Despair, everything breaks down. 
when nothing of the kind is mentioned here, what happens? The activity here is not unpleasant. How come? How can this be the How can this be not unpleasant? How can this be pleasant? Knowledge of ignorance means, as here indicated, you know, to examine this fellow. This is a rhetorician. This is a shoemaker. This is a physician, and so on and so on. What is that? Well, one little thing. This ignorance is not the same in all cases. For example, if you take a, a, a pompous ass, yeah, so on. But then you take a very simple man, it's not pretentious anyway, but without knowing it, he raises enormous claims. What he all knows. Yeah. A kind, simply, I mean, a kind of, there can also be pretentiousness in seeming simplicity. But they are two different phenomena. And you can go on. You discover various kinds of ignorance. In discovering these various kinds of ignorance, you discover the human soul. That is psychology, the original sense of the term. But as knowledge of the human soul, it is not knowledge of nothing, obviously. If we enlarge that, knowledge of the human soul, knowledge of the soul, that means, according to Plato, uh, and the highest level, what is soul? Well, uh, soul is that which makes a living being a living being, which enables the being to have the principle, the origination of motion in itself. Let me leave it for the moment, this is uh, not exact. But which, what beings are the most astonishing from this kind of having the principle of motion in themselves, which moves not by being pushed and pulled on the common sense level. Thinking about the soul, there emerges a revised astronomy. No longer the astronomy of Anaxagoras, which said they are inanimate things, earth and uh, stone, but they are animate because they have a principle of motion in themselves. But all this, of course, is not even alluded in the apology. <coughs> The apology of Socrates is perfectly compatible with Socrates being the Socrates of the clouds without strepsiones. Sure. Why is strepsiones completely incompatible with the Socrates of the apology? I mean, really in a, in a hard-headed, practical way. What would have prevented the strepsiones affair according to the apology, rightly then. The daimonion, the demonic thing in Socrates would have told him, no, no, that's not a good company. But this cautious element in the daimonion of which I spoke before. And Socrates makes a great blunder of not considering Socrates daimonion. But more than that, so let us assume that for one moment Socrates has a kind of astronomy, whatever that may be. That would not be enough. He must also do something. Socrates could not have merely secluded himself, because then it would have also, of course, never have come to the trial. If he had stayed at home and, look at, and uh, walked the air there without anyone knowing it, that would not have any, any consequence. Socrates did not seclude himself. The apology says he very simply. But admonished people to vulgar virtue, to let me to this uh, instrumental virtue. Now, <laughs> the burden of Aristoteles' uh, attack on Socrates was while astronomy, the study of the things alone, is 
the basis of wisdom. This is insufficient for full wisdom because the astronomer falls into the ditch, you know, famous, falling, look at the sun. It lacks self knowledge, it lacks the reflection on the meaning of astronomy in the human context. And that means especially also in the political context, context of political society. This additional thing, which is a capstone of this, is supplied by the Aristophany comedy, where this blindness of the mere astronomer is correct. In the light of the apology, one could make the suggestion that Plato says in this sphere, no, not comedy is needed, something much better. What Socrates does, or is presented as buttonholing everyone, like Uncle Sam and the posters, you know? <laughs> I, but uh, by only saying, did you take care of your soul today? Like, did you uh, brush your teeth today? This is extremely comical, this part. In brief, what I suggest is this. The very comical suggestion of the apology is this. The astronomy quotes, study of the things aloft, which may also mean the ideas, must be tapped by a comical activity, not by comedy. In Plato's laws, he finds these remarks on there. They throw out a tragedy. Tragedy is thrown out. It's this reason. We ourselves, legislators, philosophers, are the authors of the fairest tragedy. One can say it is perfect justice. Throw out comedy. We, so it is, are the authors of the fairest comedy. What, the, what Socrates does to the non philosophers, that is genuine and that is serious, no question about it. But it cannot but be comic from the highest point. Now, let us go on from here, where we left off. Uh, it is not unpleasant, he said. Yes, he said. Oh. So, in other words, it is not... He, 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 he doesn't call up the young. But on the other hand, he is also not uh, uh, preaching uh, virtue or the time. Yeah? Uh, uh, but uh, he does something which is pleasing, which is uh, enjoyable, <coughs> which is uh, amusing. Yes. I want to maintain that I have been commanded by the gods to do this, through oracles and dreams, and in every way which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. This gentleman is both true and easy to test. No, no, no. So that his case is different from these people who enjoy that. So that his did not enjoy it. Yeah. Socrates obeys the divine injunction. Not indeed the demonic thing in him, because this is an injunction to act, to do so. But he owes it to oracles and dreams and all other forms of such instruction. Now, and then he goes on, continuing and concluding in the way the corruption charge. If Socrates has corrupted anyone, of souls with whom he converts. Let him get up and say so. And he says, no one will come up. There was never a Phidippides whose father strapped Zionists must say, you have corrupted my son. It doesn't exist. He mentions seven of them by name. And that, uh, I mean, I am not, uh, one thing is, on, I, mean, I do not understand uh, all this, but one thing I would like uh, to mention. He mentions first uh, people who might have been corrupted by him whose fathers are. And then he mentions others and possibly corrupted by him whose brothers are. Now, let us begin with the brothers. Uh, with the costados, yeah? The costados, and then Adalios, and then the last one. And here is Adiamantos, the son of Aristotle. 
the Adamandus whom you will know from the Republic, yeah? whose brother here, Plato, yeah? and Ayatadoros, whose brother here is Apollodorus. You see what Plato does? He brings himself into a special sort of company. Do you know who Apollodorus was? He was a silly follower. Yeah. Yeah, a silly, enthusiastic follower of Apollodorus. And that is, a con so to say, the most silly and the least silly are brought together, but in the form as if they would be exactly the same thing. Yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah. I wonder about the soundness of that argument, since uh, they, the ones he has to stand up are, are already standing there accusing him, and it's had such a son. Yeah, but uh, how do you know that the accusers had been, uh, they or their sons had been corrupted by so many? Well, they thought so. I mean, uh, yeah, but their own son. They, they spoke of, of some uh, young men who had been corrupted. Young Amethyst. Pardon? Amethyst's son. Yeah, but uh, was he corrupted? I mean, did he have anything to do with What was it? Xenophon speaks about it. Yeah. What, what was that? Well, apparently he had spent some time with Socrates, and uh, he ended up a drunkard for some reason. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he may have been down from Socrates. Well, his father attributes that to Socrates. Pardon? His father attributes that to Socrates. Yeah, but you can watch it. I mean, and it's right. elaborate. Socrates admitted that the father educating the boy in the tanner's trade wasn't doing him justice. And he, he switches the blame to the father. But the Socrates was somehow responsible for the boy's break with the father and break with the tanning trade and consequent alcoholism. Yeah. Uh, Seeing him through it. Yeah. Even. Uh, well, uh, what, what uh, should we say then? You know, as you would say there may have been quite a few uh, people around, fathers and older brothers, who could have said, you corrupted, you have corrupted my son or my younger brother. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. How to specifically that. here, one was standing there that this, this business, if anyone has had such an experience, stand up. This is the point. They, they are standing there already. I see. I mean, that raises all together, that's connected with this general question, because Socrates makes this claim that he's walking through the, cities of Athens, the streets of Athens all the time and he's buttonholing people. And somehow that doesn't sound plausible. That does not be sort of fact. How can Socrates be presented to say these things to the jury? Yes? Well, that's a real difficulty. It's a whole joke, yeah. Uh, one point I was wondering now is that I could see how you know, my no father would want to come up and say that his son was corrupted. Yeah, that is one point. Do you mean for sheer shame? Yes, he might want to point out someone else's son that was corrupted, but Socrates didn't count he asks for that. I see. That's, that's a good point. So yeah. would this won't prove for brothers. Pardon? But this won't prove for brothers necessarily, as much as her father's possible. Oh, yes. I mean, as long as it's a real connection. Do you have a brother? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, would you like to admit in public that he has been his father? No. Yeah, that's a good point, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Maybe. Yes? I a question on the subject of the demonium. You said that it's a natural capacity uh, and refer to it as eros. But it seems to be, on the one hand, a moving principle, and on the other hand, something inherent that is in, in people. And in the presentation of the demonium, in the variety, it seems, is, pre is presented as a, a halting, a cautionary principle, and is also presented as coming from outside, a voice of some sort. I'm wondering if, if you can explain this. On the you know, that is a, I mean, the voice that is meant to be establish some connection with oracles, yeah, coming outside. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is, uh, is never... It, is it necessarily oracle or merely something, something divine? Yeah, but a voice is... A, 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 a voice would mean something else than the individual addresses. Yeah, and that connects it with the oracle. Now, as for the other point you raised, it is this. 
the effect is only keeping back, caution. But what is the root for that? I mean, the, the self, as we indicate by the word self-preservation, the self is already there, it has only to be preserved. Yeah, whereas the case of Eros, directed toward generation, is towards something which is not yet there. To explain it. And uh, it is clear that that um, and the other point, which the third point you know, I should mention is this, every human being has natural inclinations, but very few, if any ex apart from Sotheby's, have the daimonium. And I think I spoke of that last time. It means that in the case of Sugarness, the natural instincts, as it would be called in modern times, were unusually powerful. Sugarness had a physis, a nature, which in every respect fitted him for the philosophic life. I mean, not only the amazing memory and the, and the quick mind and all the other things which he had, but also his whole the control of the higher over the Lord. So that he could drink in the yeah? The mind was unbreakable. And similarly, the instinct, who is fit and who is not fit, yeah? you know, and also that he has the instinct of finding out who is fit for whom. And this guy should go to Gorgias, and that should go to Protagoras, and this should become a mathematician. Yeah, an intuitive certainty. Intuitive. That is all implied. I think it is, uh, it is not an impossible task to develop this, the doctrine of Socrates Daimonia on the basis of Plato with perfect clarity. And as I said, the dialogue theatres, this despised thing, is one a very major source because it explains the connection, which no other dialogue does, between Daimonion and Eros. It's the same thing, only different way. But not Eros is also a common phenomenon. But to be so radically erotic, to be so incredibly sensitive to the beautiful and ugly in the soul, yeah? that is a kind of miracle. So let us have that. That's a claim. Which, uh, uh, and therefore, so as when he says that he has only one car, the erotic car, that means that. And uh, indescribable sensitivity to human differences. It, um, I still don't think, it seems to me that it's presented again and again. I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the passage in the theater, so I couldn't comment very knowledgeably on it. It seems that it's presented as coming from outside. Yeah, sure. This word, this word yeah. is really a mass. Yeah, but you must not forget the, the general formula which I suggest. In the apologies, the ceiling is very low. And uh, everything is presented as close to the common understanding as possible. <coughs> and whatever transcends that common understanding remains in clouds. Yeah. <laughs> that is not, uh, perhaps not all the other. So this goes on. Uh, he speaks of his refusal to beg for mercy, a theme to which he returns more. He, he is so far from begging for mercy that he incites his judges to anger against him by the way in which he refuses to beg for mercy. That was mentioned in the paper last time. Now let us look only at what uh, and as 34 d Where do you have that? Then if any one of you feels like that, yeah? Do you have that? Then if any one of you feels like that, I do not in the least expect it, but if he does, I may fairly say to him, my good sir, I do have relatives of my own somewhere. For to quote Homer, no stick or stone is the origin of me, but humanity. So I have relatives and sons too, gentlemen, three of them. What a young man already. Two still children. Yeah. By the way, I do not want to go into the question of Sugar's sons, 
because it is a test case for Socrates' concern with educating to common virtues. So they say we're not in any way outstanding. You see, in the famous argument which Socrates uses, if Pericles had had the political art, you know, he, he would have, uh, his sons would be excellent too. You know? You know, and then it applies, uh, and his sons were notorious nobody. The same applies <coughs> identically to Socrates himself. Uh, I, that leads, would lead us to far. But who is uh, this quote from Homer? Who says it to whom? That uh, says, You are not a, who, you, what is your origin? You are not a descendant from an oak nor from a rock. According to the to the quote from Bond, this is where Odysseus came back and uh, was a uh, guard and this guy believed the shepherd and spoke to his wife. It's Penelope, his wife, says it to Odysseus. So in other words, Sogalus appears here in the role of Odysseus yeah, at this point. I wanted to make this clear only because Sogalus is Achilles, you remember? Earlier, and it's a trifle again. But here, for a second, without any reference to the name of Odysseus, reveals himself as an artist. Then, uh, a little bit later, yeah, uh, speaking of the disgraceful character of begging for mercy and so on, he says, now, if those of uh, you who are, uh, in, are reputed to be outstanding in wisdom or in manliness or in any other virtue would be such and such, it would be, a uh, would act such a way, it would be a disgrace. You see, wisdom and courage are here mentioned, and they are also mentioned in other passages. As far as I can see, moderation is never mentioned in the apology, and that uh, would require some understanding. And I think also not in the title, but I have not, uh, I mean, I have not a complete statistic, so I can't say that. Now let us read a bit later, the next paragraph here in line the edition of the original, and it will probably be here too. Where, where was it? 35, uh, Page 441, uh, top. Apart from reputation, gentlemen, it does not seem to be right to entreat the judge, or to be acquitted by entreaty. One should instruct and persuade him. For why does the judge sit? Not to make a gracious gift of justice by favor, but to decide what is just. And he has sworn not to show favor as may please him, but to judge according to law. Then we must not get you into the habit of breaking that oath, nor must let you yourselves fall into that habit. One is as bad as the other in the sight of heaven. Then do not demand, gentlemen, that I should do before you such things as I hold either honorable or just or permissible, most especially by Zeus, for one who is prosecuted for impiety by the latest here. Let me stop here. You see, the fee charge was impiety. But the other point which I would like to mention, there are three uh, reasons, three <coughs> grounds to which it refers. The honorable, as it has said, the noble or beautiful, the just, and the pious are holy, yeah? Where does the noble or honorable come in? Well, that is to which it referred at the beginning of what you read, apart from the reputation. It is unworthy to beg. Where does the pious or holy come in? <coughs> That's made very clear. The oath, they have sworn. So the central consideration is justice. And this we must keep in mind for the sense of the Justice is the central thing of the seek. But before, I will mention only this point in advance so that you will. In the sequel, Sugares, let me, after the condemnation, when Sugares is asked to make a proposal for God's punishment, he states first what he regards is just, a just retribution to him. And then he deviates from that in deference to the opinion of the jury, 
that he must not be rewarded but punished. So it's deviates from the just openness that comes there. One word about the question of so it is, is the science on moderation. Last time in the paper, Mr. Sandringer emphasized the provocative character of Sugar's speech. The insolence of that speech, insolence, hubris, is the opposite of moderation. So that is the connection. Now, that's the end of the apology proper. Then he is condemned. He is declared to be guilty if the question is only one punishment. And otherwise, uh, he again uh, reiterates his belief in God uh, in a sense in which uh, none of my accusers does. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but the question is belief is not knowledge. Yeah. And in addition, you, the, what the God means is absolutely undetermined. That may very well mean Apollo. Well, that is undecided. I mean, the translator, as I say, they put God into, capitalize it or put it with, with small letters as they see fit. But uh, there is no such distinction. Since it's ambiguous, and it's ambiguous earlier, too, in references to that, when he says he, he assists the God, isn't it possible that he's referring not to Apollo, which which might have been taken by the average person listening, but to the God that he really... Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah but the question, absolutely, but the question is then this. Surely, I mean, and that was often understood in almost classical times, by Christian writers and so on, and so that it could not speak of the one God in the pagan world, yeah? and therefore there is a certain circumlocution I mean, there are many places where he suddenly goes over from the plural to the gods to the one god. Yeah, but the question is, apart from beliefs, how does he know? There is one developed argument, there is also a clear indication in the Sophist, but one developed argument in Plato's writings. How he knows that there is a God or there are God in the temple of the laws. And that is taken from the phenomenon of motion, just as in this respect, just as in Aristotle. There are the Masvetas in this the God are part of motus, part of motion. Only the arguments, the details are very different. But that means uh, at least first to the cosmic gods, the, the stars, and beyond them to uh, the center, beyond them, yeah? so the one god. But there is, Pedro was not a monotheist. I mean, uh, um, uh, he may, may have been a henotheist, that we would say, not one outstanding god, and he was not a monotheist. Yeah, but they are the cosmic gods. And the apology is perfectly compatible with uh, this. You, you remember when the discussion of Aristomenes evolved to Anaxagoras came. And the question of the Olympic gods, the gods worshipped by the city, is very important. Because Melitone said, fool, it says you are complete atheist. And then somebody <coughs> says, well, and then you mean that I do not even recognize the gods which are recognized by all men, sun, moon. And then uh, he says, no, you have said uh, they are fire and uh, they are stone and earth. I said, well, who said that? Uh, said that. I know. Because this is not excluded that so that is of the apology and maybe the cosmic gods. Well, then uh, could it have been... And, 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 and the top of the cosmic gods, the ruler of the universe. Could it have been then uh, the ruler of the cosmic gods who commanded him as he says in a number of places, to uh, yeah, but, uh, do what he did. Yeah, but the, what he said, uh, that the commandment of which he speaks is traced to the David of not true. Well, well, since he refers ambiguously to the God, yeah, well, uh, in a, then, then what he had in mind, 
All right, but then how would that cosmic, highest cosmic world come out there? By the soul, yeah, right? If there's a soul, the soul constructed that it tends toward knowledge. That you can say. But one point I must emphasize, throughout the apology, the sugar is says he is ignorant of the most of the greatest things, that he does not know the greatest That is compatible with believing. Yeah? That's the apology. That remains. Now, as I said, we are here at the end of the apology proper. So that is the question guilty or innocent is answered the question is guilty. And there is some little thing which is quite interesting at the beginning of that, if you will read that. You are voting for my condemnation, gentlemen, that. And if I am not resentful of this, which has been done, many things contribute to that, and particularly that I expected this to be done, which has been done. Indeed, I am much rather surprised at the actual number of votes on either side. I did not expect the voting to be so close. I thought there would be a large majority, but now, as it seems, if only 30 votes had been changed, I should have been acquitted. Even now, to my mind, I have been acquitted of Malekos. And not only have I been acquitted, but this indeed is clear to everyone, that if Anatos and Micah had not joined in accusing me, he would have been liable to a fine of a thousand drachmas if he did not get the fifth part of the vote. Yeah. Now, that is... It's a little arithmetical problem. And as far as I can see, the commentators started the interpretation from a report in Diogenes Laertius, according to which 281 condemned Socrates and 220 acquitted him. But uh, that is not obligatory, uh, Diogenes Laertius. We have to figure that out ourselves. We must do. Now, I, see, uh, I try to figure it out and in the following way. Now, the question is how many votes altogether, that's not said. Let us call it X and then figure it out. How many <coughs> condemned and how many acquit? In other words, we must try to get an equation uh, with one unknown <laughs> and then figure it out. Uh, who is particularly trained in mathematics here? Yeah. <laughs> 30 makes the difference, yeah? Uh, yeah? And half x plus 30 and a half x minus 30. Yeah, absolutely. That's one part of the equation. But uh, so x half plus 30. Or well, if you can go ahead, x half minus 30. But that doesn't do the equation. We get the equation if we take into consideration the other observation. What does it say? Melitus, yeah. They got only one fifth. About, about, it's not quite exact. Now there are three equations. Three fifths. So I think one must. That's an equation, yeah? You know? Now figure it out. You see what you get? Yeah? Well, I get 300 uh, yeah. as a maximum. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends. It cannot be quite exact because he says something, yeah? Uh, he qualifies it a bit. Where, uh, he says something uh, which qualifies it because the numbers are not quite exact, but you, you arrive at the base of the equation of 300. And as far as I have been able to look up, it's perfectly compatible that the jury could have considered of 300. Uh, I cannot solve this problem by Plato gave us this little arithmetical problem here. Uh, I cannot solve that, but it is clearly uh, not 500. It's essential that we can try to figure it out. I note on this as a, for, for the moment, as a mere curiosity. But I have never seen that Plato uh, makes curiosities merely for the sake. At least shows that it could come and could uh, present an arithmetical problem. And so they did not choose 
Is there unknown or the X as we do? If they would have done it probably in some form of proportion, I do not know that. Yeah, uh, let, let us leave it at this curiosity. And let us, yeah, we have to, uh, we will not be able to uh, finish our discussion of their quality, but uh, we, uh, let us read only the sequel a bit. Well, a man asks for the penalty of death. Good. And what penalty shall I propose against this government? A proper penalty is for sure. But what is that? What is proper for me to suffer or to pay for not having the sense to be idle in my life or for neglecting what most people care of, money making and housekeeping and military appointments and oracle? And besides, all the posts and plots and parties which arise in the city for believing myself to be really too honest to go after these things and survive. Yeah, but uh, yeah, to honest is perhaps a bit weak. The term me can mean equit equitable. It means also to noble. The reason why Socrates led an entirely unpopular life was not self-preservation, according to this thing, but contempt for the political life. It's a very strong statement. And it is perhaps not an accident that he says this after the condemnation. This wouldn't be limited to a democracy alone, I would say. I mean, like in the other mm -hmm. stage, he speaks about the multitude. You know, I think that he, he uh, that he, he yeah, well, in any except in aristocracy proper, which uh, is a question that had ever existed. Um, the function, yeah. We can perhaps link this up with the daimonion and self-preservation remark in the earlier. The function of the daimonion is not so much self-preservation, that is on the lowest level, as arrows. And arrows, according to the Platonic understanding, is vertical, goes up to the house. And therefore it implies the content for the law. Now we go on. I did not go where I thought I should be of no use, either to you or to myself. But I went where I hoped I might benefit each man separately, with the greatest possible benefit, as I declare. I tried to persuade each one of you to take care of himself first, and how he could become most good and most wise, before he could care for any of his interests, and to take care of the state herself first, before he took care of any of her interests that in other things also this was the proper order of his care. Then what do I deserve, since I am such as that? Something good, gentlemen. If I am to make the estimate what it ought to be in truth, and further, something good which, ought, which would be suitable for me. Something good, and we must add, and therefore not dead. Yeah. Then, what is suitable for a poor benefactor who craves to have leisure for your encouragement? Nothing Maybe for your encouragement to virtue. Yeah. Nothing, gentlemen, is so suitable <coughs> as that such a man should be boarded free in the town hall, which he deserves much more than any one of you who has gained the prize at Olympia with a pair of horses or a foreign hand. For this one makes you seem to be happy, but I make you be happy. And he is not in one for food, but I am. And his stomach. You see, Sunday is always eats his meat for food considerably, doesn't he? He lives in 10,000 words already. But it looks as if fantastic claim. Sunday is, is the one who makes the Athenians blessed. Happy is a, a big, big translation with a Greek word for a gun. He is responsible for the greatest benefit. No wonder that he looks down on the political life. I mean, no, no general, the general is in between this prize winner and so on. As you know, that's not the highest thing. Yeah. <clears throat> what would then be a just retribution for so Yes. And he says this to, to be um, entertained in the Britannia, say the town. Yeah? Go on. Perhaps you think that in saying this, 
very much as I spoke of appeals for pity. Well, before you didn't you hear it? Oh. Well, then, if I must estimate the just penalty according to my deserts, this is my estimate. Free born in the town of Hall. Yeah, that's a just, that would be a just retribution to get now. Perhaps you think that in saying this, very much as I spoke of appeals for pity, I am just showing off. No such thing, gentlemen. I will tell you what I mean. I am convinced that I never willingly wrong anyone. And let me stop you for a moment. As soon as he's first stated what is a just retribution, and then he says, it's an almost so many words, that he will deviate from the just in deference to the multitude. In a very strict sense, he commits an unjust act. He deviates from the strict <coughs> Yes. But I cannot convince you. No, yeah, I am convinced that. Uh, I am convinced that I never willingly wrong anyone, but I cannot convince you. But we have conversed together only a short time. If we had a law, as other people have, that the trials for life or death is to be spread over many days. Yeah, it's, excuse me, is this we have not conversed a long time, a short time. We did not have a conversation, a dialogue. <laughs> Except for short time. The apology is a dialogue. A dialogue with a demos. The only dialogue with a demos. But it is as dialogic, in the deeper sense of the word, as any other person in dialogue. A dialogue being a conversation where the speaker adapts his speech to the capacity of the Addressed. Yeah. And then, uh, yes. If we have a law, as other people have, that a trial for life or death is to be spread over many days and not confined to one, I think you would have been convinced. But as see, it is. I, I know it's this point, and I think we leave it with it. Okay. So, what I suggest is that the Athenian law is bad. Criticize the Athenian in a crude way, that's also an act of injustice. You ought to comply with the law, you know, to criticize it. Yeah, I think we have to stop here. Because uh, it, it is clear that the true retribution is inacceptable. And so this must therefore postpone a punishment. And therefore the question arises, what is an evil? What is an evil? This question of the greatest things, knowledge of the greatest things, comes up again. We will see here that in the, in the secret we learn that prison is a true evil. Whether death is an evil has remained uncertain. But prison is a true evil. Why is it true even, according to that statement? Because freedom is a good, and that is connected with Socrates' earlier remark, you know, this proud remark. It would be beneath me to do that. Freedom in the simple sense, where it means that you are not pre prevented from circulation, is akin to freedom in the inner, higher sense not to be dependent in your thoughts on the opinion of other people. And therefore, uh, freedom is really the freedom and this kind of pride one that, that comes out uh, in this, uh, especially in this part. But we have then, uh, to, uh, next time we will discuss the rest of the apology, and if we have still time, as I'm reasonably sure, we will read the paper. And it was as soon as I arrived, we read it, and the three other gentlemen will hand in the paper. And in the papers.
to the discussion of the Kraito. There are three famous views of the Kraito. That's one. Good. And then there is Mr. Schrock, who is not yet here. And then there is Rabbi Weiss, who is supposed to read the paper. But at any rate, that still has some time. Now let us first conclude the discussion of the apology. We were in the middle, or at the end, of the, of the set of speech after the condemnation, but before the precise punishment was established, that was the procedure. Now, there is a, that would be on page 432 of the apology. Yeah, in the second paragraph of 442. The context to the so is is condemned. The punishment proposed by the accuser is death, but that is still to be decided. So is is allowed, according to Athenian law, to make a counter-proposal. And the counter-proposal first was what so is deserves according to justice. That would be a signal honor and not punishment. But then, of course, Socrates knows that this is not feasible. And so he deviates from the just and he makes proposes what is something which would be generally regarded as a punishment. And this is uh, a perfect place we stop by time. Now, if I think if someone would just begin on page 442 the paragraph. Perhaps you think me stubborn and arrogant? Yeah. Perhaps you think me stubborn and arrogant in what I am saying now, as in what I said about the entreaties and tears. It is not so, Athenian. It is rather that I am convinced that I never wronged any man voluntarily, though I cannot persuade you of that since we have worked together only a little time. If there were a law at Athens, as there is elsewhere, not to finish a trial of life and death in a single day, I think that I could have persuaded you, but now it is not easy in so short a time to clear myself of great prejudices. But when I am persuaded that I have never wronged them in any man, I shall certainly not wrong myself, for I admit that I deserve to suffer any evil or propose any evil for myself as penalty, why should I? Lest I should suffer the penalty which Miletus proposes when I say that I do not know whether it is a good or an evil. Shall I choose instead of it something which I know to be an evil and propose that as a penalty? Shall I propose imprisonment? And why should I pass the rest of my days in prison, a slave of successive officials? Or shall I propose a fine? with imprisonment until it is paid. I have told you why I will not do that. I should have to remain in prison, for I have no money to pay a fine with. So prison and fine would be the same as prison, yes? Yeah. Shall I then propose exile? Perhaps you would agree to that. Life would indeed be very dear to me. Now let us perhaps stop here for the time being and then go on. So uh, to be then, the reward the Soros proposes is inacceptable. He must propose a punishment, an evil. He cannot propose death for the simple reason that he does not know whether death is an evil. You see? And so he must propose something which he knows to be an evil. Soros knows that prison, fine, and banishment would be evils. First of all, Prison and fine would be, a uh, fine is reduced to prison, yeah, because he can't pay. So uh, why is prison an evil answer? Because it means deprivation of freedom. Freedom. Freedom, wealth, and exile are, um, uh, freedom, wealth, and being at home are good things. And this made clear the case of prison, why that is an evil. Because to be subject, a slave to someone else, is an evil. Now, from here we understand also why death is not simply good. Because life without freedom 
and of complete destitution and in exile may be more miserable than death. That's another consideration. But there is another point which uh, we must understand. So it says, first, I have never voluntarily injured or hurt or done injustice to a man. And later on, he, a little bit later, he says, I have never injured uh, or done injustice to anyone. The latter is a much larger claim. He is not even involuntarily or unwittingly injured or done injustice to another man. Yeah, but what about Sokolov's famous claim that no one does voluntarily do evil? Do you remember? That all sins are due to ignorance and therefore involuntary. That creates some, a certain difficulty. What solution would you suggest? Well, there is one very simple solution that Socrates very frequently shifts from one level to the other. And there is, of course, a common sense level in which one can and must speak of deliberate murder, let me say, yeah? and malice of forethought and, and uh, an involuntary homicide. So the, that is uh, always possible to say that uh, Socrates speaks uh, sometimes simply commonsensically, but also sometimes uh, on a deeper level where, uh, where uh, the two levels are that of the political life, which stands and falls by punishment, and a deeper reflection which makes questionable the political life because if punishment is impossible, if all errors, all sins, all crimes are involuntary, there cannot be punishment. There can only be instruction. Yeah. You see, that throws light on our present discussion because present-day liberalism is an attempt to bring out on the political level what, according to Sugar's point of view, cannot be brought out of the political level. You know? Do you see it in this case? Or is this intelligible, what I said? You mean liberalism is social science? Which yeah, I mean, uh, let's forget about, so, I mean, uh, liberalism is a much broader thing than social science. It's not simply identical. No, but you know the people who really, in fact, deny responsibility and try to trace any uh, criminal action or criminal inclination to uh, something beyond the control of the individual. Yeah. You know that and that is of course underlying all attempts to uh, reduce punishment or to make it more less and less punitive and more and more rehabilitative in that case. Yeah. There, there is something which that has in common with the best Yeah. But only for Sugares there is this crucial difference between uh, Sugares implies that if you make an application of a profound truth to political matters, you have to modify that profound truth. It cannot be politically true, while it, that I use now Burke's well-known expression, in proportion as these things are metaphysically true, they are politically untrue. That is, I think that's really a crucial difference because um, the whole notion that there can be a wholly rational society, all of whose members are enlightened men, yeah. is the background of liberalism. I mean, there are very few liberals who would assert it in this way, but that's somehow the background. If for Sugaris, so that's impossible. A police a society is necessarily not enlightened. Only a very small part of it can be enlightened. The police as a whole is not enlightened. And therefore, the metaphysical truths, if you can, can call it that way, are not susceptible of being directly, immediately, politically relevant, politically true. Is that, uh, I mean, that is, uh, you know that the apology is one of the favorite documents of a certain, more, uh, certain generous uh, liberals. Yeah? And that is, that is not entirely unfounded, but we must also see the difference. Mr. Kendrick? Why does he share? Why does he make the share? Why does he cover himself a little better? I mean, this argument, if he 
never voluntarily harms anyone, he can't be punished. If he never harms anyone, he can't be punished. Yeah, that, that is a different question. Yeah. yeah. Because that is not a question whether regarding all men, but Socrates in particular. Is it, I mean, that's an entirely different issue than the one we discussed up to now. Is this clear to you? Because someone who is one doesn't have to say that no one voluntarily does evil in order to say this individual never voluntarily did it. That's clear. That's a special case. Now, so what was your question then? Why does why does he need more part? He makes use here only of one argument, namely the guy himself. It's this, in this connection, where the question is of his punishment, he says, am I guilty? He has to answer this question. And he says, no, I am not guilty. But the peaches them something, and something, at least that they weren't for sure before, and we're not sure if social or no. But this, in a way, places them under tutelage, which could be translated as, as a deprivation of liberty, could it not? And in this sense, uh, You are very liberal, I believe. <laughs> I mean, is then in other words, to go well, home, no, more reasonable is it's a deprivation, pardon? That's how I stand. I know, but it sounds so. It, but I think, I believe, very few people <laughs> implied before you that to become more sensible is a deprivation of liberty. This is the way these people react. I mean, I mean they're angry about something, and they're not really doing it. Yeah, but is it not, I mean, you may be right, but uh, that would need some argument. What is their first reaction? I mean, if we take seriously what he said, that's an uh, accusation of impiety. And Socrates, therefore, is accused uh, not of having interfered with the, the freedom of anyone, but with having violated the most sacred. Yeah? How do you go on from here? Where does the interference with freedom come? Freedom is understood by these people in, in a very simple way that anyone who would deprive them of their voting rights and their other civic rights uh, would uh, be, a, uh, you know, he would be accused of, of it being a, uh, a tyrant or potential tyrant. Uh, that was not suggested in any way. Or do you mean to say that to the extent of service implies that the only one who really deserves to have civic rights is a wise man. To that extent, he makes an attack on their liberty. Did you mean that? Um. In other words, it, 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 that would be would that would be defensive position. Also, if you think of the other Platonic dialogues, to the extent to which Socrates says. Only the experts can judge. Yeah? Well, there's a problem because it was along the same lines. He says that he is also under a tutelage, I mean, at least from the gods. The yeah, but uh, still, this tutelage is the same. He says it's a very high freedom. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what, what do you imply then? What do you understand that freedom? Well, uh, well, all I can say is that it's sort of a negative description of there is such a thing. It is not anything else. No, but, but honestly, no, I think what you say is it's very important. Although I use the formulas which you have found here too, I'm not, not clear about it. I mean, it does not every freedom presuppose a previous bondage to say the right thing? Is it, can freedom be the first person? Can be. That's a very good question. You see, I mean, in, in order, for example, if you take a very common hold of you, then there are certain natural rights of the basic freedom. Now, there are the rights, I mean, I think now I'm not uh, certain extremists, but more commonly, there are the rights of the previous natural bond.
you will get these freedoms as a gift. As a gift, not something that you can claim. And I know that modern libertarianism has a tendency to conceive of freedom as the beginning, as the absolute beginning of any moral argument. But that creates great difficulties. Sooner or later, you have to make a distinction between freedom and license, for example. Now, you can, of course, say, you can try to make a distinction as follows. And what you can try to say, freedom implies the obligation to recognize that same freedom in every other man. Freedom means an order in which the freedom of all is License means a claim to freedom not limited as a recognition of the same freedom of that one can try to do. But is it not, not so that if man is a free being, if man is a free being, and has he made that freedom? Has he made that freedom? Is this freedom not? And even if you say, as some people say, we conquered freedom, originally we are brutes, yeah, and um, some sort of higher monkeys, and we made ourselves free with our own efforts. But even a grand requirement was this capacity which the monkeys do not process. And not something with, with which may be started, which he did not acquire. Maslow always presupposed some quote gift. I mean, I, 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 you know, right? You can take this in a lot of expression as the basis of anything which man can then do, acquire, uh, etc. I would like to know me your. I mean, what was the specific point and concept of it which introduced you for this question? Uh, yeah, the question is um, uh, uh, generation of freedom being truly a punishment in a target, given freedom in, in, in a deep stance. It's hard to you know, the Solidarity, I, I see now, what Solidarity means is not so very easy. That's something very simple. I mean, he says this, whether death is an evil or good is really a difficult question. Some people are better off yeah, when dead. And Solidarity includes himself, of course. Yeah. But that, a sensible human being is worse off if bossed around by a vicious fool. Yeah? And because that, that fellow in jail is not likely to be an enlightened sage. You know? and then, uh, that is worse off than if he can circulate and decide what is he going to do today. It seems to be consensical. And I think if the sort of us who don't believe it should experimentally try it in the jail, and uh, I think they would come up with that. They would see it. Is it but, uh, is it, no, but if you want to go into a deeper strata, uh, then you can, of course, say this is what Solaristia means by freedom, is a central sense, a consensual sense, is linked up indeed with what he claims. The highest thing for man, according to this philosophy, but that is the highest form of freedom. But this freedom has its inner law. It seeks truth, I mean, that's not just uh, uh, say what you want, uh, anything which comes to your head, that's a philosophy. Uh, or a saying, that's a philosophy. That is a so, an impudent assertion in our philosophy. Surely, to that extent, it is a sense of this freedom. And this freedom is, of course, denied by the police. We have seen this. That's what Sugar says. You might uh, acquit me with a proviso that I give up uh, my philosophers. <coughs> now, in the clearest case, there will be now a formal law in act. Philosophizing is strictly forbidden. And Sugar says that he would, I would not comply because he couldn't give it up. Uh, philosophizing is, as Sugar understands it, something 
which cannot be regulated by the courts. And that is not quite the same thing as modern liberalism means. Because the West would say there is no question that tragedy and comedy can and ought to be regulated. This is very clear. Yeah. We have the case of Jack Carr. This is something which is susceptible of being regulated by the courts. I think it's clear that it was in this particular case and one uh, an opportunity for the matter. But philosophy cannot be. Uh, I mean, in other words, it's been for science, uh, the decision regarding the mistake of it. It's only irrelevant, confident, immaterial, the very idea that the government as such should be able to speak competently about biology. But he can very well speak competently about what is conducive to public morality in such uh, performance as a result of Mr. Palm. So, but, but uh, so, uh, you can say the uh, common freedom, which so is claims to be good, is related in his mind to the highest form of freedom, and that's philosophers. Because that freedom, which means not only is a freedom to circulate, but it means also the freedom, uh, the, the freedom, the innermost freedom. You see, the freedom to circulate doesn't mean much. If you are a slave of your own opinions of your fellow uh, uh, citizens, hmm? then you are in one sense free, in other sense you are a slave. But the true freedom is, of course, that which is free of the mind. To that extent, uh, that is linked up, but the explicit argument is only with this commonsensical uh, thing that uh, to be jailed, uh, to be jailed is, is surely generally speaking, an evil. There are extreme cases where this must be good. There are a case where people try to go to jail. For example, that was a safe place in Nazi Germany for some people, uh, because if you don't think they were, they, as common criminals, they were not suspected of conspiracy against the regime. They were safe. And there were also other cases in Germany, I remember, in pre hitlerian times, when people say shepherd committed a minor uh, misdemeanor in order to spend the winter well fed and uh, well housed in the jail, you see. But still, that doesn't do away with the fact that, generally speaking, jail is uh, undesirable. Now, let us continue where we left off, because we, we should really try to finish the discussion of that. Where was it? Shall I propose imprisonment? Oh. No, shall I the exile? Yeah. Perhaps you would agree to that. Life would indeed be very dear to me if I were unreasonable enough to expect that strangers would cheerfully tolerate my discussions and arguments when you who are my fellow citizens cannot endure them and have found them so irksome and odious to you that you are now seeking now to be relieved of them. No, indeed, Athenians, that is not likely. A fine life I should lead for an old man if I were to withdraw from Athens and spend the rest of my days in wandering from city to city and continually being expelled. For I know very well that the young men will listen to me wherever I go as they do here. If I drive them away, they will persuade their elders to expel me. And if I do not drive them away, their fathers and other relatives will expel me for their sakes. That is, of course, a description to the Athenians what they had been doing to him. Yeah, yeah so Exa, that is a sketch of the argument of the Crito, as you can see, why exile is not, not a possibility. Now, in, in the, yeah, we have to read the immediate secret. Perhaps someone will say, why cannot you withdraw from Athens, Socrates, and hold your peace? Withdraw from Athens? It's not in hmm? Withdraw from Athens? No, no. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if you, after you got out, meaning in jail, uh, in other words, could you not, after having been uh, acquitted, could you not keep silent and uh, still, yeah? It is the most difficult thing in the world to make you understand why I cannot do that. Some of you. Some of you. Yeah. If I say that I cannot hold my peace because that, that would be to disobey the God, you would think that I am not in earnest and will not believe me. 
You know that I, you would uh, not believe me, thinking that I'm speaking ironically. That I'm speaking ironically. I tell you, in a way, some of you will not believe that the Willis cannot remain silent and keep rest. They regard his assertion that he obeys a God as irony. Therefore, the Willis has to give an other reason, which no one can regard as ironical. If you remember, this suspicion that this might be ironical has also occurred to some contemporaries, some of us when we read it. Yeah? Just like the theorists, which I mentioned to you, when Socrates gives first the reason for not accepting a certain young man as a student, say, well, I'm an erot, um, the only thing I know is er er eroticism. And then they say, it's crazy. And then he says, no, it's a daimonium. That prevents me, that's a, a, a terrific thing, you know. <laughs> that they believe in. Now here the order is inverted. What does he say? What is the, the reason which no one can regard as ironic? I defer to tell you that no greater good can happen to a man than to discuss human excellence every day and the other matters about which you heard me arguing and examining myself and others, and that an unexamined life is not worth living, then you will believe me still less. So in other words, that is, uh, yeah, so, so what is this compared to refer to the Delphi God because the true reason is wholly unbelievable. That's what I want to make sure. The true, the true reason is the philosophic life is the greatest good. And in what does it consist, the philosophic life, as described here? So, no, here, here. No, here is it, all the description. To make speeches on virtue, about virtue, not admonition to virtue, but raising questions regarding what is virtue. That is the point. That is the reason why Socrates cannot change, because he is certain that the philosophic life is the best life, the highest good. How does he know that the philosophic life is best? How does he know that? You remember, he came always back to this question. What does Socrates know? How does he know? I would say gives his answer. He knows it fundamentally in the same way in which he knows that freedom in the screwed sense, not being jailed, is in principle preferable to being jailed. By starting from this obvious phenomenon and reflecting then on the meaning of freedom, whether this freedom as mere absence of external impediments to motion really exhausts what we mean by freedom. And then we come to certain observations, for example, that men who are other directed and can circulate are unfree people because they are directed by someone else. And then we see that there is a kind of freedom which is much higher. I think we, we leave it at this point and go then. Now, there is the, the deliberation of the jury. Sovereign is condemned to death. Sovereign is makes a speech first, which is addressed to the condemners, and then a speech addressed to the acquitters. I summarize what he says to the condemners, and he makes three points. First, it would have been wiser for you to wait a bit, for I'm close to death in 70. Second, I have not been caught by the condemners on account of lack of speaking ability of speeches, but because he lacked daring impudence. Namely, I, I didn't dare to say or do things which would disgrace me. In other words, I was afraid of badness rather than of death. And the third point he makes is a prophecy. I shall be avenged by people younger than myself. Now, the cr uh, crucial point is, I think, what is Sokrates' lack of daring? What does that mean? We can use a better term um, uh, 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 to make the problem clear. 
What is so the sense of shame? What is this shame? If we look at the apology as a whole, what is Sukhadev's sense of shame? How does it show? I mean, surely also that he doesn't do these, these graceful things, crying and appealing to the compassion of the judges. But the book is in a much more profound sense a document of Sukhadev's sense of shame. You remember I said more than once that the characteristic of the book is the low ceiling. The true meaning of philosophy does not appear. It appears only to the extent to which it could be intelligible to the average Athenian citizen. That is a kind of sense of shame. He conceals the true character of philosophy. We must uh, see whether this is not of some pertinence for the later discussion. Then he, uh, he addresses the acquittals. And here it makes it clear that he will tell them myths. He didn't say anything of this kind when speaking to the condemners. Why does he tell them myths? Because they believe in myths. But you must always remember that this is addressed to the acquittals. Do the condemners not believe in myths? In the speech which he addresses to the condemners, he doesn't say a word about the gods, nor of Hades. Whereas the speech to the acquittals, at least four references to the gods, and of course of Hades. So there is the Aetian impression which is borne out uh, by an explicit remark. The condemners are the unbelievers. The acquittals are the believers. But in what sense? Surely in this sense that the condemners do not believe in Socrates' belief, whereas the acquittals believe in Socrates' belief. They are the friends of Socrates, whereas the condemners are his enemies. Now we begin to read in 40C, that is on page 445 the paragraph. And if we reflect in another way, yeah. we shall see that we may well hope that death is a good, but the state of death is one well, of there is only a little bit before, if you will read the preceding sentence. Well, he mentions the fact that the daimonion did not resist Socrates, did not oppose, A, his going to the trial, and B, to his making the speech in which he made it. From this, it would seem to follow that here, now read this last sentence before, before the sentence you began this. A, a, a great testimony of that uh, has occurred to me. Yeah? This thing that is come upon me must be a good. And those of us who think that death is an evil... No, no, before. Before that? Yeah, at the end of the preceding paragraph. But now in this matter, it yeah. has never once opposed me, either in my act, words or my actions. Yeah, the, the, yeah, if I wanted to do something, if I did not, no, if I did not, was not about to do something good. This seems to imply that here the daimon is presented as inciting to good actions. If you remember that before it was only presented as preventing bad actions. Never said. Yeah, now let us, and now that we go on where we really started. But if we reflect in another way, we shall see that we may well hope that death is a good. For the state of death is one of two things. Either the dead man only ceases to be and loses all consciousness, or as we are told, it is a change and a migration of the soul to another place. You know, let us understand it. Death is no evil, but the thing is to be proved. For either it is perfect absence of sensing, yeah, he says consciousness, of any awareness. Or else it is transmigration of the soul. In both cases, he is going to prove, death is a good. So Socrates is no longer ignorant as to whether death is good, as he has claimed throughout. Now he claims to possess knowledge of the fact that death is good. 
And now let us see how the argument runs. And if death is the absence of all consciousness, and like the sleep of one whose slumbers are unbroken by any dreams, it will be a wonderful game. For if a man had to select that night in which he slept so soundly that he did not even dream, and had to compare it with all the other nights and days of his life, and then had to say how many days and nights in his life he had spent better and more pleasantly than this night. I think that a private person, nay, even the great king of Persia himself, would find them easy to count compared with the others. If that is the nature of death, I for one count it again. For then it appears that all time is nothing more than a single night. Yeah, stop here. It's a proof that death is a good, the one I turn it. Yeah? Complete unconsciousness, complete unawareness is a good. What do you say to them? Why isn't he denied his philosophical? I should say so. I mean, if philosophy is the greatest good, then this is surely the very opposite, because that is even lower than the awareness of the most stupid fellow. Sure. That's one. And, and think also of the gadfly. The gadfly is, uh, that is a good activity. The gadfly is awakening Athenians, yeah? arousing them from their sleep. Yeah? But, uh... Could this not be brought on by the suffering that life is, and beyond life, with no suffering, sleep, no awareness? There is no need for philosophy. Surely not. But the question is whether it is not for this reason, because there is no need and no possibility of philosophy, but it is not entirely inferior to life. Otherwise? Well, he doesn't say that it's the greatest good. Uh, it's just that it's, uh, it can be no, he says, compare this night with all days and nights, with all other days and nights, meaning also those days and nights where you philosophize. This is still better. Now, let us first see how he argues out the other alternative, the secret. But if death is a journey to another place, and what we are told is true, that all who have died are there. What good could be greater than this, my judges? Would a journey not be worth taking at the end of which, in the other world, we should be delivered from the pretended judges here, and should find the true judges, or is said to sit in judgment below, such as Minos, Radamanthus, Nicus, and Triptolemus, and the other demigods who were just, who were just in their own lives? <clears throat> or what would you not give to converse with Orpheus, Musaeus, and Hesiod, and Homer? I'm willing to die many times if this be true. And for my own part, I should find it wonderful to meet their Palamides, and Ajax, the son of Telamon, and the other men of old who have died through an unjust judgment, and to compare my experiences with theirs that I think that, I think, would be no small pleasure. And above all, I could spend my time in examining those who are there, as I examine men here, and in finding out which of them is wise and which of them thinks himself wise when he is not wise. What would we not give my judges to be able to examine the leader of the great expedition against Troy, or Odysseus of Scythius? Sisyphus. Sisyphus. And uh, countless other men and women whom we could name. It would be an inexpressible happiness to converse with them, to live with them, to examine them. Assuredly, there they do not put men to death for doing that, for besides the other ways in which they are happier than we are, they are immortal, at least if we are told what we are told is yeah. true. So in other words, that would be much better, it would be better because, why? Because you don't have to fear death anymore. Indications of death and evil. Now let me develop that. In the latter case, we go into Hades, yeah? 
in the company of the just demigods in the first place. Although Socrates only alludes to that, he is very delicate, and that since all dead men are there, also the unjust one, so there is, in other words, also a compartment for the unjust. Uh, for the unjust, you know, hell. But he doesn't speak of it because it's absolutely sure he will not go to hell. He has led a just life. But uh, for him, for those, death would be worse than life. Yeah. For, for, for those going to that compartment. But that is not the accusers will be punished there. So they go there. And of course, the poets. The poets are naturally a different class than the just demigods. Whether he also means they are different from the just men, uh, that is left entirely over. And the third class are the unjustly condemned. Whether any of these individuals mentioned here is wise or not is a question. So he wants to find out. <coughs> yeah? And with a view to this question, he mentions in particular Agamemnon. Odysseus and Sisyphus. Agamemnon he does not mention by name, but he's obviously meant. The perfect happiness, oidamonia, bliss, in life after death, consists in examining. Yeah? If you say so. I.e. In, exa- in doing exactly there what Socrates has been doing here. This life, which he leads as a living being, is then capable of perfect happiness. Only he doesn't have so many terribly bright fellows around as he would find there. That's the some difference, but otherwise it's the same. Yeah, and of course there is this additional boon that death is no longer to be feared, which implies to the belief that death in itself is an evil. Yeah? There is another point. The only objection to this why does he not say that's it? That is a proof that life is, that death is not a fear. Why does he not leave it there? Why does he say that? You see, he has a twofold, a two pronged argument to prove that death is not an evil. Why does he not? Uh, this is a very much stronger proof, isn't it? You are in the best company and you can do the finest things you did in this life. Still better, because you have no longer to fear any interruption by death. Why does he not leave it at that? If the stories are true. If the stories are true, he always says. So, therefore, he cannot really know in which way death is good. Is it good because it is complete senselessness? Or because it's the opposite of complete senselessness, namely complete awakeness. But since this is is undecided, the question of whether awakeness or senselessness is undecided, and since awakeness is philosophy, the question of whether philosophy is the greatest good, or it is not, is also left off. That is, of course, a big job. Now, the argument here reminds of a, a later argument in Plato's uh, Dialogue the Statesman, where it's the story of the Golden Age is presented in a glowing picture. And yet, the philosopher there is not so that it says, we don't know whether this is a decidable condition, whether men had everything in abundance, because we don't know what men did with that abundance. If they used it for philosophizing, then it was really wonderful. But if they merely were sitting around and told, uh, told each other jokes, uh, then it was, or, or I don't know, played bridge, then uh, it is not intended to be admired. So that is what is, of course, what goes through. So there is no somehow that philosophy is the best thing. From this it follows that life is good, and death is an evil. What would this mean? Who acted on this premise that life is good and death is evil? Most clearly the condemners. They could not be persuaded that death is a good. So this doesn't even try to persuade them. There is then in this point an agreement between Socrates and the condemners, as distinguished from the acquitters. 
Suris was ashamed to admit that death is an evil. Uh, that death is not the greatest evil, he was sure. But that it was an evil, he was only ashamed to admit. He presents himself as ignorant as to whether death is good and evil. He presents his, therefore, his wisdom as mere knowledge of ignorance. And therefore, he conceals the true character of philosophy. Now let us read the conclusion. And you too, judges, must face death, hopefully, and believe this one truth, that no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. His affairs are not neglected by the gods. And what has happened to me today has not happened by chance. I am persuaded that it was better for me to die now and to be relieved from trouble. That was the reason. You see, what's all this now, that's an important point. That's a different thesis. Death may be a good, but that doesn't mean it is a good for all men, for every man, however circumstanced. Death is an evil, but now for Sugarlands it is good, because he is an old man. Death is not simply good, but good for Sugarlands. That is this two different theses. Death simply good, and that's good for Socrates, constantly play into one another and create one of the great difficulties of his speech. Now, go on. That was the reason why the guy never turned me back. And so I'm not at all angry with my accusers or with those who have condemned me to die. Yet it was not in this, with this in mind that they accused me and condemned me, but meaning to do me an injury. So far, I may blame them. In other words, if they wanted to really know how to, to help Socrates to get over that hump, then it would have been good. I mean, the hump of the fear of death. But they did it in order to harm it, yeah. Yet I have one request to make them. Read clearly. They would read that sentence. When my sons... Not before, what you read. Yet I have one request to make of them. Of whom? The accusers. The, or condemners, yeah. Keep this in mind, yeah. When my sons grow up, punish them, my friends, and harass them. Not friends, he would not. He, men, yeah. Men, gentlemen. Yeah. And harass them in the same way that I have harassed you. If they seem to you to care for riches or any other thing more than excellence. And if they think that they are something, but they are really nothing, reproach them as I have reproached you for not caring for what they should and for thinking that they are something, but really they are nothing. If you will do this, I myself and my sons will have received justice from you. But now the time has come and we must go away, I to die, and you to live, which is better is known to the God alone. Yeah. So only, but it ends in, in the Greek, is immanifest to everyone except to the God. The God is the last word. It's the only platonic dialogue which ends with the word God. And there is only one platonic dialogue which begins with the word God. Do you happen to know what there is? Lost. Lost. There is a connection. But and that would lead us well. But this is not a, what does he say in his final remarks? You see, the final speech is tripartite. First to the condemner, the center to the acquitters. And the, this acquitter section has the proof that death is good. And then again to the condemners. What does he say to the condemners in the end? They will have done justice to both him and to his son. Yeah, first, what does it mean? Yeah, the first, step by step, the first. Well, you said, he, uh, all of the condemners to treat his sons the way he has treated them. Yeah, good. Can you restate it 
in a bit more forceful way without affecting the substance. This first part of the statement? Yeah. You make a sound clear about it? Yeah, but who has been doing that before? Socrates. And, and the condemners? But let us, all right, let us take it up later. So he asks his condemners to take up his mission. But this mission, but what part of the mission? Or what, what aspect of that mission? Less the, the examining than the admonishing to virtue. Yeah. But what was the admonition to virtue as presented by Socrates explicitly? When he, when he made this, you know, when did you take care of your soul today? You remember that passage, yeah? What was the crucial point there? Mr. Johnson, you were the one who saw it at that um, time. Well, in the sense that, that they didn't. What was the argument by which he really... The virtue was simply utilitarian. Instrumental. Instrumental virtue. Uh, if you want to be wealthy and uh, honored, then you have to practice virtue. Vulgar virtue in the Platonic language. He, at, in other words, he says his condemners should encourage the practicing of vulgar virtue. But that, I would say, is not such an outrageous demand, because in a way they had been doing it all the time. Yeah? I mean, uh, that is... Uh, but that he asked not his acquittals, but his condemners, to take up his mission. Now, if they do this, he says, for example, if they instruct Sogade's sons in that vulgar virtue, they will have done justice to them and to Sogade's. How will they have done justice to Sogade's sons? Sons are not capable of a higher virtue? Yeah, no, but it is just that our orphans, and that's an affair of the city to take care of the orphans. Yeah? By instructing them in vulgar virtue, they, they take the place of the father of whom they have been deprived by an unfortunate accident. But in what sense do you say they have done justice to Perhaps the, the, they would show that they have learned something. Uh, but that's a no. I mean, it, uh, that is really a common. All citizens, with few exceptions, it depends a bit on the circumstances in certain districts of Chicago, the percentage is low. But uh, generally speaking, the majority of citizens encourages their children to be decent. That's nothing far-fetched. Well, the, the terms De of it is the art of it. To, to scorn uh, riches and so forth. And let me see. No, if they, oh, he is careful. He says, if they seem to you to care for money and something else before they take care of virtue, they should not discourage take, taking care of money. Only virtue first. Yeah. As any normal father would say, if the son cares for money without considering uh, the penalties attached to embezzlement and other things, that he doesn't know. It's the same position as they in the Christian. How would they have done justice to Socrates, these fellows? It's difficult to say. But uh, let us leave it open then. I would like now to discuss very briefly the apology as a whole before we turn to the title. Socrates is accused of impiety. That is a crime. But he believes in the gods, especially in Apollo. And if he believes in Apollo, he believes, of course, in Artemis and Zeus and Hera, that's clear. Through obeying the God's command, he comes to see that all men are ignorant regarding the greatest things. That human wisdom is just knowledge of ignorance. But what does this mean? If men are ignorant regarding the greatest things, What do they not know? For instance, 
on. Here, but more uh, yeah, sure, we come to that. But something else which the Lord never says, but which is clearly implied, he, he connected with that. But more simply, he, he, if men are ignorant regarding the greatest things, God. sure, they, they don't know whether it goes down or not. This is, of course, now, there was a man who wrote a book <coughs> beginning with that proposition. Whether the gods are or are not, I do not know the aloofness of the subject and the brevity of human life prevents me from knowing it. Do not Pardon? No. Protavas, whose book was burned for this reason. In Athens. You find the discussion of that in the theaters. So, in other words, what I'm talking about is that Socrates that is very paradoxical, that this terrible assertion of Protagoras is not contradicted by Socrates. Yeah. He doesn't say it. What he says is only, indeed, as you, Mr. Gennett, mentioned, Socrates does not know whether or not death is an evil. That is, so to speak, the reflection of this more basic question of the gods. The pro and cons regarding the gods are not discussed, but the pro and cons regarding death are discussed. Now, what is the situation? Who says that death is an evil, and who says that death is no evil? I mean, ultimately. You, can, you know, Socrates himself says throughout the dialogue he doesn't know. Only in the speech addressed to the equitas does he say in effect he knows. But in science the whole it doesn't say. I would say this. The Delphic Apollo suggests that there is no evil. So one must serve the God despite of arousing hatred i.e. despite of bringing about one's own death by that. The Delphi God demands of Socrates that he should examine his fellow citizen, and regardless of whether that leads to death or not. Socrates' daimonion suggests that death is an evil, as I have shown when we discuss it. He, he says in so many words, one ought to be cautious. It keeps him back from the dangerous life of politics. There is a connection between the daimonion and self-preservation. And self-preservation by itself leads to vulgar virtue. It's the argument of Hobbes, if you uh, want to have a, a, a geometric argument regarding self-preservation. No, but no, really, because of beautiful argument, if that is the greatest evil, then you must prefer peace at all costs. Because in, in war, the danger of violent death is, is really there. The life of a soldier, how does this Colonel Blimp say? The life of a soldier is, is uh, hard and not without real dangers. <laughs> and uh, so uh, then you must choose peace. But if you want to have peace, you have to behave peaceably. And the habits of peaceful behavior are the virtue. That's a, a very good argument. And which therefore didn't require the genius of Hobbes to discover only Hobbes made of it the whole morality that was the genius. Now, the Delphic Apollo synthesis is proven. By the, uh, by the alternative in the speech to the acquittals. Either death is one, one night without dream, or else death means to examine people in Hades. This, however, is based on what people say, there is no certainty. So it knows that death, death is not given. Only uh, that would be, uh, yeah, that uh, Sugaris would, uh, I, or Blader would put it somewhat differently, but all right. All right. No, I don't understand the, this, this here. That is, is it, is it unique to few individuals, or is it a natural capacity for all men? Yeah, 
It, it, that depends. I mean, if you mean philosophizing, yeah? That would be part of the game. Yes, the highest, the most important. Now, you have read, I, I know, a, a dialogue in which Plato discusses this problem at much greater length and on a much higher level. I mean the Republic. How does the discussion of philosophy in the Republic begin? I mean, after it has been introduced as a subject, yeah, in the fifth book, first subject, when he speaks about philosophy. The education of the Not before, before, because. Before he speaks of education. Okay. No, 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 that's later. In the fifth book. The difference between philosophers and non philosophers. That is too vague. The nature, the nature. No, that is the crucial, the, the subject of the end of the fifth book, which is the beginning of the discussion of philosophy, is the nature of philosophers. And only after he's discussed the nature of the philosophers does he discuss the education of philosophers, just as he did regarding the guardians in the second book. What is the nature of a guardian? You know, the mixture of, like dogs, you yeah? The mixture of kindness to strength to acquaintances and uh, harshness to enemies, that's the nature of a god. And then the question is how is to be educated? So the nature of philosophy. What is the, res uh, the crude result of the discussion regarding uh, the human race as a whole, of the discussion of the nature of philosophy? They are very rare. Yeah? Very rare. So, on the other hand, it is also clear, I think, from common sense, that moronic people are also extremely Most people are able to walk around and to pre prevent their being run over by cars and, and uh, other uh, dangers of this nature and somehow come safely through life if they are not uh, killed by diseases and so on. In other words, there are a kind of medium range, which is supra-moronic, but also sub-philosophic, is the fate of the large majority of men. And there are, of course, considerable differences there, you know. Someone can have an extremely, extremely good practical wisdom, yeah, and rudeness, and uh, breadth, and so, and still not be a philosophic, a philosophic man. That is a platonic scheme. Now, therefore, if the highest form of freedom is philosophy, it would be a preserve. That highest freedom would be preserved of a few. But another kind of freedom, capacity to take care of their own affairs, capacity to take care of the affairs of the police in a not extremely demanding sense, would, be, would not be too infrequent. Well, any man could conclude on the basis of reflection of what freedom means for him that life as such is good. I mean, it doesn't have to be Socrates' reflection on, on freedom to conclude that the philosophic life is best, but the political man, the business man, or whoever else reflect on yeah, that. Sure, no, sure, yes, sure. In this, in the apology that is, I mm -hmm. think, Fairly, uh, the, the basic question is whether death, uh, without life as such is good or an evil. That's a, it's a basic question. And it is, of course, linked up in Sugar's case with the assertion that the philosophic life is the best life. Yeah? Life as such being good, the philosophic life is the best life. And what was your question? How does it prove that? No, my question was the nature of this uh, so-called gift. But in, I, I see it, it, it's a gift only in, a, uh, in an extended sense that is when applied to, to Socrates. No, excuse me, let's go back to the basic thing. Life is a good. And that is a gift. And, the, and therefore, the love of life is a gift. Uh, apply, uh, which every man has. So in what way is it a gift? And if all men have... Then let me use a somewhat more cautious expression.
action and natural inclination, the law of life, self-observation. Yeah. So that I think cannot be denied that this is so. And we see, therefore, whenever a man commits suicide, the question arises, why did he commit suicide? You never raise the question, why did Mr. Cohen not commit suicide? Yeah. Because you are wrong. You take it for granted that not committing suicide, it, is, it doesn't involve a question. Committing suicide it involves a question. The normal and natural thing is not. And the ordinary explanation is that he had particular misery. So I don't mean you now. Uh, he, he lived in particular misery which induced him to do this unnatural thing to take his own life. Yeah? Or he may also have been demented or something. Now the question, the fundamental question would be this. All arguments of this nature, which are underlying the traditional natural law doctrine, they suppose that in a, uh, that nature is good. I mentioned this before. Yeah? It means that the natural inclinations are as natural inclinations good. And uh, that you, well, quite a few people have said, at least in the beginning of modern times, that's a dogmatic premise. I, I believe I mentioned this problem uh, last time or so. That's raises that question, sure. Uh, and the question is, uh, how does uh, Plato or Socrates meet that? I, that uh, one can speak of meeting it, I believe, is proved by the fact that the alternative, I mean, that life, and therefore also the inclination to life, is evil, is brought up here. So he knew the issue. Whether he met it adequately or not would require a fuller study. A, of Plato, than we can afford now. B, of the arguments of those of the other side, you know. I mean, say, uh, the implicit argument of men like Descartes and Hobbes and others. And men will my mind it. So one would have to go into that. Whether it is, is simply stated, I think the implication of Plato is that it leads to a simple self-contradiction to deny the goodness of nature. You also uh, put a great store in this natural inclination of Socrates as... Uh, yes, yeah, so this was a special sword. case. Now, let me uh, elaborate this. The natural inclinations are, of course, not alone effective in men. There is, they are always affected by opinions, yeah, which cannot be so in the case of the truths. Truths are incapable uh, to opine. In the case of men, we are always influenced by opinions. And uh, there are certain opinions which are opinions against nature. That's the implication, destructive of nature. When Socrates is characterized by Plato as a man in whom the natural inclinations on all levels, not only self-preservation, on all levels, and especially on the higher levels, are, we are unbelievably healthy powerful, so that the false opinions could not affect him. One way of stating is that Socrates, even if he had no knowledge, always had right opinion. It's only a reflection of his physics, which was so well ordered. But not only well-developed healthy, but correct. Yeah, yeah, sure, that, that is the meaning of it. So that the opinions to which he adhered, as it were, even prior to a reflection, only divining, not knowing, that's a true, the correct of him. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm puzzled about the, the uh, falling back on natural inclination as the source for one, Socrates' knowledge or wisdom, and two, the, in general, source for the people's uh, uh, yeah, but what? Can, yeah, but all right. Let us try alternatives. Let us say, all right. I mean, the predominant view today, of course, is absolutely what you say, and not only the positivists, but very great thinkers, for example, Kant. 
Kant said it is impossible to build moral teaching on a reflection on human nature. And uh, he used all kinds of arguments. One of them, for example, this, said if, says the doctrine of justice, is based on the consideration of human nature. The concept of justice thus emerging is inapplicable to God. So you cannot speak of, in any strict sense, of God's justice. And that has grave consequences yeah, for human life. So we must understand justice or morality in such a way that its meaning is in no way dependent on the nature of man, but must be related to the nature of any rational or intellectual being. Man or higher than man. The reflection, yeah, a, a complete divorce of ethics from the understanding of man's nature. That is, was probably the most radical attack. Yeah, but what was the consequence? The consequence was Kant's formal ethics. The problem of the, the matter, the content, was. Kant believed he could, his, the form as he understood it would generate the matter. But I think one can show that this doesn't work. And that, therefore the content has to be gotten from somewhere. And merely formal ethics, which tells you, uh, that is exactly in practice, although Kant did not mean it, it's a position which I sketched on, on our occasion, the people who say uh, the men to be respected are those who adhere to an ideal. Whatever the idea may be. Yeah. I mean, in other words, who, people who would say consideration with, with one's comfort and belly and self-preservation, so that is, of course, not morality. Let's be share with the brutes. Man's dignity depends on his being de dedicated to an idea. Which idea? Any idea. That is, uh, that is a, not what Kant intended, but that is, a, in a, that is a strictly formal ethics. You have a description only of the how, dedication, whatever you call it, but not of the what. And the how does not generate a what. And that is, uh, you can, one can try, but uh, that I think leads also to absurdities. Although it is practically as a rule of thumb, within certain limits, a possible, but only within certain limits, think of those people who say, uh, yeah, uh, as has been frequently said, think of the really best type of communists. Uh, you cannot deny that they have an integrity, that's the word which is used, yeah, it means a dedication, which the ordinary uh, man does not possess. This integrity is something, yeah? Uh, it, it's the only thing which ultimately counts. That is much too abstract. You have to go into the content of the ideas, you know? So where do you make a distinction between the, the goodness of the natural inclinations per se and the need for the natural inclinations to be remolded and directed? Yeah, but as natural Not inclinations, inclinations themselves. As natural inclinations, they point towards something. They are directed towards something. And that gives you uh, it gives you uh, it gives you the end in the, in the most general sense. I mean, what uh, now? Show me the concrete difference. No, Socrates' whole endeavor is to change the 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 course of men in political life. They went into political life because presumably their natural inclinations combined with their opinion said this was the best life for them. So since you don't change mental inclinations, but you know you don't know. I don't know whether I understood you. I mean all men have the natural inclination really. Yeah. Except if they are perverted by certain forms of business. Yeah. For example the Indian widow, a young woman of 22, who uh, uh, has as a girl, uh, one uh, Socrates, I think, would say, uh, and not only Socrates, that is based on a wrong opinion, that she commits suicide for that reason, yes? 
Good. Now, so all men uh, may not have a better opinion, a desire to live. And out of this, there grow such things as an art of medicine, the art of the shoemaker, and so on. And above all, the political art. Because man is not only mortal, but also killable. Yeah. And therefore, he needs a police for protection. Uh, both against uh, criminals within society as well as against enemies without. Yeah. So, so, so then uh, thus political art is developed on this level for the sake of self preservation. Good. Uh, uh, so maybe I can do that. I can do say it. more succinctly. If, yeah. um, if Socrates' inclinations lead him to uh, have opinions which differ. <coughs> radically from the opinions of most men. These opinions cannot themselves be defended on the basis of his natural inclination. That is, uh, at many places in the course of the dialogue, you seem to say, how does Socrates know this? He knows this because his eros or Yes, sure. No, that is, not, that, that is not sufficient knowledge. That is, you can say, that you can say that it's an inference from the fact that it is a natural inclination. He is directed, not only he, everyone is directed by his natural inclinations, but knowledge consists in realizing that it's a natural inclination. Yeah, well, how can this particular natural inclination of Socrates be defended against all... Yeah, but what is the objection? The objection, which is the objection? The fact that the, 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 the striving for the, the desire for self-preservation in itself is a natural inclination. What is the objection? No, no, there's no objection to that. Uh -huh. Now, where does the difficulty? I thought you meant this difficulty. The, the, the desire for self preservation, who takes the most interesting case here, no, no. Leads, leads to the polis. And therefore, it requires that men are citizens, to their duties as citizens. And some, even more than that, lead an active political life. So that this does not do that. Yeah. Yeah. How can he? Uh, that, uh, this is something. Yeah. You know, as a practical uh, proposition, how would you uh, say that? I mean, if everyone would do what Socrates did, no police could exist. Is it? Self preservation would become impossible. Irrational. You know, no. Uh, although that may be a, a true practical consequence. Uh, can this position of Socrates be defended by argument apart from any reference to his peculiar inclination for philosophy? Sure, I mean, it must be defended, otherwise uh, that would be a mere idiosyncrasy which is not worthy yeah, yeah, of any respect. All crucial points, it seems, you just referred to. No, no. Uh, I mean, let us take this seriously. How, uh, how could Socrates in a developed argument, which he doesn't get here, defend himself against the proposition to neglect his duty. He ought, he admits that the police is necessary. And that means that people must be not only law-abiding, but at least those sufficiently gifted, must take an active share in political life. A perfectly good argument. How does Socrates uh, defend it? That is a real accusation of Socrates. What would he say? If someone is, is you by your action contributes to the destruction of the forest, what would he say? Well, then he harps upon his, his not knowing, so therefore he's yeah, not knowing. Yeah, all right, but let us forget now this point because uh, we must be able to discern this uh, really serious argument behind that, and then we can also try to link it up with the argument that's explicitly given. Did Socrates' non-participation in political life destroy the city of Athens? As a matter of fact, no. It was before it went on. So, let us draw an inference. There are plenty of people who are eager to be politically active. Number one, there is no need of that group. Now, the question is, of course, those eager fellows may not be the best ones. Yeah? And therefore, the argument of the party, you know, why good men should be 
not because they like it, but they, but lest the bad man will take off. And then the question becomes really a practical question itself. What are in a given case the chances? Uh, that uh, how did somebody do do more good by not going into politics or by going into politics? And then he sees judgment once he did more good by not going into politics. Not only because it preserved his life, because that argument is of course fallacious. Uh, we, we, one can make an equally good argument on the grounds of self-preservation for going into politics, for having powerful connections which will get you out of any fix into which you might come. You remember the argument of Caliphate, to which is alluded to so that. So that is a sensible problem, a necessary question. Uh, because uh, th that, is, uh, that is exactly the argument of Amsterdam against the rest. That you, people like you, in fact, destroy what is the basis of your own activity, and it's a policy. Yeah. And so that is, uh, and that, I think, this argument goes through the platonic world, the denial of that. That's not true. The private life, as uh, if, we, if we can call that a private life, is led by so that's of NATO, it, it is so far from being destructive of the policy, is even <coughs> contributing, if the bad indirectly to the police. The police needs philosophy, such as the position which also there is, I think, but it doesn't need the rule of philosophy. I mean, the, officially, of course, that's the argument of the past, that the police needs the rule of philosophy, but that's practically impossible, it's made very clear in the past. A good society, if we use modern terms, requires that there be men dedicated to the life of the mind. But as such, they are not the rulers. And uh, because there is a certain disproportion between what they are doing and uh, what political life requires. The tense book of the politics, of the ethics, now so is beautiful a description of that problem. That there is, that what Socrates, I mean, Socrates is very far, or Plato is very far from having a simplistic view of the harmony of the natural inclinations. There are tensions between them. Yeah, tension. Uh, for example, take the very simple thing, uh, without going to philosophy, uh, it's a social life of man, requires a policy. Requires them for the willingness to die for the country, for the city. Yeah? A, a clear contradiction to self preservation. Uh, that, uh, that cannot be helped. In, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, there is no simple harmony. One can state the simple, uh, in very, stated in very general terms, there is a harmony. Self preservation is a basic and no. Social life and the, the qualities demanded by that have a higher rank than mere self-preservation. Empirically easily provable. We do not <coughs> admire a man for the mere fact that he preserves us. Yeah? I mean, the classic case of the mere self-preserver is, of course, the valetitinian. We can say he is a shrewd fellow. He takes well care of himself. But that's not admiration. But a, man, a public spirit a thoughtful man who exposes himself to dangers, not only in war, but in other perhaps more difficult dangers, for the sake of the, of the good society, is an unknown. And that's fine. And on the, and the other hand, according to the Platonic scheme, the life of the mind is still high. And there are also tensions between the social life and the life of the mind, which correspond in a different way to the tensions between society and self preservation to which I spoke before. Mr. Faulkner. Where is the contribution of, of philosophy to the policy made clear in the apology? I thought that, um, as far as I remember from previous discussion, it was merely established that Socrates did not harm the class, but, but accept the argument concerning the gadfly, which, which is discredited. 
uh, there's no statement that is he contributed. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is very good. Come on, but how about the the concept of it? Yeah, the person who the purpose of the apology is not the proof that the police needs to know but a, a, a decent defense of a philosopher who is no longer concerned with living a, 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 a one which a, a defense so praised that it would not make a philosophy Utterly unpopular in Martin's sense, they're much more limited. And we say nothing of the fact that if the world is going to talk to the political dream of Hans, he would talk differently than in such a, a speech addressed to 300 men, more or less at a journey, at random shows. Mr. Gilman? Uh, there was one thing that puzzled me. Uh, in an earlier part of the dialogue, he seemed to maintain that it was the paradox that uh, no man harmed another willingly. Here at the very end, he seems to say the opposite, that they do not harm him, but they intend to harm him. And I wondered uh, if there were anything there. Uh, yeah, that is a long question, and I, I'm sure I have not solved this difficulty, but it still is. I can suggest it's only one step for clarification. Strictly speaking, Sugaris doesn't say that no one voluntarily commits injustice or no one voluntarily harms another. I come back to that later. Strictly speaking, Sugaris says no one voluntarily chooses the bad. Yeah. Every choice, I mean, uh, no one chooses evil as evil, meaning for himself. <coughs> that is, is true. I know, but I know what you mean, this passage, where he said, as a middle, as a, mid, as a link of the two theses, between, what was that passage? Which well, read, there is a contradiction which made him more... Well, what I'm saying is, the, the, when he refused from the leaders, yeah. with his yeah. with this very paradoxical argument, you know, how could I how could I be harming anyone else? And then at the very end, he said, yeah, no, but, yeah, but how, what was the more specific thing? I don't remember the moment. It, it, it gets militant. What was it? What did he say most, uh, uh, more precisely than you stated? No, you stated it more clearly before. No one wishes to live with bad men. Oh yes, yes, that's it. No, yeah, but which is which? Yeah. Bad. Now, why is yeah that is true? Uh, of course, why is this uh, an overstatement? I mean, everyone wants a good for himself. That's true. But only the question is, which good? And some people, believe it or not, think that certain very low goods are the highest good. So take a miser. Yeah? He doesn't want to harm himself by, by say, not eating uh, and uh, by, uh, by uh, living very, very bad in every respect. He thinks he is acquiring for himself the highest good. The highest good being cash in a box. Yeah? Good. So, now this fellow, of course, uh, now how would Zogar's argue against him? You want to, I mean, that's the highest good for you. Therefore, you are very anxious that there are no uh, robbers, no, uh, no uh, housebreakers and so on. Yeah? And therefore, he will go around and tell everyone how wicked it is to enter houses, yeah? That would be the question, yeah? But what about, uh, he would, of, of course, also have to say, or at least to act on the maxim, that contribution to charity is wicked, because it would connect with his good, yeah? Now, in other words, what is the mistake of so in the argument? Well, it is much too general. I mean, it doesn't go into the fact that well, the goods which people desire and uh, with which with the preservation of which they are concerned, there is an enormous variety there. And the famous fact that there are quite a few people who corrupt their fellow men. I mean, you 
get reports of it every day. For example, Mr. Morrison's activity with the policeman is a good example, if you don't believe me. Now, what he, he, he corrupted his government. Why? He made life more miserable for himself. That was not the motive. Yeah? He thought he makes life more comfortable because if the policemen cover up for his uh, uh, robberies or whatever he did, uh, he will not be punished. Yeah? Now, what was wrong in the calculation? I mean... Uh, Somebody slipped up. <laughs> Now that's the point which one would make on the lowest level. The danger of slip-up is so considerable that a prudent man wouldn't do what he did. You're sure that is a policy as policy uh, that is uh, is good, uh, should be good as far as it goes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now I think I will only say a few words regarding the Crito, which we will discuss next time. Of first read the paper. Now, the apology and the crito are, in a very, very, very superficially, a very different in spirit. I remember having read in Paul Shorey, you know, he was a professor of classics at this university about 40 years ago. He says somewhere, now in his book, what Plato said. Yeah. What Plato said. Not what he thought. And uh, I think it is even not quite adequate for Elegari what he said. But it is a useful summary, by the way, of the dialogues, and it has one quality, one helpful quality, and that it, he gives you parallels. You know, when you read a passage, say, in the Crito, and his report, he gives you parallels in other dialogues, and that can be helpful. Now, and then he makes this remark he loves the Crito. And it tests the apology because the, the Crito is a conservative book, law abiding. And the apology is a book of a rebel, a revolutionary. You know, when Socrates says, regardless of what you do, I will philosophize. Yeah? Even it's a law of apathy. He challenges the whole policy and its laws. And he, he, he accepts the laws on a block and says, you must not. Uh, Disobey them under any circumstances. As a provisional statement of the difficulty, it is interesting and it shows also how this so fashionable distinction between the conservatives and the liberals today uh, uh, don't work out when you go to interesting cases. Yeah, you know. I mean, there is a long. You, you must have read the, uh, some of this discussion now going on. Uh, what uh, conservatives and liberals are, and uh, where each of them gets into. Uh, that would not be, by the way, a bad subject for a doctor's thesis, to take up these two positions as presented and see that it is a way of blind men fighting against each other. Although it has a certain, I mean, I don't say that the distinction is not, is meaningless politically, very far. But it is only relevant in a very crude political sense. You know, those who wish to abolish progressive income tax and those who wish to increase it. Uh, that is a clear practical issue. And there are others of the same kind. And also loyalty orders and this kind of thing, uh, which are divisive issues. But if you trace it beyond the politics of this very moment to principles, it is really impossible uh, to find any principle. Now, in the apology, Socrates, we may say, appeals from the law of Athens to something like a higher law, although the term never occurs. But there is an equivalent of that. Because you can say what he says about the, uh, the oracle of Apollo, that has a function of a higher law. In the Crito, he says implicitly, he rejects implicitly any such appeal. You have to abide by the law. That seems to be a clear contradiction, but it, is it really, is it necessarily a contradiction? Can these two positions not be reconciled, at least in the way in which Socrates understands them? An appeal to a higher law in the one dialogue and the refusal to make such an appeal in the other. Because then we would have to establish 
the precise meaning of the appeal on the one hand and of the refusal to appeal on the other. Yes? Well, I, I think that uh, he assumes in the prayer that uh, the laws would have to be good laws. He does make the distinction between... Oh, no. And then it would be easy. That is the best excuse for any uh, revolution of the action. No, no, that he does not do. Well, he, he says that Sparta and Crete have, yeah. for example, have good laws that to single out two cities, yeah. and the implication is that some... Uh, that is a very good point, but that is already on a much more, a much deeper level than I now take it. You are already indicating the difficulties of the argument of the crack. I'm speaking now really of the <coughs> obvious surface, with, accessible without any reflection. In the, what does the appeal to a higher law mean? It's an apology. Let us get this straight. Uh, what is that higher law? It's a very specific one. The law imposed on an individual called Socrates and perhaps on people akin to him. And uh, the, the claim of Socrates and people akin to him to philosophers. Nothing else. There is no appeal to a higher law against loyalty only, or something like this. Philosophy and philosophy alone. And what philosophy is, the trouble is, and the inevitable trouble in the argument, is that it is not very clear what philosophy means. Yeah. I mean, uh, walking around and examining. Uh, that uh, seems to be the meaning. What does he do in the, in the, in the Crito? I mean, it's the most obvious thing. He refuses to run away from jail. I mean, to commit a flagrantly illegal action. I, I think one should suggest this for you. Man has no right to transgress a law, even if he hurts unjustly his body. And the greatest hurt uh, which could be done to the body would, of course, be uh, capital punishment. But there is the right to transgress a law which hurts the soul. Yeah, what was done to Socrates, the capital punishment, did not hurt his soul. Therefore, no right to transgress. But the law which would forbid him to philosophize would hurt his soul, and therefore he could not obey. That would be a possible, uh, an easy way of reconciling the distinction. The problem has a certain similarity with the problem of passive and active disobedience as it was developed in the 16th and 17th centuries. Do you know what that was? Uh, when one has to obey an action, but not necessarily in conscience? After the, after no, no, the no, no. Passive disobedience would mean you never rebel under no circumstances. Even if the government is, is heretical and uh, got no never. But active obedience would mean to positively do what the government commands. Well, take a simple case, as it was the situation there, Protestant countries or, or Catholic countries. A Protestant government commanding Catholics to deny a certain principles of Catholicism by deed or speech, that would be active. Uh, opinion. Yeah? And that uh, the Catholics in this case said no. Passive obedience merely meant uh, and not to rebel. Not to rebel. What did I, was, was it clear what I said? Okay, take another example. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the crucial point was that under no circumstances has a citizen or subject the right to rebel. But he does have the right to disobey commandments of the government which are incompatible with this country. That was the moderate, uh, I mean, the, the, the most moderate position. The alternative was, of course, that under certain conditions were made. Uh, the is, so this position has something to do with it, but I believe the formulation, the formula which I suggested, comes closer to what he said. But if I say a man has a right to transgress the laws which hurts his soul, he means that in a very precise sense. Only a law which forbids philosophizing can hurt the soul. 
a law which would, for example, forbid him openly to question the existence of Zeus, he would not think that it would hurt his soul, because that would, uh, that would uh, he, uh, clearly, in his opinion, belong to the competence of government to do that. Yes? So why doesn't uh, a law, I mean, which needs to be killed in the process, presumably, is so I don't think the distinction between laws against the soul and uh, the law, you know, means killing the body, laws against the body. I mean, presumably, if you're dead, you're dead. So, in other words, I see, your, your difficulty is this. There might be cases, and this is exactly a case, which hurts both the body and the soul. Yeah, but so what is the concept? It, 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 that, but it, it, why, on what ground does he deny that there is a contradiction of the two, the two pronged law here, or the two prongs of that law? So when it says the soul is not hurt by accepting punishment, other punishment, by soul not hurt. I mean, you say in certain cases, and especially in our case, the two provisions of that law, as I describe it, contradict each other. His body is hurt, obviously, but we, we know the hurt of the body is no reason. But you say he's also his soul is hurt. But the whole argument of the apology was that his soul is not hurt. Did the rest become a meaner man by Accepting the punishment, that would mean hurt the soul. Yeah, but still you've got a point. It's the fact that the was mentioned so frequently in both words, the fact that he is 70 plays a role. That is one of his relevant circumstances. Take a young man of 25 instead of a man of 70. I, just, I don't know what you do. Yeah, that is, I think, the problem, really. It, that is a great problem of the Crito. Is, as it seems to be at first glance, the statement that under all circumstances you must not disobey a law which hurts the body, universally valid for every man, regardless of circumstances, or is it only valid under certain circumstances? For example, age. So that his useful life was practically an end. It was a piece of him. And therefore, it's a special case. The yes. question is how valid is the age argument? He, he makes this argument to Cardo, who is presumably almost as old as he yeah. is. And, and, and Cardo brushes it off. To, but other people, their age doesn't keep them from resenting it when they find, find themselves in your position. Yeah, sure, yeah, I know that. So it's the specific circumstances of the philosopher. No, no, not only that, but also the, uh, is it whether these other men are not rather foolish. We take that up next time, whereas, you know, by clinging to life and would wish to life and uh, live even 150 years if they could, even if they were completely decrepit, and the burden of anyone. It's not a question of clinging, you see. Prior doesn't make it a clinging, it's still, it's still an active. Yeah, but why should, I mean, uh, yeah, well, we, we go into, and anyway, I mean, I will, what I say uh, now is only this. There is not obviously a contradiction between the two things, yeah? Uh, between the two uh, dialogues. And that we must keep in mind. We must also keep in mind another problem. The thesis of the apology was that Socrates knows nothing and that his wisdom consists in his knowing that he knows nothing. We must keep, we must keep in mind the problem of Socrates' knowledge or his ignorance regarding the gracious things. On what do, uh, is the argument of the Crito based on knowledge? You know, is this thesis? Under no circumstances must you transgress the law, or more specifically in this form, that you 
and legally condemned to make a jailbreak? Is this a universally valid law? A socialist says, but does he know it? Or is it merely an opinion? That's a question. We must, we must investigate. Yeah, as for this passage to which uh, Mr. Berger referred, that is, uh, where is that? Near the beginning. Yeah, uh, 43C, uh, where he says, but um, uh, others of your age are causing such disasters, uh, but their old age does not uh, in any way induce them not to uh, be worried or not to be angry at the present calamity. Yeah. And so there's this, that is so. Uh, sure. And then, again, just, just leave the point. Pardon? And then leave the point. Those yeah, sure, points. yeah, but uh, we uh, still, is it not possible? So there is is not perturbed at all by the approaching death because he is old, he says. Yeah? And the argument of Crito uh, induces to add, this is not a sufficient reason. Because there are other old men who, when uh, death approaches, are perturbed. So that is, is apart from being old, he has another quality, which we can call he is a sensible man. He's old and sensible. He acts his age. He acts in accordance with his age. He acts in accordance with nature. Therefore, he is not perturbed. He knows that he has to die and that he will be no long, for not for very long, the same Socrates that he was before, and that he, he doesn't see any benefit in being a decayed Socrates. That is, uh, that is a point which he doesn't develop, but which is not so difficult to guess. Yes. Well, I think the other points will be, be, it's of no use to continue the discussion of the Crito. Is there any point you would like to bring up now a few minutes? We can still have here. So, uh, the naive questions are always the best questions. Mm -hmm. so, I always thought that uh, from the point of view of Socrates, the passions were really not so bad. It had to be uh, commanded by mm -hmm by the reason, but, but you, you seem to uh, develop the theme that the natural inclination is very good. Well, that's easy. That is not naive. I think I may use the word secret. That's what I would say. That's a good question. Well, I think so. only when it becomes a kind of obsession that a natural inclination is perfectly combined with natural with having a clear mind. Education could fill you with art. And that is the same in Greek. What the police gives you, that I think is a meaning, is an average, mediocre kind of formation. Not the highest. Mr. Faulkner? Could you discuss the nature of Socrates' injustice? That is, or rather, the nature of the injustice that is done by the laws to him. On the surface, it seems it was perfectly just that he was that he was convicted. Yeah. yeah. After all, he, he didn't believe in the Yeah, that I'm law. afraid is so. Yeah. But, but previously, you distinguished between two sorts of facets, if you will, of justice. Law, uh, justice in the city, law, and something a little deeper, and that is hurt. It is, it is the injustice done to Socrates bound up some way with the fact that thereby the city is harmed, or yeah, Socrates was doing good to the city even though he wasn't yeah, disobeying the law? We must make some distinctions in order to answer your question. I don't know yet which distinctions. So let me think along. Now, the first step is, of course, 
Is it possible that the law can, is unjust? Yeah. I think there is no question that sugar is also so and we uh, try to live without that. And you will see no one can live without from time to time saying, even the extreme, most extreme legal positivist can't say. For example, if there should be a law according to which all those whose second name begins with an A have to pay ten times the taxes, uh, then those whose names begin with another um, uh, concept. Uh, 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 now, everyone in his senses, everyone will say there's an unjust law. Why? Because the ground of the discrimination has nothing to do with what is relevant for in the, uh, regarding inequal taxation. Yeah. So they are unjust. But, but is this law unjust? And it's not even I think so, but it seems to me a reasonable sort of law that a city should require relief in yeah, then, uh, yeah, well, uh, if you, then, yeah, then, yeah, then, what, what is the, what is the Socrates crime? Given, let us assume that there must be gods, and these gods must be defined in terms intelligible to the meanest capacities, and then Socrates cannot believe it. Yeah. What, all right, but Socrates can't believe in that. He, he, he does not believe in that. He is the criminal, but qualified, an involuntary criminal. And I think it is a general principle of justice that someone who commits a crime involuntarily has to be treated a bit better than those who commit a crime with matters of yeah. And so this was, uh, I mean, that is possible. You must not forget this. Some of you, and perhaps all of you, have read the Republic. The Republic is the only theoretically complete answer to this problem. The only solution for Socrates is a police in which the philosophers rule. And therefore, of course, philosophy is permitted without any strings attached. But looking at it from the point of view of this part, in spite of the fact that that Socrates acted, I would say, committed a crime involuntarily. It still may be a crime, uh, and he may be treated differently. But the treating differently does not go to the extent of not treating criminal mm -hmm. activity as a crime, in spite of the fact that the punishment yeah, sure. So that should sure, no, well, that is uh, well, that is one of the of the troubles, uh, uh, one of the inconveniences of human life that. The highest type of man can appear in the company of criminals. Yeah. That is. Uh, but isn't the problem really deeper that in fact Socrates' activity did harm the cause? Yeah, that is really a good story. Actually, did harm the cause. That is, it might help to engender unbelief in the gods. Yeah, but if that would only be due if he spread that unbelief, and that he denies, he says. There is not a word of truth that he ever had intercourse with such fellows as Trapsius. But it's possible to say that his unbelief might spread, even if not by his intention. That is, the news yeah, that I can is only a very say, intelligent man. Yeah, but then, as you can also say, or let us then make it a strict rule that not only is the utterance of philosophy, the public utterances of philosophic statements prohibited. But anything of this kind, you know, in other words, in the moment, yeah, what do you do? The suspicion that this guy philosophizes suffices for killing him. That is a very bad legal principle. Suspicion is sufficient ground for condemnation. Really, very bad. Because that will spread too to other fields. Yeah? The suspicion of murder will then be regarded as a sufficient ground for condemning an innocent man. So what can you do? What can you, but you can also argue as follows. The complete prohibition of philosophy, yeah? the complete and unbalanced prohibition of philosophy would, could do harm to the policy. Uh, it's a simple examples of the, from the military sphere, which I gave on a former occasion. Yeah? The soldiers getting panicky because of an eclipse of the sun. And then a bright general who has talked to Anaxagoras tells him, oh, it's easy. It's nothing, it doesn't mean divine punishment, it means simply a certain 
a, a relation of sun and moon, and that is throughout the history. Don't worry. And the soldiers fight, win the battle. Good for the police. So that is, no. If I use seemingly, uh, how shall I say, flippant language, I do not even apologize for that, but it is sometimes good not to talk in highfalutin words, you know. The problem is of the utmost gravity of us. All the thought in the, all classical thought was haunted by this problem that there is no elegant solution to the problem of the relation between police and philosophy. There is no elegant solution. There is a kind of they need one another, and yet also the repel one another. It's a complicated marriage. And, uh, but there must be a marriage. I mean, even if you, if you, that, that you can't live without policies, everyone will know that means that. But that you, you want, can also show that you can't live without philosophy. The police needs philosophy, because otherwise it will become a savage tribe and with uh, certain uh, great inconveniences which that uh, entails. And so the police needs philosophy. That's proven all the time, but they were not. But <coughs> that doesn't mean that the relation is unqualifiedly harmonious. That is not possible. The modern liberal doctrine, and I mean, I, uh, for the time being, I merely restate the classical doctrine. I, only, I don't say that it's true. But for our better understanding of, of, of the whole political doctrine, I think it is important to realize that modern liberalism is great and impressive attempt. Not what now is called liberalism, but I don't mean that this great movement of the last centuries to bring about a perfect harmony between philosophy and society by conceiving of philosophy as unqual or science as unqualifiedly beneficial to society. In the words of Bacon, the function of science is to relieve man's estate. Now if that is a function of philosophy and science, there is but you see that this modern affair, and you know it from John Dewey and others, I mean, it's clear there is no problem, and even to suspect the problem is uh, a sign of a deplorable obscurantism. But uh, there is a problem we, we, after the death of John Dewey, and how to realize that it has been to well, I had one of the in last year. But uh, there is an atomic bomb, the family says. Atomic bomb uh, and, and all its accompaniments uh, have shown that there is a real problem. Now, if one, one by, if science tries to become simply beneficial in the sense in which every ordinary citizen understands beneficial, then science becomes a social power. And if, again, I refer to a, to a famous liberal principle, power corrupts. And don't think that science cannot be corrupted by power. It, 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 becomes, it comes into the service. Science doesn't dictate. It is, I mean, you know this, so the scientists were against the bombing of Hiroshima. Whatever the merits or demerits of the natural health, but they didn't have to as a government, as of course. And so uh, the modern solution is uh, only elegant on paper by saying science is absolutely free because there is no possibility of a conflict. That it's not so if you look at the facts. And as I say, up to a certain point, the modern solution had a great possibility the abolition of the plague, of all the plagues, and uh, of uh, polio, and I don't know what. And uh, the enormous infant mortality, enormously reduced, and all this kind of thing. And yet, what the other side, the microscopic, yeah, which is still with us, 
spider synapses. So that is not so simple. I mean, one has to understand the classical notion, if only because the modern solution is not so elegantly perfect that we do not need some further light on this subject. Mr. Johnson, you want to say something? I was just murmuring about his statement where the laws were complimenting the love of the city, <coughs> showing that he really demonstrated this by never going out of the city on a party festival. I was wondering if that really lived with the laws. It comes to theory of your procession. You can say that. Theory means the procession, holy procession originally, but takes on the meaning any spectacle, anything in which you look. Give it and once it is done. Yeah. And what was this? Well, if it is if the holy aspect of it was. Yeah. Then. Perhaps. I mean, I'm also quite clear about this is an example. Perhaps you are right. Uh, but I would like to know more than I do about the practice of the pious activities. Yes. Whether it was regarded as a sign of piety that a man should speak with them. If that is true, then you are right. I wonder if you could clear up something for me. The distinction between the polis and the laws, yeah. as they appear here, yeah. because uh, they both appear, supposedly, in an interchanging role. Yeah. And he says, uh, both in war and in the law courts and everywhere else, you must do whatever your city and your country commands, or else persuade it in accordance with universal justice. That's all. About 50. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 50 B and yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't yeah. say you have to persuade the laws. But later on. And la later on, it says also, you know, that uh, you will leave this place when you do as the victim of the wrong time, not by us, the laws, but by your fellow men. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that is that about the, you know, we have, but the laws also say we make the decisions, yeah? In other words, we are not merely the laws in, in 51E, yeah? and we administer the police in the other respects too. The point is this, as long as he speaks of the Athenians or of the police, yeah? and even of the fatherland, he means the human beings. But when he speaks of the laws, he hypostatizes. Yeah? something which is only by virtue of human being. But this hypothesization is not completely um, senseless because in a way the laws are, after they have been established, above the human being. Yeah? I mean, that is a famous... Therefore, did you ever hear of the pure theory of law by Kelsen? Uh, well, that plays a certain role in legal discussion. And that is an attempt to take this absoluteness of the law, absolutely literally, yeah? And uh, then infinite troubles arise because then the question arises, what is a law? But it must, of course, be not merely on the statute book. It must also be, in fact, enforced, i.e. by human beings. And then you, you, in other words, the mere validity, regardless of facticity, yeah? The human beings are facts, what they do. The laws, are odds, not facts. But these, these odds, which if there are other odds, is a question. But the positive laws are not mere odds, they are also facts. Otherwise, they wouldn't be valid laws, laws which are actually enforced. Yeah, and so is the absolutization of the laws serves the function to ascribe the laws as sanctity, as supremacy which they cannot have, which they could have only in one case, if they were simply perfect. Now, two laws are examined. The laws regarding marriage, if you call that examination, they are at least alluded to. The laws regarding marriage and the laws regarding the education of infants, you could almost say, of children. But there are other laws which have to be considered. For example, the implicit law not to philosophize, against philosophers. Yeah? This is, of course, not mentioned here. The only law which counts, as far as civil is concerned. The argument is meant to convince Crito, and that 
it succeeds. Uh, we, are, we must not go on, gentlemen and ladies. We are, we are very in the 51 to C6 to 7 Avenue. Further in the court itself. Further in the court itself, it was open to you. What? Well, they made it. Oh, oh no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we are very in 52. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I know. And, and, and now, are you not ashamed of that talk? No. When, when you do not respect us laws, trying as you are to destroy us, but you do what the communists... No, no, only a little bit before. We didn't finish that, I believe, yeah? Uh, then you gave yourself... A... Uh, no, uh, you bear your way, I'm sorry. And you are not ashamed of those speeches, yeah? Uh -huh. When you do not respect us laws, trying as you are to destroy us, but you do what the communist slave would do, you try to take to your heels, Contrary to the agreements and contracts by which you consented to live as a citizen of the country. You see, the funny thing is the slave never contracted, of course. Yeah? The slave never contracted. It's not running away. Yeah? And the running away of the slave is a most dastardly act from the point of view of the master. But if you think of a decent slave, yeah, I mean, of a fellow, a tough and, and uh, honorable fellow, taken prisoner in a war, he would not regard this uh, as such a crash, crash thing, you know, as a dastardly thing. Yes. No? First, then, answer us even this. Whether we tell the truth when we say you agree to live in conformity with us, in fact, although not in word, or whether that is not true. You see, yeah, in, in deed, but not by speech. So it is never said that the laws of Athens are simply perfect. By deed, by his action, as his action is interpreted by the laws. But the action, I mean, so it is staying in Athens all the time, it can be interpreted also in different point of view. Does, does the grammar uh, permit the interpretation to be governed in deed, though not in speech? It must be. The law, which I mean, agreed in deed, not in speech. But but even but not in speech is there that you would live according to us indeed, I mean, you, you, you agreed to live according to us uh, by deed, but not by speech. But is in the original. Yeah, but which I mean is the agreement, is it to the agreement that the distinction of deed and speech refers or to the governing, or to the being governed? That uh, could be both is possible. I see. Well, this matter, but it is more simple and uh, to understand in the way in which I did it. I believe that's everyone saying. But it's so good that ambiguity exists, yeah. Yes, now go on. What shall we say to that, Crito? Must we not agree? We must indeed, Sancto. You see, someone else doesn't answer. Crito answer. Yes. They would say then, and so you are breaking your bargains and agreements with us, but you are under no compulsion and not deceived. You were not compelled to decide in a short time, but you had 70 years in which you could have gone away if you did not like us, or if the agreements did not seem to you just. You see, yeah, the, the, the laws don't claim to be just. Only the agreements were just. The laws are in a way very honest, you see. Yeah? Yes? But you did not prefer Lacedaemon or Crete, which you always declare to be under good laws, nor any other city, Hellenic or barbarian. But you were less out of town than the lame or the blind or the others who are many. So much more remarkably, than the other Athenians who like the city and us the laws. That is clear. For what city could please without laws? Yeah. You, you see, you know the absurdity of the argument here. That lawlessness is worst does not of course prove that any given laws are good, are pleasing. That anyone would prefer life in a policed country or almost anyone to li live in a desert, yeah? it doesn't mean anything that he is pleased by this particular laws. Yeah, go on. And now then, will you not abide by your agreements? Yes, if you obey us, Socrates, 
And, and do not make yourself ridiculous by leaving the city. Yeah. So this is the argument to prove of the, that justice demands that Sobeles stays finished. Finished. And yet there is an appendix. Now that is read in at the, at the beginning, why, why there is need for any further argument. For consider again, suppose you do thus break and violate any bit of them. What good will it do to yourself or your friends? Yeah, let us stop it. Now what does this argument which begins now here mean in the light of the preceding? The issue is settled, because the only question was whether it was just or not. But perhaps not. The fact that you commit an unjust action perhaps does not decide the issue, because the grounds of justice are not so clear as they seem to be uh, if you read uh, on the supervision. More generally stated, there are profitable crimes. What would be the profit of your crime? In other words, we get now a discussion of the subject independently of justice, entirely on the basis of expediency. That begins here. Yes? It is plain enough that your friends themselves also will risk being banished and deprived of their citizens' rights or losing all their property. And you yourself... You see, that is the answer to... You, you all will be uh, the friends, yeah? So that it takes up the argument of Christ. You are right. You all will be ruined. Yeah? You all will be ruined if I escape them. That's it. Now, that's all he says about the friends. Then there comes a long argument, relatively long, about the good to Socrates. Yeah? What would be the profit for him? And then, in the last section, the children. Three arguments, the children. And the center one is a profit for Socrates. How a criminal would argue, you know, his own profit would be the most important. No? Yeah. Yes? And you yourself, if you go to one of the cities nearest, Thebes or uh, Megara, for both are under good laws, you will come as an enemy, Socrates, to their constitution. To their, yeah, to their regime, yes. And why, except, except in his role as philosopher, would he come as an enemy? No. If the agreement is here. There is nothing said about so as a philosopher. No, whole... but what, why then would he come as an enemy? That is not considered. I mean, there's the fact that they were in themes, a Pythagorean colony, yeah, a colony of Pythagorean philosophers, who would have enjoyed having so as with them. Two came to Athens, Simias and Cabes, and stayed with him when he died. They would have been delighted to have him in, in themes. Yeah? It's not considered. Yeah, why then do they say he would be coming as an enemy to those governments? Yeah, no, Wouldn't he be, me. under the previous argument, be making an agreement with those governments since he comes in? Yeah, no, but, let, but let us first finish that. Now that I mean, the laws they have some argument. Now let us see. And whoever have care for their own cities will think you a destroyer of laws and look askance at you. And you will confirm the judges in their opinion so that they will believe they decided to write in their judgment. For whoever is a destroyer of laws would surely be thought to be a corrupter of young men and foolish people. Yeah. Now, you see, the, this is a long story. He says you will come as an enemy of the Constitution, as it has been. The Greek word politeia has a variety of meanings. It means also the, you, of your of their citizendom, if you could coin that, yeah. of their citizen because the word citizenship has another one and now of their living as citizens, of their civic life would be one translation. But politeia means also the regime. Now, this to, that, to which they, the regime, which is a democracy, an oligarchy, aristocracy, monarchy, whatever it may be. Now, that is, of course, a subject which is completely eluded by our fine absolutized laws. So the laws are essentially related to a regime. The democratic laws differ from the oligarchic laws, and so on. 
These laws which are here speaking are of course democratic laws. And no word is said about that. Now, thieves and Megara we are not democratic. And the whole phenomenon of political exile, who were accepted with delight by the corresponding cities, yeah, say democratic exile, was accepted by democratic city, naturally, and vice versa. And so, uh, to, and if, if whether he broke a law or not there, of these, it uh, didn't make any difference. I mean, not ordinary crime, but if he was in prison for, because of his democratic convictions in oligarchic city, and he got out of that by hook and by crook, that, of course, was considered as, we would consider now someone who would get out of a Soviet jail. Would we say, you broke out of a Soviet jail, you will go, we'll destroy all American laws? No. That's an allusion to this thing. So exiles were not such an uncommon thing. I mean, exiles, even exiles who illegally eluded the, the regime of their city. There's a gross simplification of the problem here, a disregard of all relevant considerations regarding law. That was a point uh, the lady made last time about the political class. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the Greeks didn't have this concept of the political criminal, that, which, which we have. But it, of course, affects the situation because those on the side of these criminals didn't regard them as criminals, and so on. Yeah? There was no absolute concept of political criminal. I mean, regardless of whether you are communist, fascist, or democratic. But if you were a Democrat, you did not regard a man who was technically a criminal in an oligarchic city as a criminal, but as a lover of freedom. <coughs> and uh, the other said, as a lover of decency. Yeah. Oligarchs are also And you see also another point which comes out here. They will suspect you. Yeah? They will think badly about you. Respect for the opinion of the many is indicated. You will confirm the judges in their opinion, he says. This also, it may allude to the fact that you, in their opinion that you were disloyal to that thing in the moment. The point never mentioned otherwise. Yes. Now, if you think of ordinary criminals, so well, this is, of course, perfectly right. I mean, a fugitive from justice because he has <laughs> stolen or robbed. Yeah. He's not a respectable man anyway. That's perfectly true. But the question is whether that's, if that is what you meant. But the point is, as a philosopher, that didn't exist. But if Socrates was had the reputation of not being 100% sound regarding democracy, yeah, came to a non-democratic city, yeah, there are plenty of people, you know, the, so this was regarded as a laconizer, you know, a man who admired Spartan and Crete. Yes, the laws themselves say that. Now, if he would go to an oligarchic city, that would, what in essence would make him suspect, would make him recommend, commendable, is <coughs> that also city? Uh, uh, if, if given your statement before, uh, I'm sorry, given the statement before, Death to exile and coming in the light of that statement as an exile to another state. No, Socrates gives now the reasons. I mean, or rather, makes the laws give the reasons why he didn't want to go to exile. But these are the true reasons meant to be seen because we are not yet through. Uh, but first of all, I mean, uh, quite superficially, but massively, he's a fugitive from justice. And that is surely not a recommendation for anyone. But if, however, it is specified, he is a fugitive from the Cheka, or how they, however they may call it now. Yeah? Oh, that's no longer a fugitive from justice, or the Gestapo. Yeah? You see, the political element affects it immediately. And of course, if he would say he's a, he's a fugitive from justice because he didn't believe in the gods of the city, yeah, be as a philosopher, that would also be not a recommendation, as became clear in our discussion with Mr. Faulkner. 
But if he would say, if he would appear and without any uh, untruth, that there was some passionate democratic reaction. What? Uh, you know that the ordinary interpretation of Zoroastrian law is that this had nothing to do with impiety, but was an act of revenge on the part of the radical democratic party against all these things which had happened. There was the story of Azibayanes, there was the story of Kritias, and they had all been related to Zoroastrian. That is the official view now. I think that is wrong because it, it massively contradicts what Xenophon and Plato say all the time. But it has an element of truth, as Xenophon indicates. Well, I'm still wondering, the agreement and contract theory, or the theory earlier, hold only in the case of a democracy. And no. I mean, no, I didn't think so. In that no. case, that's exactly the point. It is a universal theory of legal obligation, which sins by virtue of its universality. You know, you had these famous doctrines of uh, the grounds of political obligation yeah, in the 19th century. Green and other people. Yeah, but uh, these states, the duty of obligation is state. But uh, what Plato would say, to which state? Yes, but... Which state? Because this obviously makes a difference whether, whether it's a reasonable state or an unreasonable state. And, that, and there are various kinds of unreasonable states. There is a degree of unreasonableness where there cannot be any question of obligation, but mere ceding to force. But if it is reasonably unreasonable, then it is already a matter of, of uh, serious concern. Perhaps it is uh, one, one should protect it because the evil of a change might worse, but it, it might be worse. But if it is simply a reasonable state, of course, of it. Socrates were to escape, he would be said, he was given liberty to choose, given the conditions here. He had funds from friends, and he could yeah. probably prevail upon them to send him anywhere. If he goes to a city, his map is going. The tacit assumption that he plans to obey the laws there. He is agreeing. He's choosing that city out of many, that constitution. What then makes him unacceptable to that force? According to the reason stated, because he comes as a fugitive from justice and therefore as a man who has broken. Fugitive broke. from another city of justice. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well. It, and this other city is probably also has a different kind of political order, a different regime. Surely, yeah, but that is only what I say, the argument of the laws with a capital L suffers from, from, from generality. If the problem of obedience to the laws cannot be so simply decided. On the other hand, and that is why Plato, uh, one reason why he wrote the dialogue as he did, as a crude rule of thumb, it is a sound teaching. People should really be law-abiding, by all means. There are cases where it is not possible to be law-abiding, but don't teach people the, what is true in extreme cases, because that has a bad effect. That makes them extremists themselves, and that's not good for any society. But there are extreme cases, and in these extreme cases, of, and I think any one of you can find examples, or, or I hope fictitious examples, where he would not obey alone. Um, Mr. Anastablo, I don't know, some of you will know him, had a, has not been admitted to the bar here in, in Illinois because he stated this principle. He stated, I think, very soberly. But uh, it is, of course, an uh, undeniable principle. But it is also a principle which is, uh, how shall I say, which is not, uh, which I one shouldn't teach in the first grade of elementary school, because it is also a disconcerting point. Yes, uh, now go on. Then, you will, then will you avoid well-governed cities and the most decent man? If so, will your life be worth living? Or will you approach these, and will you be shameless enough to talk? How, Socrates? The same sort of talk is here, 
how virtue and justice is most precious for mankind in law and order. You, you notice the distinction between virtue and justice here. Yeah? It's important. But uh, let's go on first. Uh, don't you think that the whole business of Socrates will be a notorious, nasty story? You must think so. And suppose you decamp from these places and go to the friends of Crichton and Thessaly. The greatest disorder and laxity is found there. And perhaps they would like to hear from you how comically you played truant from that prison with some disguise on it. How you changed your looks with a rough cloak or some things as runaway wrap, just runaways wrapped around them. Won't someone say, you an old man, with probably only a short time left for life? Did you dare to break the greatest laws, and do you still shamefully desire to live? Perhaps no, no one. But let's stop it for one moment. Uh, you see, again, the reference is an opinion. You know uh, what? Bad a figure will you cut? Yeah? Will you cut? Not, and the other point which he makes here, Crichton had said the condemnation and everything else was a comedy. You remember that? It was, this was a disgracefully mismanaged, the whole thing from the start, a ridiculous affair. Now, so that is, but if you talk of ridiculousness, what is more ridiculous than if I would put on a disguise, say, as a woman? And that would exist absolutely ridiculous, so someone would recognize me out. But you see, there's also opinion of the many here. Yeah, the ridiculous. And you see also the importance of Socrates' old age is mentioned here again. Yes? Perhaps, he says. Yeah? Perhaps no one will. If you do not make yourself disagreeable to anyone. Yeah, if you do not, yeah. If you do not lupe pain someone, if you do not uh, no, irritate someone, and that is impossible. It's impossible to live without giving pain to other people. It's important, very important for the argument here. Because it is unjust to do evil to men. But how do people judge of evil, generally speaking? By the pain done to them. And that is, crudely speaking, also the view of the laws. Now, if this is so, that of course creates a great problem. What is the value of laws which take such a crude, merely subjective criteria? instead of the true criteria. Because what is truly good and evil would have to be defined by experts. Again, the old story. The laws I have not been framed by experts. Yeah? But if uh, not... If, but if you do, Socrates, you will hear plenty of other names to your disgrace. You see? A reputation. So you will live at every creature's back and every creature's slave. And what will be your business? Eating and drinking in Thessaly, as if you had traveled abroad to dine in Thessaly. Yes, so dine. A, a dine is a, 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 the Greek word can mean all kinds of meals, but it means also the dinner or supper, the evening meal. Yeah, you have an enjoyable evening of your life in Thessaly. Yeah, good, because they were very hospitable, gangster type hospitable. Yeah. Where will your talks be? Our talks about justice and all the other virtues. So you see, here, here justice is subsumed under virtue. Formerly it was distinguished from virtue. Yeah. Suppose you want to live for the children's sake, to bring them up and educate them. Will you take them to Thessaly and bring them up and educate them there and make them foreigners that they may enjoy that too? In other words, the implication, exile is such a terrible thing that uh, that is the worst thing you could do with the children. Contrary to what was said in the, in the apology, yeah? Perhaps not. But if they are brought up here while you live, will they be better brought up and educated better while you are separated from them? Yeah, that depends on the very grave question, what kind of a father Socrates was. It, about 200 years ago, 
a German theologian, I believe, wrote a treatise. Socrates was neither a dutiful husband nor a laudable father of the family. And I suggest that you, yeah, unfortunately, it's written in Latin. They bring together all things, probably also much gossip, and that about Socrates. Socrates, you know, was never at home. That appears perfectly from the dialogue. He went home to sleep. <laughs> that is at the end of the back of the period. Okay? He went home for sleep, but uh, he left the education of the children. He occasionally he had broad conversation with one of his sons who complained about the nagging of his mother. That was that's the only uh, report we have. Uh, he played to all them. So <laughs> maybe they would have been better off without it. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, perhaps not. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, for your friends will care for them. Will they care for them then if you migrate to Thessaly, but not if you migrate to Hades? Oh yes, we must believe that they will, if there is any good in those who say they are your friends. So in other words, neither, there is no ground whatever, no ground of expediency. Yeah why you should leave a prison. He leaves his children here to the friends. The word friends, the Greek word is not the ordinary word for friends, but that other word, epithetioi, which means uh, the serviceable or the useful ones, not those to whom you have affection. In the, in the apology towards the end, you will recall, he left his children in a way to his condemners, yeah, at the end of the apology. And there is, of course, perfect agreement, because these kind of friends, as right, and the condemners have one thing in common. They will bring up, so that is his children, I mean, at least the decent ones among them, in vulgar virtue, in, I mean, in common decency. But this vulgar virtue is a virtue which understands virtue instrumentally. Virtue, you remember that in the argument in the apology, you have to be virtuous if you want to have money, because otherwise you will not get it and you will not keep it, you remember? That so that the children will learn both from the condemners and from a uh, uh, from, uh, title. But this vulgar virtue is a thing of which Sugares doesn't take care and cannot take care. So maybe it's really better for him, for the children, if Socrates is not around. Yeah? Then listen to us, Socrates, who reared you. Do not value children or life or anything else above the right, so that when you come to the world below, you may have all these things to plead before the magistrates there. For if you do what you intend, things clearly do not seem any better for you in this world, and you will find no more justice and piety here, nor will any of your people. And when you come to the next world, it will be no better. As things are, if you depart... You, you, may say, you see, there is no reference to justice and piety in the next world, because you're doing ju just and pious acts is limited to this world. In the next world, you will be assigned your place according to what the just and pious acts you did in this. Yeah? Yes. As things are, if you depart, you will depart wrong not by us, the laws, but by human beings. You see, the laws of the, they are live in the ground. You know, they are immune. That was a misadministration of laws. Uh, misadministration of the laws, not an act of the laws. Contrary to what the very laws themselves we said before, that they administer the laws are a product of the Athenian citizen body, i.e. of the majority. And the same majority which established the law condemns the way. So there is no, that is just as in the apology, the distinction between the first accusers, you remember? And the jury for such a fiction. So this showed the jury, the jury an image of itself by describing the first accusers. Here he turns it around. He turns it around. Uh, he makes the Athenians forget themselves. Yeah? 
But if you escape in this ugly way, after acquiring wrong with wrong and damage with damage, and after breaking your own bargains and agreements with us, and doing evil to those you least ought to wrong, yourself and your friends, and your country, and us, then we shall be angry with you living, and in the next world, our brothers, the laws, and the house of Hades will not receive you as a friend, for they will know that you tried to destroy us as far as you could. But do not let Crichton persuade you to do what he said. Let us rather persuade you. Oh. This I assure you, my dear comrade Crichton, is what I seem to hear. As the mystic revelers think they hear the pipes, so in my ears the sound of these words keeps humming and makes me deaf to other things. As far as I can see, you may be sure that whatever you say contrary to this, you will say in vain. However, if you think you can do any good, speak. But my dear Socrates, I have nothing to say. Then let it be, Crichton, and let us do in this way, since in this way, God is leading us. Yes, see God, who is he? Yeah. There one cannot have the question how to understand this expression we have discussed before. Say things. Yes. Now, what then is the problem? I mean, uh, what what do we learn about justice from this from this discussion? I think this distinction of between justice and virtue, which is made near the end in 53C, is of the utmost importance. What is virtue when it is distinguished from justice? I mean, there are, is that your problem? Of course, Socrates sometimes presents justice as a subdivision of virtue, for example, in the Republic. But then justice means something very different from it, what it means now. Then their justice means to mind one's own business. More precisely, to do one's own work well. But this is not possible except in the best regime. Because in, in an imperfect regime, you don't, you may not do your own work. You may have gotten the, the wrong kind of work, not the one which is truly fitting for you. So that's another story. That's not the justice of which he speaks here. Now, what is a virtue which he is, uh, of which he speaks here in contrary distinction to justice? We, we have seen it. What is the greatest good? Philosophy. Yeah, or, or, Philosophy. or wisdom. wisdom. So virtue is wisdom, virtue is knowledge, as I always say. But what is justice then? Justice would then not be wisdom or knowledge proper. Do we have any alternative suggested here? That is not the highest meaning of justice, but an important one. What is the most simple notion of justice, uh, which we understand and which was... Uh, obey yeah, to obey the law. That's it. To obey the law. And what does it mean, however, in the light of the analysis given in this dialogue? to obey the laws, regardless of what the laws are. Regardless of whether the laws are sound or unsound, just or unjust. Wisdom is united with justice. No, I mean, this kind of justice, which is identical with obeying the laws, regardless of the character and the quality of the laws, complying with the opinion of the many. That is, even on a higher level, something necessary. I mean, not in this simplistic crude sense that you have to obey any law regardless. From this point of view, justice is identical with humanity in the sense of being kind and friendly to people, especially to people inferior to a man. That is, uh, that is not identical with is a human perfection proper, but it accompanies so. Because if you go, I mean, one could show that by going into any detail. For example, justice means that was the broadest statement. 
to inflict evil on human beings. Murder is one form of inflicting evil on human beings. But is death objectively, scientifically, an evil for every human being? Think not only of a man who has is suffering from an incurable disease and is incapable of thinking for a moment because of pain. Uh, not only that, but there can be someone who is not uh, bodily sick at all. He may be uh, um, an absolutely corrupt individual who cannot be legally caught by the rules of evidence or whatnot and who does an infinite mischief to, all, to every human being he comes in contact with. Evil would be, uh, death would be good for him. What does the law say? I mean, I'm, the law says no, under no circumstances can you kill such a man. Because, uh, because what would happen? The law must speak crudely and universally. This law, this permission would be necessarily abused. Necessarily. It is much better to err on the side of this unqualified prohibition than to err on the other side of lax. That I think is what Sovereign means. And yet, so why is this, why, is it, why good is crudely defined and no sophistication is permitted, yet. The alternatives are impossible. Impossible. In other words, it's really an opinion which is frozen into law for good reasons. That is the state. I think that is the status of law in the Plato's opinion. And therefore, one must really distinguish between justice and wisdom. And there is a connection, obviously, because there are good reasons for this complying with opinion. But it is a compliant with opinion. This, I think, what it means. And so the question of so, uh, but for the understanding of the, uh, but to return to the general question and to conclude the this mark, in studying the credo, we must never forget one simple thing. There are two questions which must be kept separate, and so there is only one answer given to both. Is a jailbreak? unqualifiedly unjust, or is it unjust in the case of Socrates? A simple of a practical deliberation. They mean, of course, the case of Socrates, and we must distinguish between the universal principle and the reasons applying to Socrates case in particular. Something of this kind happens, of course, in all Platonic dialogues, because in all Platonic dialogues, no Platonic dialogue is a treatise. In every Platonic dialogue, individual human beings in an individual situation, under individual circumstances, meet, and where these individual elements affect the discussion of the universe. But here I think it is in a very particularly striking. Now, this is, I mean, I compose this seminar with that. Unless there is one or the other point you would like to raise, a few more minutes, I could still so be glad to spend with you. Mr. Johnson? Oh, it's just a side question. Mm -hmm. uh, because remember, this has been on to some uh, last order, when the uh, question of philosophy being the private thing was brought up, philosophy being the Spinoza philosophy. As a private thing in which philosophers in almost any regime could uh, philosophize in private. Yeah. Compared with what this has come out of the well, apology as a title, in which it is construed uh, I mean, as a, in some sense, as a public thing, I mean, that there must be seeing more than one person that does this. I don't understand your question. Uh, do you mean to say whether uh, Plato would have agreed, or so is with Spinoza's view, that 
as far as philosophy is concerned, the difference of regimes is negligible? Yeah, I could not uh, imagine agreeing with that. You know, no, I think he would not have agreed with it. But uh, what seemed to me was, was the contemplation, so the contemplation of God as the highest thing that can be, and that, that this can be the highest thing, and once this is reached as a decision, it seems to be left in part of the whole political doctrine that's still how the fact because the two could, could be separated when the other question is coming together. Yeah, but still, is this ascent, to say nothing of the end of the ascent, is this ascent not affected by the character of the society in which men live? And I, I, sh I think even Spinoza would say that uh, ultimately, otherwise he wouldn't have been interested in, in so, uh, so interested in politics as he was. But surely in the case of Plato, uh, I mean, even in the apology we find a trace of it, when he says that, when he describes what happened to him after the Battle of Saginusa, you know, the tribe of the generals, he, he disagreed with the whim of the majority and uh, they didn't like it, but there's nothing happening. But when he disagreed with the whim of the 30 tyrants, you know, then he said, if the, that had, the regime had not been so short-lived, he would have been killed by them. And so the democracy in Athens lasted almost as long as so his life, and it took some 70 years to uh, hurt him. Whereas this uh, tyranny uh, would have taken less than a year. So there would be a difference, surely. But uh, that is also, incidentally, that is one point which I should have mentioned, but I have uh, spoken of it so frequently in other classes that I thought I could uh, not mention. When Suez discusses exile in the expediency argument, yeah, not just as argument, where should he go? To well-ordered cities like Thebes and Megara, or to Thessaly? Now, Thebes, but there are two other well-ordered cities where mentioned, Sparta and Crete. Now, there is, there are two different, uh, there is, well, of course, the distinction would be this. An ill-ordered city is undesirable. Yeah, I mean, a uh, uh, So only well-ordered cities. Thebes and Megara, when he would go there, everyone would know him. Why? Because they are nearby. The Sparta was, in course, the Sparta was so xenophobic that uh, it was a good place to go there, you men. Uh, I mean, unless you had um, deserved so well of Sparta, as Xenophon did that they gave him an estate, uh, it was not a healthy place for any foreigner. But uh, a creed would be well ordered according to the text, and it is far away. It's no one would know a stranger from Athens arriving there whether he was a fugitive or from justice or not. That, I believe, is the ironical background of the laws. What Socrates would have done if he had accepted Crito's suggestion. He would have gone to Crete and there taught the Cretans the rudiments of civilization uh, because uh, they were well ordered in a crude way, had certain element, uh, habits of law abidingness, but the laws were, were very bad. And then in the laws he's presented as, you know, an Athenian stranger. An Athenian stranger teaches the Cretans how to establish a really good order. And this good order is the Athenian order, uh, not the democratic Athenian, the older one, the ancestral polity, which you may remember from uh, when we discussed uh, uh, Aristophanes, you know, the old order prior to Christmas reform, uh, the rural squires were in, uh, you know, predominated. The, that is the alternative. And the practical problem for Socrates was, I mean, stated in theoretical uh, generality and precision, either to leave Athens to a place where his whole past did not come, and use his faculties for the benefit of those people, 
as he could have done, even as a man of 70. All uh, the time out. And I think what the true deliberation of Socrates is, what is better for my fellow man? And they felt it was better for his fellow man, and more particular for his fellow citizen, if they did this and lived to regret it, which they did very soon after. And therefore, in a way, that marriage between philosophy and the police was consummated by Socrates' death. They, from now on, somehow it was possible, as is shown in fact, to establish academies. What Socrates should do is still open. The question is, is it just to escape from prison? Is it, is it just for Socrates, circumstanced as he is, to escape from prison? Obviously, two different questions. This question turns around the more fundamental question as to the knowledge of justice. Does Socrates possess such knowledge? Socrates says he follows only the logos, and yet he acted in the past, and he's going to act now. So he, it, he must possess knowledge of justice, you would say. But this knowledge is not perceived as knowledge in the Christ. That knowledge is taken over and presupposed from earlier acts of reasoning, from earlier agreements between Socrates and Christ. But agreement is not the same thing as truth. Two people may agree on something uh, without, uh, be, uh, without being uh, satisfied that it's the truth. The agreements as these earlier agreements, whatever, are here said to be open for reconsideration. Strictly speaking, they are, however, not re-examined. They are only reasserted. Especially the crucial premise: to live well is identical with living justly. Now, hitherto, the case for Socrates' position, for staying in prison, i.e. dying, was this. For an old man, life is not worth living. In this argument, the point of view is the good life, without any regard to the just life simply for the point of view of good living, uh, to, it is you don't live as well as you are very old. Against this, Crito had said, not, uh, had said, it is your duty to escape. By dying, you so as are taking the easy way out. The easy way out because death might be that dreamless sleep, you remember, which is such a very pleasant condition, much more uh, pleasant than to raise these uh, children of Socrates, you see, who were not so attractive objects of education as some other people were. It was Crito who said, one must do the just thing. And the just thing is not to take the easy way out, in this case, to that. This point has to be stressed more than I have done last time. It is Crito who brings up the question of justice. But the question, of course, is this. Is Crito's understanding of justice correct? What is justice? Is their knowledge of justice? Are there experts in justice, just as there are experts in bodily health? Now, if there is an expert in any field, one must follow his opinion as distinguished from the opinions of the many. And the laws are opinions of the many. If there is no expert, one may or may not follow the opinion of the many, i.e. the laws. But a prudent man, a practical wise man, would consider in that case 
the power of the many, their power to kill. He would not consider it uh, if there is not job justice, if there, is ex if there are experts in justice. By obeying the opinion of the many, i.e. the laws, sugarists will be killed. But there is an other opinion of the many which plays a great role here, which is public opinion, to which quite a refer. By obeying the opinion of the many in the sense of public opinion, so this will not be killed, because public opinion approves of one's escape from prison under these conditions. So Clito is surely right if there is no knowledge of the just, in other words, if there is nothing by nature just, if justice is entirely conventional, entirely opinion, then why should you respect that opinion? Uh, merely because the opinion of many uh, is, uh, doesn't make it more, uh, more does it, not, does it uh, not make it more respectable. Therefore, to contradict Plato, Sugaris must prove that there is something by nature just, which is not mere opinion. And this is the function of the appearance of the laws. This personification of the laws is a substitute for the proof of natural justice. It is, of course, not a proof, but within it we see the nature of justice. Now, two suggestions were made at the end of it, what we read last time, regarding justice. First, uh, but it is rather a clarification of what injustice means. To act unjustly means to hurt human beings. That was the first suggestion. The second suggestion was to act unjustly means to break promises or engagements. That is clear because by uh, the modern doctrine as started by Hobbes uh, um, is implied in that, in the latter point. Nothing is by nature just, I exaggerate a bit, but justice means performance of promises. The only principle of right is that if you have agreed to something, not deceived and not under duress, then you have recognized something which you then have to uh, act on consistently. Now, these two principles, these two understandings of justice, injustice means hurting people. And injustice, mean, or injustice means breaking promises, can conflict with one another. That makes it interesting. In certain situations, you hurt people by keeping your promise. As the beginning of the Republic, you promise to return the gun, and the fellow, the owner, has become a madman in between. You hurt him and anyone exposed to him by the turning the gun. So, in other words, not hurting people is a higher principle. This much, I think, we should remember before we continue. And now let us continue immediately because it is my firm intention and our hope that we finish our reading of the trial today. Uh, we begin now at the point where the laws come up. 50A6. Now, look at it, so it says, in the following manner. Yeah? If we are about to run away from here, um, if you are about to run away from here, or however one might, has to meant to call that action, I mean, maybe there is a more delicate expression for what we are doing. Yeah. The laws and the community of the police would appear to us and ask, do you have that? Has this term appearing yeah, uh, um, is used of dreams and visions, as I learned from Bernard. You see here also two different things. The laws and the police appear. 
And they would ask, you see, the, what do they say? Tell me, O Socrates, who is then speaking? The problem was the singular. And what is the singular here in this particular case? Polis. Polis. So to begin with, it is not the laws speaking, but the police. Now, the police consists, of course, of human beings. The citizen body assembled. The laws are not human beings. The police cannot be superhuman. The laws may be, because they are not human beings. You see here, now, let us go on from here, yeah? Tell me, so West, what do you intend to do? Do you have it? Whoever has it, raise it. Let us not uh, be formal. Tell me, Socrates, what have you in mind to do? In trying to do this, can't you see that you are trying to destroy us, the laws, and the whole state, as far as you can do it? It's a whole policy. I mean, that we don't have to correct this. Yeah? Or do you think it possible that a city can exist and not be overturned, where a sentence given has no force but is made null by private persons and destroyed? What shall I say, Crichton, to this and other such things? For one could say much, especially in order, in pleading about the destruction of the laws, of the law. Of this law. This law, that's important. Yeah. Of this law which lays down that sentences given must be carried out. Let us stop here for a moment. All laws are destroyed if the law regarding the enforcement of punitive sentences is destroyed. Yeah? All, what does this imply regarding law? It's law. In other words, that's the key law. Yeah? That's the law of laws. What does it tell us about law in general? There's a uh, All laws depend on sanctions. Yeah, on sanctions. Now, if this principle of sanctions is denied, all laws are denied. All laws are lost by virtue of having human sanction. Law is essentially, no, I exaggerate, but for good reason, law is essentially punitive. Without that punitive appendage, appendage the law is not law. And if the laws are destroyed, the city is destroyed. By fleeing, Socrates would be the most unjust of men because he would hurt the whole polis, not only this or that individual. This seems to settle the issue. But it is not yet asserted. It's only still a question. Why? Why is, does this not settle the issue? How does he go on? Or shall we say to the laws, yeah? Or shall I answer the laws? Not I, we. Oh, God, he is very unintelligent. It's very important to speak, whether Socrates speaks or Socrates and Crito jointly. Yeah? And that's easy. I mean, that is not. What is he saying? Tell me, Socrates, and then he says, uh, you are trying to destroy us. Why is the number changed? Yeah, that is, yeah. Plato was a great man. Yeah. The translator is almost certainly not a great man. So if Plato does something strange, it is worth considering. But if the translator commits a simple blunder in translation which no second term student of Greek would commit, yeah. So, good. Uh, that yes, is, what does it say? What does the Greek says? Uh, you would destroy me. No, the Greek says uh, that's in the Greek. Amos. Yeah. Then, is, yeah. You see, there is first is not the police speaks, and then the police is replaced by the laws. That is the whole thing. First, you have the Athenians. Yeah, the Athenians. Well. Uh, there are all kinds of Athenians, you know. It's not necessarily something impressive. Then you have the polis. Yeah. Now the Athenians in an official capacity. That's something impressive. But still, by no means infallible. Because they go by majority vote and so on and so on. And then you get the laws. 
and the, the police disappears. The laws are somewhere in the clouds. Yeah. yeah. But this transition takes place in one sentence. Why not? Well, to make it still is. more. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That is clear. But here, but the point is that although the police addresses Socrates, Socrates does not answer. But ask Crito, what shall we answer? You know, you see, that brings it out, how, uh, out most clearly that Socrates does not answer. But Socrates, but the Crito answers on behalf of both Crito and Socrates. So, uh, Socrates is really ironic, and as I always said, you always raise questions and don't answer them. Yeah? He raises questions and Crito answers them on Socrates' behalf. So, do you see that it makes sense that Plato, uh, I mean, the sage Plato does these strange things? As you think of the unsage translator. I mean, the, who, who, who is not aware of these things? Yes? Uh, did, did this have uh, absolutely clear in the Greek that the polis and not the laws are speaking? At the beginning. At the beginning, that's Sure, the I mean, tell, tell me. Yeah, tell singular, me. Oh, Socrates. The addressee is, is the singular, Socrates, of course. Yeah, and the speaker is also in the singular. So it cannot be the laws. Now, what then does he say? What do the laws say? No, what do we say to the law? The reason is that the state wronged me and did not judge the case right. And wronged us. It's also important because it's a joint action of Crito and Socrates, and preceded by an action of the police against both of them because Crito do is hurt, he loses his friend. Because the police uh, did wrong to us and did not decide the trial correctly. Is that what we shall say? That by Zeus, or Socrates. That's it, the whole issue. In other words, the city has no right to do wrong. And if it does wrong, it ceases to be respectable. If you must have heard that argument in different, in more highfalutin terms very frequently. The city acted unjustly against us, and it did not decide the lawsuit correctly. These are two different things. Why did the city act unjustly against us? Not by the sign of the laws, but that's the second point. What is the primary injustice of the city, in, uh, independent of the decision of the lawsuit, the trial? The accusation itself was unjust. Meaning it was based on the irrational demand that one must believe in the gods of the city. The law itself was unjust. And secondly, the trial was incorrect because the, person, the accusers did not prove that which they were supposed to. You remember the argument against Melitus. So that is proof that he believes in the gods of the sin. Yeah. So, in other words, that is the question. Must you obey not only the laws, but unjust laws? And that is what the laws themselves have the nerve to, to uh, uh, raise this question. Now, let us see. What then will the law say? Yeah? Was that the agreement between us, Socrates? Between what? us and you. Yeah. Uh, or was it to abide by whatever judgments the state may make? Yeah, let us stop here. The first issue is altogether dropped. Yeah? the issue of the justice of the laws. One cannot question the law. One can question only the application of the laws in a given case, where the laws properly apply. But this cannot be questioned by you, Socrates, because you agreed not to question these legal decisions as distinguished from the laws themselves. This is a, a surprising assertion of the laws. Where did Socrates ever say that? And then, well, how does it go on? Now, um, and now if, we were, if we were surprised when they say this, 
they would perhaps say, yeah, Sorry. No, let me see. The, the laws reply only to Sogares, yes, you see. Although both Sogares and Crito are presented as addressing the laws. Why? Perhaps they know that it's sufficient, it's sufficient for them to persuade Sogares. You see, if Sogares is satisfied that he can't go out of jail, Crito has to take the uh, decision. Sogades deliberates with himself, you know, his discussion is a kind of deliberation of Sogades with himself, not with Crito. Whether that is sufficient or not remains to be seen. Now let's go on here. Socrates, do not be surprised at what we say, but answer since you are accustomed to the use of questions and answers. If you please, what do you complain of in us and the state that you try to destroy us? First of all, did we not bring you into life and through us? We not generate you. Yeah. It's an unnecessary prudishness. Yeah. And through us, your father took your mother and began to? Yes. Tell us then, are the marriage laws those of us you find fault with? Do you find there is something wrong with them? I have no fault to find, I should say. Now let's stop here. You see, uh, the, the laws imitate so that is, you know? Since Sogares is so well known for his questioning and answering the laws at top Sogares' procedure. But the crucial point here, we, the laws generated you, yeah? What does this mean? What, what would you say if, if someone would say, who generated you, and you would say the laws? Yeah? I mean, look at it from a practical point of view. Yeah? Generate the conditions which. Uh, yeah, but that he doesn't, he doesn't qualify it. He simply says he generates it. Which in turn uh, influence. Yeah, sure, that is defensible. But that is, they say they generate you. They generate you. That's important. This is the laws magnify themselves. They claim to have done something which they couldn't possibly have done. Who who did the generating? Man. Yeah. Man, as Aristotle in his wisdom says, man and the sun generates man. Sun meaning the whole natural conditions, yeah? Without which man couldn't be. Here the law says the laws generate man. They push aside nature. They push aside. And that is of the greatest importance. Since the question is nature, natural, justice. Yes, now let's go on. And so that is to, you see, doesn't blame these marriage laws as uh, he thinks they are perfectly all right. Now? I have no fault to find, I should say. Well, the laws about feeding the child and the education in which you were brought up. In which you too were brought up. That's important. Uh, did not those which had that duty do well in directing your father to educate you in mind and body? Yes. yes. What in mind and body? In music and gymnastics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's a long question whether musical education is not an education of the body. Dancing. Or whether gymnastic education is not education of the soul. The problem, yeah? I'm sorry. So you see what criminal is. Saying. What's the name of that fellow? <laughs> is this this one? Yeah, yeah then he should get a severe remand. High crime and misdemeanor. <laughs> Yeah, if, uh, if death were punishment, <laughs> we don't know. So let us not say. Now go on. Uh, yes, I should say. Very well. Now let us stop for a moment. So the education which you too got, yeah? Maybe which everyone got. Every Athenian. The, norm, the laws are silent about what we may call higher education, which not everyone gets. 
this higher education, which took on his God, he did not owe to the city, since the laws are decent enough to admit it. Yes. By, by uh, implication. Yes? And after you were done a bit and uh, fed your um, a nurse and educated? Yes, I should say. Very well. Uh, when you had been born and brought up and educated, uh, could you say in the first place that you were not our offspring and our slave? You and your ancestors also? Let us stop here. You see, Sugaris uh, puts the emphasis now on the point. Sugaris became, by his generation and education, the slave of the city. Why is a slave? How does a man become a slave? Well, yeah, but that is uh, presupposed an earlier act. Haven't you are not familiar with the technicalities? You may know it part of American history, but where did you buy the slaves? Probably in a slave market. And where did they come there? <clears throat> yeah, so in other words, the ground of slavery is coercion. Um, in, in, that could also be, but that's the limit. Yeah. Ultimately, you come back to acts of coercion. You had no choice in the matter. Well, you mean no one has a choice in being born, as you know. So this wasn't asked. There was no agreement between him and the bodies. That you will see later on, there are two opposite arguments. Part of the argument is based on agreement between Socrates and the city. And other part of the argument is based on the opposite of agreement, namely coercion. So here, slave. Yeah? Now go on. Uh, and if this is so, do you think you have equal rights with us? And whatever we try to do to you, do you think you also have a right to do to us? Your father, you had no equal rights, or against the master, if you had one, so that you might do back whatever was done to you. If you were scolded, you could not scold back. If beaten, you could not beat back. And there were many other such things. Now let us stop here. The relation of the city to the citizen is despotic. In the strict sense, this body means the relation of a master to a slave or pattern. It does not make any difference, as is shown by the facts, as the examples are used differently. There is no agreement between masters and slaves, between parents and children. Children and slaves have no right to resistance, regardless of what the parents and masters try to do to them. They have no right to use force against their superiors. But does Sugaris plan to use force? No. But he plans to use deception. I mean, in case he would escape. But may not a child dash slave use deception against his mad father master in the interest of his father master? or the father's master's equal fellow citizen. For hitting back is permitted in the case of equals, as the laws tacitly admit. Hitting back is only forbidden in the, in the two partners are unequal. And you know that's a great question, whether that may not be. We have discussed in connection with the class, but it's also clear for the reason. But another conclusion. So as a slave of the city, he belongs entirely to the city. He could have no private life, of course. Slaves have no private life. He could do nothing but the affairs of the police. As the police understand them. He so as himself says, I'm the only true politician in the gorgeous so. But that is not that is not a slave can't in define his duties as he sees them. He has to do the duties as a master in both of them. Same applies to children. Now, and Socrates obviously did not do the political things as a police of Athens and the The conclusion, at any rate, is that the laws are to be obeyed even if they are unjust. But remember the discussion is apology on a possible law which forbids philosophy. And Socrates says he will not obey such a law. 
Will humans resist such a law by force? Will he do that? Will he, will he uh, make a picket and in case the police comes to run away, he will throw stones at, at uh, them? No, but what will he do? Pardon? Yeah, but even I would raise one question. You remember what Sullivan said, the apology about this famous uh, simile which he uses regarding his relation to the police? He compares himself with it. But another conclusion, Sullivan is a slave of the city. He belongs entirely to the city. He could have no private life, of course. Slaves have no private life. He could do nothing but the affairs of the police. As the police understand them, he so as himself says, I'm the only true politician yeah, in the court. So. But that is, not, that is not a slave can't in define his duties as he sees them. He has to do the duties as a master in person. Same applies to children. Now, and Socrates obviously did not do the political things as a police of Athens and the The conclusion, at any rate, is that the laws are to be obeyed even if they are unjust. But remember the discussion is apology on a possible law which forbids philosophy. And so as says he will not obey such a law. Will Socrates resist such a law by force? Will he do that? Will he, will he uh, make a picket and in case the police comes to run away, he will throw stones at, at uh, them? No, but what will he do? Pardon? Yeah, but even I would raise one question. You remember what Sullivan said, the apology about this famous uh, simile which he uses regarding his relation to the police. He compares himself to a rather small beast, an unpleasant beast. Mm -hmm. Remember? What beast? Yeah. What does the get by do to the horse? Force. Force. So there is a kind of force used by Socrates, yeah? But still, that is, you can say, it's only a similar. But if Socrates will never use force, why will he never use force against the police? And in other words, he would use force against his mad father. If his mad father would rush out and try to kill his neighbor, he would, of course, use force against the father. But he wouldn't do that against the police if it is rushing out to do some bad action. Because the police is too strong for Socrates. Now, if we would, could stop here, which, we un, which is of course impossible, we could say the one expert regarding justice, Socrates, advises against the use of force when confronted with such opinions of the men as are backed by overpowering force or coercion. But let us see uh, how it goes on. Up to now, uh, we, we have not yet, he has used only the, ex, uh, the examples of father and master. Now we come to the case of the police again, where we left off. How do we know that the reason is uh, the force of the policy, that he wouldn't use the section? He did what you just said. No, I didn't discuss it. Uh, deception would be not. Deception is not discussed. Yeah. Oh well, why wouldn't he use? Uh, deception is not discussed. So if you draw from these remarks, which we just read, the conclusion, he might use deception, as Mr. Shock suggested, that is not excluded. But well, what about force? Why wouldn't he uh, words it? No, the principle stated here is you must not use force against your father or master. Now that is true in case the father or master merely hurts you. But what if they hurt other people? Yeah? If they hurt other people, then of course he would use force, even as a child or as a slave. Yeah? And he would be uh, praised by everyone for doing that. The reason that he doesn't use force against the superiors uh, isn't because they're stronger or, or against the master. It, it's just, isn't there an 
Yeah, sure, but that is not so simple. Is this, is this not universally true? There are cases in which you may use force against your father and against your master, and maybe if he is mad, take the simplest case. And the madness may, of course, be also a highly emotional state, yeah, which is not technically insanity, and yet has the effects of insanity. Now, let us go on. But against your country, it seems... You know, the word used here and throughout is fatherland. That has... Uh, it is not so familiar, the word, in, in uh, English as it is in, uh, on the European continent. But we have to translate it literally because it has a certain... as important. Fatherland. But against your fatherland, it seems, and the laws, you shall be allowed to do it. So that if we were to, to destroy you because we think it right, then you shall try to destroy us, the laws, and your fatherland, as far as you can. And you will Let say... Let it stop. All right, yeah. Go on. And you will say you do right in this, you whose care is set on virtue and have been very true. Yeah, let it stop. The laws, as they admit, attempt to destroy Socrates. They admit that. In the belief that they act justly. Yeah? In other words, it is not merely a matter of misinterpretation of the laws by frail human beings. The laws refer here also to Socrates' special case. Precisely Socrates has to be a slave of the laws. Precisely so, because he talks all the time of virtue. And the irony is very great, because precisely Socrates cannot be a slave of the laws. Those who have only, who are completely the products of the city, if I may say so, and of course not in their body, but who are completely molded by the body, they, of course, are the slaves of the police. But so is is not molded by the city, he has something beyond it. You see, just turn it around. The laws disregard in this very statement the difference between vulgar virtue which is a product of the bodies, and true virtue. Yeah? Now, we have ordered it on. Are you so wise that you failed to see that something else is more precious than father and mother and all your ancestors besides? Your fatherland, something more reverend, more holy, of greater value, as the gods judge and any man that, and any man that have sense? You must honor and obey and conciliate your country when angry, more than a father. You must either persuade her or do whatever she commands. You must bear in quiet anything she bids you bear, be it stripes or prison, or if she leads you to war, to be wounded or to die. This you must do and it is right. You must not give way or retreat or leave your post, but in war and in court and everywhere, you must do whatever, your, whatever city and fatherland command, or else convince her where the right lies. Literally, how the right is by nature. Or, or persuade her as what is by nature, just. Yeah. Now, you see first, maybe you begin to read, the mother comes in, yeah, who was completely disregarded. In the, because there's a beautiful discussion of this topic in Locke, civil government, when his adversary, Filmer, had always said, honor thy father, that's the highest command. And then Locke simply says, but look at the Bible, Bible says, honor thy father and mother. You see, and that destroys immediately the argument in favor of absolute monarchy, which, which Filmer had by the people. <laughs> yeah, but that is, of course, not what Sovereign is in mind. The mother, you remember the mother in the clouds where the difficulties came with not with beating the father but with beating the mother? Yeah. Now, the, the dual domestic authority. If you have a dual authority, you have necessarily the possibility of conflict. Yeah. And that applies, of course, also to the interesting case of father and fatherland. Yeah. The father may be a traitor, for example. Yeah. Maybe a traitor. And whom do you obey that, I mean, whom do you respect in that case? 
Now here it is of course decided simply in favor of the police. The police takes precedence of the parents. On the basis of the presumed omnipotence of the laws, because it bears not your father who generated you or your grandfathers who uh, indirectly, but the fatherland which generated you. Now why is this statement about the the most venerable after the gods I take it is a fatherland? But earlier, when he had almost mentioned his soul, but he, he really didn't mention it, you know, he walked around it. He said that was in 48A3. He said X, which is not the body, more venerable than the body. By far. That leads to the very interesting question, what is more venerable, more worthy of honor? The fatherland or the soul, a problem with which you are familiar on the basis of the Christian tradition, you know. The soul, and, and the, 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 the stated from the, from the end of Christian point of view by uh, Cosimo de Medici, what did he say? Um, he was more concerned with the salvation of the fatherland than with the salvation of the soul. Yeah? Now, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Here indicated. Is the soul more venerable than the father? There is a full discussion, a fuller discussion of the subject at the beginning of the fifth book of the laws. You may try to persuade the laws how the just is by nature, which means in plain English, the laws as laws don't know it. Hmm? They don't know that. No claim is made at any point that the laws are divine of superhuman wisdom. It's not made. It's very important. Although they appear like gods, no such claim is made. Someone wanted to say something. Was it Mr. Cohen? No. Okay, um, go on. Um, violence is not allowed against mother or father, much less against your country. What shall we answer to this, Kraken? Shall we say the laws are speaking the truth or not? I think they are. You see, you see, in the first place, he drops now the master slave thing, which is very good to do because it's a very odious thing. Yeah. If if the country, if you are simply the slave of the of the person, but it means, what is the implication? What's the difference between master slave and parents children? Exactly. And the master slave says this is a rule for the benefit of the slave is a questionable assertion. But that the parents' rule for the benefit of the children is a plausible assertion. So in other words, if the laws have any leg to stand on, it must be not their power, but it must be their beneficial character. And that we must see what comes out of that. Right, or you see, not so well says, one must not use violence against the father. And of course, that is also not the practical question. They are not going to use violence as we have seen before. It would be only a matter of a minor deception. Yes. Uh, go on here. The laws might say, perhaps, see then, Socrates, whether we are speaking the truth when we say that you do wrong to us now in this attempt. We who brought you to being who brought you up, educated you, gave you and all the other citizens a share of all the beautiful things we could. Yeah, that, uh, yes, of, we could, yeah, of which we are capable. Yeah, you see, were. you know, see, only the, the laws make clear the limitations of their gifts. Yeah? They gave a lot of things, but they didn't give everything. The beneficence of the police or of the laws is limited. What did they not give? What could they not give? They gave many wonderful things. They gave him wonderful military training, and they gave him a, a training in propriety and good, wonderful, decent conduct and so on. What did they not give? Wisdom. You remember that passage near the beginning? The many cannot do give us wisdom, sensibility. Therefore, the, the silence on philosophy in the Kraito 
severely observed. It's crucial. If philosophy were considered, the whole thing would have to be reconsidered. We would, so this would still arrive at its conclusion to stay in prison and to die, but not on these grounds. What these grounds are, we must see. Yes? Yet we proclaim, by granting permission to any of the Athenians who wishes, that when he has passed the muster and sees the public business in us the laws, anyone who does not like us has leave to take what is his and go where he will. None of us laws will stand in the way or dissuade him. If one of you does not like us in the city and wishes to go to a colony, or if he prefers to emigrate somewhere else, he may go wherever he wishes and take whatever is his. Yeah. You see, now the, the laws formally repudiate their despotic character. No compulsion is asserted. Slaves do not have this permission to go away if they don't like their master. But the Athenian has this right. The ground of obedience, you see, you know, but this is not only a distinction between the city or the laws and the master, but also a distinction between the laws and the father. You cannot repudiate your father. So your relation to your father is entirely involuntary in its in its character. But the relation, the ground of obedience to the laws is entirely voluntary. And that leads to grave consequences. The relation of ch children to fathers is not voluntary. Therefore, the partners are unequal. But if the relation between city and citizen should prove to be entirely voluntary, the partners would be equal. It would be a contract, as it later suggested. The movement of thought here is a movement from an entirely, from two entirely different, from one ground of obedience to an entirely different ground of obedience. The first based on involuntary compulsion. The other based on perfect voluntary. If voluntariness is a basis of reasonable obedience, yeah. if you are obliged only by virtue of a free agreement which you made in full possession of your mind, not under duress and not deceived, if that is the essence of reasonable obedience, then of course what becomes of obedience to parents? That has to be reconsidered in each case. In other words, one may, if this is true, if voluntariness is the basis of reasonable obedience, one may resist to rulers whose rule is based on force alone. And if you, one would read this more carefully, this passage which we just read, you will see there are two formulations of that. First, a very broad permission. We, every day, the hero appears in the market and says, every Athenian who doesn't like it here may leave. And later on, the much more cautious formulation. By the way, the first formulation, which is very funny, has nevertheless a very important theoretical backing. I don't know whether you know Rousseau's social contract. In, according to the strict teaching of Rousseau, which he in practice he did not maintain, fortunately, every meeting of the citizen body has to begin with the question, do you wish to preserve the constitution which you established before, or do you wish to introduce a new one? Perfect reconsideration of the whole uh, legal order. That is absolute voluntariness. But the two cases are different. Here is the citizen body. The individual citizen has no choice. No. For Rousseau, he has a choice. The right to emigration, emigration, is essential if the social contract is to be adjusted. Yeah, otherwise, it would be compulsion. Uh, you see that, that the fundamental principle of the so-called contractual doctrine is here stated. That is, of course, well known in the literature. But the opposite principle is also stated. 
you know, uh, 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 the analogy with the father child of this. Yeah, but is it really so absolutely voluntary? Let's look at it. Is it, or is this a question? Why not? Economic consideration, like, might make it very hard. That's one, yeah, and, and other, yeah, and he has all kinds of friends and so on. Yeah, but good. What did you want to say, Mr. Ellen? I think it's about ideas and so forth. Sure, yeah, but so. By the Western management, educated to obey the laws and distinct those laws. Yeah, but so this is not an intellectual. And so he is, uh, has a certain inner freedom from that. Yeah. yeah, but he made clear in the apology that uh, uh, exile is not a great evil. It is an evil, but not a great evil. What are the alternatives? What would he do? I mean, what is the alternative? He doesn't like this, uh, laws of happiness. What does he do? Yeah, or even uh, living in a city is not voluntary. That's it. So there is, uh, there is no simple, 100% free contractual relation. It is necessary for him to live in the city. Yeah. Now go on. But if any one of you remains, when he sees in what manner we decide lawsuits and manage other public business. You see, now these laws reveal themselves to be the Athenians. Yeah? Laws do not administer the city. It is done by human beings. Yeah. We you must never forget that the laws are, uh, how should I say, a glorified, a glorified Athenians, that's all. But that doesn't come to sight. Yes? We say that he has now agreed, in fact, to do whatever we command. And we say that the disobedient man does wrong in three ways when he disobeys us. Firstly, because we are his parents. Secondly, because we are his nurturers. And thirdly, because he agreed to obey us and neither obeys us nor convinces us if we do anything not right. Although we give him his chance and we do not savagely command him to do what we did, but we leave him a choice either to do it or to convince us. And he does neither. Yeah, you see, not, we don't, do not savagely command. We are not masters of slaves. Complete repudiation of the first case. If the master, if the ruler is a savage command, who commands savagely without giving the ruled a say in the matter, there is no ground to be. The ground of obedience, we can say, is a combination of compulsion and agreement. Compulsion is there, and not only because the laws have these punitive laws, but because man has to live in a city. And at the same time, agreement. That is beautifully presented. That is the secret of justice, as Plato said. That is indicated very beautifully at the beginning of the Republic, in that scene where Socrates said, Polemachus, I do believe you are starting back to town and leaving us. You have guessed right, I answered. Then he said, you see what a large party we are. I do. Unless you are more than, than a match for us, then you must stay here. Yeah? Compassion. Many fists against two fists. Isn't there an alternative, said I? We might convince you that you must let us go. Persuasion in opposition to compassion. How will you convince us if we refuse to listen? Here, yeah, how will you convince the laws if they refuse to listen? We cannot, said Glaucon. Glaucon gives in to force. Superior force. Well, we shall refuse. Make up your minds to that. So that he says, no, I don't bow to force. Here a diamond has interposed, who is a much more uh, sophisticated young man than Polemakos. Polemakos meaning the warlord. Don't you even know that in the evening there is going to be a torch race on horseback in honor of the goddess? On horseback, I exclaimed. That's something new. How will they do it? Are the riders going to race with torches and hand them on to another? Just so, said Polemachus. 
and so on. So, so please stay and don't disappoint us. It looks as if we had better stay, said Clark. Well, said I, if it seems, we, we, we must do it. If it seems, meaning if it is a decision of the citizen body, we do it. So, you see, compassion and persuasion that combine brings about political justice. Where are we? Are we? Uh, you know, go on, yeah. Um, these charges will rely upon you also, Socrates, if you do what you design, and on you more than anyone else in the whole province. Suppose I no, say... and you, you not the least of the Athenians, but rather among those who are obliged to hide. Yeah. Suppose I say to them, why so, Craig? Perhaps they might retort that I have made this agreement with them more completely than anyone else in the city. You see, the obligation to apply by the laws, which is based on agreement, is a matter of degree. There is no provision for that in the modern contractual doctrines, yeah? that you contract. Some is more obliged than someone else. So that is, is perhaps under a greater obligation to obey the laws than the most others, or even than all others. Now, why is the under such a special obligation? To, ob uh, to obey the laws, why has he made a stronger contract than the other? You see, the contract is not such a simple legal instrument that you can say oh, a stronger or weaker contract, yeah? The, the, uh, the author is given as a secret. Socrates, they would say, we have great proofs that you are pleased with us in the city. You would never have been so remarkably more constant in living here than the other Athenians, if you had not been remarkably more pleased with us. You never went out of the city to a holy festival or anywhere else at all, except sometimes on campaign. You never made any other journey abroad like other people. You had no desire to see other cities or to know other laws, but we in our city were enough for you. So completely you chose us and agreed to live as a citizen under us, and indeed about your family in the city, which obviously pleased you. Yeah, now you see, the proof is of course not a problem, yeah? So that is, he says you had no desire to know of other laws. In the secret that's clearly contradicted. So that is, had knowledge of other laws and he wouldn't have acquired it except if he had a desire to know of them. Or else, it could also be. Uh, Socrates was not interested in any laws, and therefore, yeah, there was a whole reasoning collapses. If he has no interest in any laws, then of course also not in the Athenian. Yeah, now go on. Further, in the court itself, it was open to you to propose a penalty of banishment, if you wish, and to do with the consent of the city what you now attempt to do without it. Then you gave yourself airs and pretended that you did not object to die, but you chose death before banishment, as you said. Yeah, let's stop. Now let me articulate the argument. So this was not obliged by compulsion, this much is clear. So this was obliged by benefits, because uh, uh, gratitude is the natural reaction of a decent human being to benefit. But he was, that is true. But he was not obliged by the city by the greatest benefits. Therefore, the greatest obligation is not to the police. The soul is more venerable than the fatherland, and the soul gets its proper food not from the city. Thirdly, Socrates was not obliged by agreement with the Athenian laws. He stayed in Athens. Since there was no trouble on account of his philosophizing, and as long as there was no trouble, he had no reason. When the trouble started, he was too old to leave. The practical question is that he should flee from prison now, to go into exile now. That is the question. But then the laws make an absolutely sensible point. So that he could have gone into exile with the consent of the laws. He merely should have said, uh, when he was, when the accuser said the punishment should be death, he should say, give me exile. 
they would have accepted it. So Sogane says the true ground of his decision now is because he preferred death to exile. Yeah, I think the... Uh, Mr. Gidden, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, there was... I don't know what this means, but it puzzled me. In addressing Socrates, they on two occasions put nursing him in the center. And sure. then at the very end, you they know, say, I know what listen to us, Socrates, who nursed you. Yeah, they I have wondered it. if... I don't know why, but I wondered if... Yeah, I, I, we read that just, just a short while ago, when he says it's 340. In 51... E6, yeah? Mm -hmm. so we, we generated you, we nursed you, and you uh, uh, made a green. Yeah? And also earlier, we generated you, you get to our laws about nursing, you get to our laws about... Yeah, sure, you see, now, first of all, it's really the temporal sequence. Yeah? I saw okay. But secondly, it is centered because nursing, trifle, trophy,